So welcome to this morning session. First speaker today is Eleonora Ginti from Bologna, and she will talk us about flatness results for stable solutions to some non-local problems. Please start. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, thank you to uh, Berardo, Matteo, and Michael for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here, especially not, not only to give the talk, but be here and not <laughs> in my office in front of a laptop. So today I would like to present you some uh, results uh, obtained in collaboration in different papers, two of them with Xavier Cabrera and Joaquin Serra and the other one with uh, Joaquim and Enrico Valdinucci. And they concern uh, problems that uh, are very classical in calculus of variation and especially here in PISA are very well known. So I will speak at the same time of two problems. One is related to the study of um, area minimizing surfaces, and the other one to the very related problem of the um, Allen-Kahn equation. But I will do it in a non-local setting. So of course, first I have to, to introduce what I mean with this non-local. But the main point of this talk is the class of solutions for which we study this problem. So I'm interested in studying stable solutions. Stable, of course, in the variational sense. So meaning that the second variation of the associated energy functional is not negative. So when I consider a problem of perimeter minimizer, I mean stable for the perimeter. So second variation of the perimeter is non negative. And then for the Allen Khan, of course, of the associated energy. And I will try to convince you that the study of this stable solution is quite interesting. And uh, also in the classical setting, so for not the non local version, but really the original problem, there are still many open questions. So the main, really, the main point is now is uh, the, 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 the class of solution in which I'm interested in. But before going to the main result, let me uh, recall the very classical result that most of you know, but uh, just to give a global picture of the problems and uh, also for uh, young people or people who never saw this before. So I start to the very famous and very well-known conjecture by Ennio De Giorgi on monotone solution of the allen kahn equation. So the allen kahn equation is the blue one minus Laplace of u equal to u minus o cube in the world space. And the conjecture, the Georgie conjecture that if we have a solution that is bounded between, between minus one and one, minus one and one are exactly the two minimum points of the potential associated to these equations, this equation. And we assume the solution to be monotone in one direction, for example, in the last one, then at least up to dimension eight, uh, the solution, this solution U, must depend only on one direction. So this means that its level flat, uh, its sorry, level set are flat, are hyperplanes. And the, the reason for this conjecture is uh, exactly uh, exactly rely on on the connection that we have between this problem, the Allen Kahn equation, and the theory of era minimizing surfaces. So the conjecture was uh, is um, sorry, the, 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 this relation is. Um, uh, somehow given by the very classical Modica Mortola result that tells us that when you rescale the energy functional associated to the Allen Kahn equation, at the gamma limit, you see area minimizing objects. So you see the, the perimeter functional. And then, of course, the, the point is okay, if I know uh, what are the minimizers of the perimeter functional, so in the limiting object, I should understand something about the solutions. Uh, or at least certain solutions of the original problem, my Alekhan equation. So then, of course, here I recall again something that here is very well known, the theory that classify area minimizing surfaces. So the first, of course, very important result is the classification of minimal cones. And we know uh, that they are necessarily hyperplane, so flat up to dimension seven. And from, uh, sorry, and this dimension seven is optimal. And in the dimension eight, we have the first example of a singular minimal cone that is the Simon's cone. And then from the flatness of minimal cones in dimension seven, one can deduce on one side that any minimizer of the perimeter functional, so not only cones, so any set which is a minimizer of the perimeter functional in the world space is flat up to dimension seven. And on the other side, the very related problem that is the Bernstein problem, uh, which tells us that if uh, I um, require in addition uh, that my surface is a graph, so not any surface, but is a graph, then it is necessarily flat and it's minimal, of course, it is necessarily flat up to dimension eight, so one more dimension. So the, the conjecture that I showed you before in the original version, that is the one for monotone solution, 
is somehow related to the last point, so, so to the Bernstein problem, because somehow the monotonicity assumption on the solution of the Allen Kwan reflects at the, in the limit, in the gamma limit, uh, in the fact that uh, the minimizer are graphs. So for this reason, you see this uh, here appearing the dimension eight as a critical dimension, and we have the dimension eight in the original sp statement of the, the Georgia conjecture. But you can imagine that it would be very natural to consider also a version of the De Giorgi conjecture instead of that for monotone solution for minimizers of the associated energy functional. And uh, since here we have classification of minimizers up to dimension seven, we expect that in the version for minimizers, we should have one dimensional symmetry up to dimension seven. Okay, so then I will come back to this, but first let me tell you something about what I announced at the beginning that is at the main object of this talk that is stable objects. So here you see we have complete classifications for uh, on the geometric side, let's say for the perimeter of minimizers or graphs. So what about if I, I ask my, my set to be stable for the perimeter in the sense that the second variation of the perimeter is non-negative, okay, but just this, and this is weaker than required minimality. So the point here that is very interesting for the class, this is everything is classical, is the classical perimeter, is that the only uh, flatten result available, available is in dimension three. So it's still open, and this is a conjecture that any stable, embedded stable minimal surfaces in RN is flat up to dimension seven. So we should have the same kind of result that we have for minimizers, but just requiring stability. This is open, but observe that for cones, this is known because the result for cone uh, holds for stable cones. So somehow the problem is in going to, uh, so in, in trying to, to, to go from cones to any surface, uh, just requiring stability, okay? And the main obstruction in this uh, procedure is the lack of some energy estimates. So uh, this is, uh, these estimates, so if I know that E, set E is a minimizer, for the perimeter functional, then you can prove that it satisfies this upper bound of, for its perimeter, of, for its energy. In a ball of reduce R, the perimeter grows at most like R to the N minus one. The point, what is the point? That for minimizers, of course, to get this kind of upper bounds, you just use minimality. So you use a comparison argument, you construct a competitor, uh, which enjoys these estimates, and then by minimality, you're also your set enjoys these estimates. But if you just require stability, Stability is basically a uh, minimality, but just under very small perturbation. It's like a local notion of minimality. So you cannot uh, choose uh, any competitor that you want. Your competitor must be somehow very close to, to your set. So it's much more difficult to find estimates for stable objects than for minimizers, okay? So this is something that you see, it's not known in the classical setting for the perimeter. And I will try to, <laughs> to explain you, to convince you that in the non-local setting, we can do something better. We can get some estimates for stable sets and, uh, uh, okay, and you will see. <laughs> okay, so this is for what concerns the geometric side. So the problem of studying area minimizing or graphs or stable objects for the perimeter function. But then, uh, as I tried to justify from the beginning, these two uh, should uh, tell us something about the original problem, about the allen Kahn. And uh, so if we go back to the De Giorgi conjecture, uh, of course, in the classical setting, almost every, everything is known. There is still an open problem that I will, I will show you. So um, for monotone solutions, that is uh, um, the, 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 the original version of the De Giorgi conjecture, it has, okay, it's true and it has been proven in dimension two or three. Here, sorry, I didn't brought all the references. So dimension two was Gusso Bengui, three was Ambrosio Cabré and Alberti Ambrosio Cabré. And then this was the celebrated result by Savin, who proved the conjecture up to dimension eight, so up to the optimal dimension, but he needed to require an additional assumption. So not just monotonicity of the solution, but you need to know that the solution tends to the two minimum points of the potential in, in the direction of monotonicity. So when Xn tends to plus infinity or minus infinity. Okay, and then there are counter example by Delpino Kovac in, 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 in higher dimension. So somehow you see that the open problem, the, 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 the problem that is still open is uh, to remove this additional assumption in large dimension, let's say between four and eight, okay? 
And then, as I told you, it's natural also to consider the, maybe it's more natural, <laughs> to consider the uh, or conjecture for minimizers of the energy functional. And in this case, by this relation that I told you with the area minimizing surfaces, this is completely closed. This is true up to dimension seven, and you have counterexample in dimension larger or equal than eight. So let me tell you that uh, basically the proof by Savin. Uh, so in the same paper, he proved both conjecture, in this case up to dimension seven, and in this case up to dimension eight. But the proof is the same in the sense that what he really uses in the proof is the minimality property of solution. So he needs to know that the solutions are minimizers of the energy function. And this assumption is exactly done for this reason, because if you know that your solution not only is monotone, but also satisfies the limiting assumption, then you can prove that it is a minimizer. So basically all the, the proof by Sabin is for minimizers, okay? And um, so this somehow almost closed the, uh, the original question, except, except this point. As I will try to tell you later, this, the, the fact of removing this assumption is related to the study of stable solution. And I will try to tell you uh, why. Okay, so again, we could ask what about stable solution for the for the De Giorgi and uh, and again we just have results in low dimension so in particular the only available result is in dimension two okay in higher dimension you don't know whether stable solution are one dimensional and again the conjecture is that uh, they should be uh, one dimensional to dimension seven and there are counter example in larger dimension okay so the open question here is somehow related to the open question for error minimizing sorry, for stable set for the perimeter. So this is just to recall what is known and what are the open questions in the classical setting. Now, let me move to the, to the fractional one. So when I speak about, when I say that I was uh, going to speak about non-local problems, uh, means that I, I, I want to consider now the fractional version of the Alenkan equation, uh, equation, meaning that I replace the Laplace here with the fractional Laplace. This was this operator was already introduced in other talks, so I'm not going to spend much words on this. So here s the power uh, is a parameter between zero and one. This can be defined via Fourier transform or via this um, integral formulation. And I'm interested in trying to understand if the, whether we have a similar kind of result for monotone solutions or minimizers or stable solution for this uh, for this problem. Of course, the first uh, natural question is whether we have a, a, a sort of modica mortola type result for this, because, I mean, if we don't have any connection with any geometric problem, maybe it even doesn't make sense to ask, uh, to ask um, whether the Georgi conjecture could hold. And we have it. So if we consider the energy functional associated to the fractional Allen Kahn, uh, this is the energy. So we just replace basically the Dirichlet, the W12 semi norm with the, a Gagliardo semi norm with the right, of course, order. And uh, Samin and Valdinocci proved that after a suitable rescaling, these energies converges to the uh, classical perimeter. So we see in the limit the same object that we saw for the classical Alincan when the parameter S is larger or equal than one half. While when S is below one half, in the limit, you see a new object that is the fractional perimeter that was introduced also by Marcello. So somehow you can already expect that in this range of S, the conjecture should be true again, exactly in the same way with the same statement with the same critical dimension than in the classical one, because in the limit, you see the same object, you see minimal surfaces, okay? While here, uh, well, the problem now is also that you have to study to classify minimizers for this new uh, perimeter, the fractional perimeter, okay? So here we also have a problem on the geometric side, not also on the, not only on the PD side. So let me recall briefly, what is the fractional perimeter? It was already introduced, so also here I go quite fast. So you can write it as a fractional sub-oleva Gagliardo semi-norm in the right, uh, order space, so I write it as 2s1 of the characteristic function of a set, okay? So when you write it explicitly and you suppose, for example, it to be bounded in order not to have infinite contributions, this is just this double integral between points that are in E and in the complement of E of the, the kernel associated to this uh, fractional sublevel. Okay, so we already know, Marcello told us that we have uh, 
result that tells us that up to a suitable rescaling, basically multiplying here by one minus two S, this converts also in the gamma sense to the classical perimeter. Okay, so we know nice results about this object. Uh, sorry, this was introduced by him. And with the first uh, results on minimizer for this object were studied by Caffrelli, Rogzoff, and Summit. And uh, so before going back to the De Giorgi, let me tell you what we know about minimizers for this object. So the analog, uh, let's say, result that I show you for the classical perimeter. So whether minimizers for this object are flat and if yes, up to what dimension, okay? And they have very few results unknown. We just know classifications in very low dimension. So we know that in dimension two, any non-local or fractional minimal cone is flat. This is a result by Savi and Maldinucci. And from this, again, we deduce that uh, in the same dimension, any minimal set, not only a cone, is flat. And the relating Bernstein type theorem that you can recover flatness in one dimension more. So, and these are basically for, for any S in, in the range zero, one half, the only uh, available results. Then there are other results, but that holds only when S is very close to one half. And they were um, uh, proven by Caffarelli and Valdinocci. Somehow they recover all the classical theory uh, by compactness from the case S equal to one half, that the limit is the perimeter. They could go a bit below one half, okay? But the only results for any S are just two dimension and three dimension for graphs. Okay, so you can already imagine that this somehow reflects on the PD side, on the Allen Kahn side, in the fact that we have, uh, we know that the Georgie conjecture only in low dimension. Okay. Um, okay, so here I give you the complete list of results uh, that we know so far on the fractional Allen Kahn equation, but I want to stress some, some, some points. So, when S uh, is between one half and one, as we already announced, everything, so these first three results are exactly the analog, so they all exactly in the same way as in the classical setting. So for dimension, uh, so in dimension up to seven, it is true for minimizers. In dimension two and three, it's true both for monotone solution and minimizers. And in dimension between four and eight for monotone solution, but you have to require the limiting assumption. Is that the summing again was using, is using the minimality property of the solution. So somehow these three points are exactly the same. Okay, the proof are more involved, but the results are the same as for the classical Laplacian. But a very interesting new result, this is more recent, the last one, n equal to four, okay. This is a very interesting result by Alessio Pigalli and Joaquin Serra, because you see, they were able to prove that just in the case of the alpha Laplacian, S equal to one alpha, but they proved the conjecture for monotone solutions in dimension four without requiring the limiting assumption. That is something that for the classical Laplacian, for S equal to one, it, it is not known, it's open, okay? Because in the Savin results, you from dimension four, you need the limiting assumption. So you already see that in the non-local, you already see that in the non-local setting, for some reasons that of course you have to go really deeply in the, in the proofs, you can prove something uh, that in the classical setting is more difficult or, or we don't know how to prove it, okay? And then when you go in the range as below one half, okay, you have what you imagine, meaning that you have, uh, this reflects that result for minimizer of this perimeter. So in dimension two, they are classified. And on the PD side, in dimension two, you have one dimensional symmetry for minimizers. Uh, for monotone solutions, you have it up to dimension three. On the geometric side, you have the Bernstein type theorem up to dimension three. And then you have this uh, result that holds one S is very close to one half because of the reason that I told you before. So up to dimension seven for minimizers, up to dimension eight, with this limiting assumption, okay? But the last two are just one S is close to one half. So this is just to give you a complete uh, picture of the result that are known so far. And you see that here, I'm always speaking about or minimizers or monotone solutions. So now I want to tell you something about stable solutions. Uh, but before, before doing that, uh, let me tell you, sorry, just come back for a, for a moment. Let me tell you uh, why. So basically both in the non-local setting that in the local one, this is the same. In the low dimensional case, low dimension, I mean, for example, 
here, when s is between one half and one, dimension two and three, and also in the case s equal to one, so for the classical Allentan, dimension two and three, the proof of the De Giorgi conjecture uh, uh, somehow can be, so the De Giorgi conjecture can be proved in a purely PD uh, way without using the classification for any area minimizing surfaces. So somehow that was the motivation, but the proof can be done even if you don't know anything about area minimizing surfaces in low dimension. Why in the seven results, so in the dimension up to seven or up to eight for minimizer or monotone, you need to use the uh, geometric counterpart. So you need to know already what are the, 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 the minimizer for the perimeter. And let me tell you, because this is somehow related to what I'm going to tell you later, why in the low dimensional case, uh, you don't need uh, all, this, uh, all this theory. So the idea, so this is now I tell you what is the idea of the proof of the De Giorgi conjecture in the low dimensional case. Somehow you can use this approach that is based on uh, three main ingredients. So the first one is the stability of solutions. You need to know that your solution is stable, but in both cases, so a minimizer is of course a stable solution and you can prove that a monotone solution is also stable. So you have these ingredients for both class of solutions. Okay. And then, and this is very crucial, you need an energy estimates. Actually, uh, the important part is the Dirichlet one. You need an estimate for the Dirichlet part of the energy. And you would like to know that in a ball of reduce R, the energy of your solution grows at most like R square log R. You can improve this just by some logarithmic factor, but you cannot improve here the power. So this is optimal concerning the power. Of, if you have R cube, you cannot proceed with this. With this okay? And then by some kind of UV type result, you can conclude that the Georgi conjecture is true. So you see that here, I never use any minimal cone, minimal surfaces, anything. So now the point of course is that you have the validity of this energy estimate only in low dimension, because here you need an R square, and typically, for example, when S is equal to one, your energy grows like R to the power N minus one. And this is optimal. So up to N equal to three, you got, you got R squared. But when you go to higher dimension, this is not satisfied anymore. And you cannot uh, use this, uh, this technique. So you need all the Savin uh, theory. So uh, in the fractional setting, you have exactly the same strategy. And what are the energy estimates for minimizers, for minimizers, as I told you, it's easier because you use a, comp a competitor, okay? In the fractional setting, uh, these are all, already old, some older results. Um, so you can prove that the energy of your minimizer grows like R to the power N minus two S when S is below one half. You have exactly this critical growth with the logarithmic, uh, logarithm of R when S is equal to one half. And you have the same, uh, let's say, local growth r to the power n minus one when s is above one half. So you see from this, combined with the with the um, uh, scheme that I gave you before, that uh, when n is equal to two, they are always satisfied because you always have a power that is less than two. When n is equal to three, they are satisfied only for s larger or equal than one half. So only in this range, you can deduce the De Giorgi conjecture uh, with the, let's say, easier PD <laughs> proof that does not rely on the classification of minimal surfaces. When you go to higher dimension or even for S below one half in dimension three, you cannot do this anymore. So when S is below one half, somehow um, the, 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 the problem is more similar to the case, uh, to the high dimensional case for S larger than one half. While exactly, so in the, in the high dimensional case where high, I mean, not in that range, but in the other range, that, that is uh, in the classical saying, and this was the work by Savin, then you really need the very, I mean, each, each point of this is quite deep and, and complicated. You need first, the, the, you already need to know the classification of, area minimizing surfaces if we restrict to the class of minimizers. And then you need to know that uh, when, you, when you, so you take your solution, that's assume for the moment that they are minimizers of the energy function. You take blowdowns, so you look them like from, from far away, and uh, you, you would like to have a convergence result that tells you that they converge in a strong sense, in the Ausdorf sense, 
to area minimizing uh, surfaces. Okay. And then you have, oh, sorry, you have the improvement of flatness. This was done by Samin that tells you, okay, if in the limit I see something that is, uh, that it's almost flat. So the, the object that I see in the limit, if the area minimizing surface is, is, is necessarily flat, then my original solution was one dimensional. So you need this um, blow down convergence result. And then you, of course, you need to know what is the object that you find in the limit. So you need the classification of area minimizing surface. Uh, okay. So now uh, I, I want to tell you why, as I announced at the beginning, <laughs> The study of stable solution instead um, is um, not only okay, as I try to tell you, is interesting because even in the classical setting, we don't know uh, almost anything except very low dimensional case, dimension two and three, both for the geometric problem and for the PD problem. But why it's important also uh, in trying to give an answer to the De Giorgi conjecture, uh, removing this limiting assumption. Because you can prove that if you are able to prove the Georgi conjecture for stable solutions in one dimension less, in Rn minus one, and you know the validity of the, the Georgi conjecture for minimizers in Rn, then you can deduce the Georgi for monotone in Rn. So basically, if you are able to prove, uh, so these minimizers in Rn are classified up to dimension seven. If you are able to prove that stable solution are one dimensional in one dimension less, you can remove the limiting assumption, okay, in the result by Sabin. And why you have this? Okay, yeah, of course, I don't give you a complete proof, but I tell you why you have this. Um, because suppose that you have a monotone solution. So you have this preferred direction that is the one of monotonicity, Xn, and you consider the limit at plus infinity and minus infinity of the solution in this direction. In general, if you don't do any uh, further assumption, these limits are functions of one less variable because you drop the, the direction in which you are taking the limit. Okay, so in this case, if I assume uh, monotonicity in Xn, they are function of X1, Xn minus one. If you are, a, and sorry, okay, this is the first point. Second point, as I told you, a monotone solution is in particular stable. And this stability passes to these limits. So the limiting profiles are stable solutions in one dimension less. If you are able to prove that they are one dimensional, you can prove that then the original solution was a minimizer. So the point is to consider in these limiting profiles and about them, you just know stability, but they are in one dimension less. Okay, so this is more or less the reason for which you have this implication. So somehow, uh, so not somehow, I mean, this is another reason to um, uh, study stable solution because you could really uh, close, somehow give an answer to the original conjecture without requiring this limiting assumption if you are able to classify stable solution. And now let's go uh, to the main uh, result that I wanted to present you today. Um, so the first result that I present you is in collaboration with uh, Joachim uh, Serra and Enrico Valdinucci. And in our project, we studied, we were studying uh, stable objects for the fractional perimeter. So in these slides, I'm considering the more geometric part, okay, fractional perimeter. And what we were able to do was to uh, establish energy estimate. Yeah, energy, of course, is uh, the energy is the S perimeter, okay, for stable objects in any dimension. This is the right power because the fractional perimeter also for minimizer, of course, is bounded. And this is the optimal one is bounded by uh, R to the power N minus two S. When S is equal to one half, you recover R N minus one. That is the one for the, okay. The point is that, so this is something that when I, that I told you at the beginning that for the classical perimeter is not known. You are not able, we are not able, and there are no results in the direction except in the low dimensional case, to give perimeter estimate for stable objects in any dimension. Of course, uh, uh, our technique does not let, uh, does not allow us to pass to the limit as S goes to one half, because this constant blows up when S goes to one half. So you cannot get as a consequence the, the result that of course would be very nice in the classical setting. 
But this is again another example in which somehow the non-local problem uh, helps you <laughs> in uh, obtaining something that in the local case, you don't know. Not only this, but we get uh, also an estimate for the classical perimeter of stable objects. I mean, these are stable objects for the S perimeter, and we get an estimate for their classical perimeter. So this, this is really an energy estimate because this is the energy of my problem. This is some kind also of regularity estimate because regularity in the sense that the order, um, let's say, of my problem here is S, and S is below, is below one half. Here is a higher, higher order uh, estimate, okay? Because this is, uh, you recover the perimeter when S is equal to one half, let's say. Uh, so actually, the proof is, uh, okay, it's a bit involved, but we first prove this. And then as a consequence by interpolation, we get this. So we prove directly the perimeter estimate, and then as a consequence, we obtain the energy estimate. Uh, and then as a corollary, but this corollary is not maybe so interesting because it's, I mean, once you have this, this is easy, is that we could um, generalize the savin valdinucci classification in dimension two, they did it for minimizers. With this estimate, we can obtain it for stable solution, for stable set. So in dimension two, stable set for the fractional perimeter are necessarily uh, half planes or flat. Okay. But I think that the more uh, important, interesting part is this one. Okay. Also, because as I told you, you don't that you don't have an analog of this in the um, uh, in the local uh, in the local setting. Okay, I cannot give you the proof of this because it's uh, it would be long, <laughs> but just let me tell you that the the basic idea it's not completely new because it was already contained in the paper by Savin and Valdinocci on the flatness of uh, S minimal cones in dimension two. So the idea is to consider perturbations of your set so you, you fix or you have your set that in this in our case is just stable you consider a, a direction and then you consider translations of this set of a very small translation so you move the set just of a very small amount t very very small okay in this direction v and minus v okay and then um using the non-locality it's very really important the non-locality of this problem and some technical lemmas, you can um, somehow um, uh, estimate uh, the difference between the, the energy, so the S perimeter of, this, of these perturbations and of your set. And this, by the non-locality, gives you, allows to, give, to, to tell you basically, uh, give you an information of, um, um, let's say, a, a bound on the, uh, derivative in the distributional sense of the characteristic function in that direction. So you can do it in every direction. So basically, this is a BV estimate. This gives you the, the perimeter bound. OK, but what is the point? That since you are taking very small perturbations, you can do it also for stable, not only for minimizers. OK, then there are, of course, some difficulties and technical issue. But the point, I mean, the, you, the fact of using these perturbations was already contained in their work. Uh, OK, so this is for what concerns the, the geometric side, the uh, estimates for stable set. And uh, using these estimates in, in another project with Cabré and Joachim, we were able instead to uh, classify stable cones. So again, this is a result for stable objects. In dimension three, that was something uh, that, that was not known, just when S is uh, close to one half. So just a com com two comments on this. Okay, first, this closeness, this S close to one half is not, uh, um, so can be quantified. This is not a compactness argument. So like the one that I mentioned before by Caffarelli and Valdinocci, they prove that when you are close to one half, then you recover. So this is a, uh, this is a completely different argument. So some of these S star can be quantified. And then the second comment is that, um, we have this result. So this is the first result for stable object in dimension three, because the other one that I show you was, was in dimension two. And here also in this case, I'm, okay, I cannot give you the, the proof. I just tell you that we use crucially the estimates that I showed you before. So that estimates were important for this result. And then of course, since we are speaking about stable objects, we need to use the second variation formula for this perimeter and, and the fractional uh, R inequality, and especially 
the optimal constant in, in, in this inequality and its behavior when s goes to one half. So you really have to be very careful with the constants and their behavior when s is close to one half. Okay, so this is, these are, let's say, the result that I want to present you on the, on the geometric side. And then, of course, um, sorry, I don't want to anticipate. And then, of course, the natural question is, okay, since we have seen that there is this very uh, close relation between Allen Kahn and, and perimeter, can we do something similar on the PD side? So for the solutions of the Allen Kahn. So this is a project with uh, Cabret and Joachim that we are not, so it's not online yet. We are finishing now. So I hope that it will be available soon. So the first um, statement is again uh, about energy estimates for stable solutions. Okay, so this is somehow the analog for the PD, that the estimates that I showed you before for stable sets. And we have exactly the same kind of estimates. So we have this somehow reflects the perimeter estimate. Here is, the, is BV W11 for the solution. And here is the energy estimate. So you see uh, exactly the same uh, uh, powers of the, of the radius, okay. Let me tell you that in this case, uh, so for the PDE, the, 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 the things are a bit more complicated because, okay, we get the first estimate in a very similar way. This is really basically the same proof than the one for, um, for uh, S minimal surfaces, for stable minimal surfaces, okay? It's basically the same. But when you need to estimate the energy, now in the Allen Kahn, you have both the Dirichlet part of the energy and the potential one. So with, with our technique coming from S minimal surfaces, we were basically just estimating the Dirichlet part. So the perimeter was the fractional semi-norm of the characteristic function. Here we also have the potential part. So we need also to give a bound on the potential part of the energy. So the proof basically is, is uh, okay, this is what I already told you. The BV estimate use the same idea. By interpolation uh, from the BV, you obtain the Dirichlet part of the energy. And then this is something that has to be done. It's not, uh, uh, obvious you have to prove that for stable solutions so again stability is very important the potential energy is bounded by the Dirichlet one so once you um, have an estimate for the Dirichlet part of the energy automatically you have an estimate for the total energy so this last just to tell you that for the allen can is not just the same as for minimal surfaces you have this additional point that uh, it's, you have to prove it i mean it's not clear how the potential energy is uh, is controlled and uh, so, and now, yes, I still have some time. Okay, and now this is, uh, I think, the main result uh, that somehow uses all the previous ingredients. That is uh, the blowdown convergence result that I mentioned before when I tried to tell you what was the, the structure of the proof of the Georgi conjecture in I dimension. So you take blowdowns of solutions, and you want to see that they converge to, okay, that was done for minimizers. And in almost any step that you were using that you had the minimizer. So we, we do this kind of, this step for stable objects. So we start with a stable solution. We take blowdowns and you want to see that you converge to a, a stationary set for the perimeter that is stable for the perimeter. Okay. And of course, in this, and okay, the convergence is in the Hausdorff sense. And of course, in this blowdown result, that energy estimates are crucial. And this is a missing step in the local case. In the local case, you don't have energy estimates and you're not able to have this, this blowdown result. Uh, and then uh, here you don't, uh, of course, you need to use this uh, theorem one was the energy estimate and then other stuff like a monotonicity formula and density estimates, uh, density estimates are needed to pass from the L1 convergence, oh, sorry, 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 from the L1 convergence to the convergence in the, in the Hausdorff uh, distance, okay? But uh, the, the, I, I would say that the really crucial part were this energy, energy estimate. Then so once you have this, once you have the blowdown result, you have somehow a kind of abstract classification result that allows you to reduce the problem of um, uh, the one, the Georgi conjecture to the classification of stable cones, okay? Uh, because, um, sorry, maybe I go, I go just, sorry. 
I go um, back to this scheme. Basically, we prove this point for stable objects. The improvement of flatness for S below one half is already, um, was already done by uh, Di Piero Seren Valdinucci. So in order to apply this technique, you need to know the classification of stable objects that are the limit of your blowdowns. So basically, we did this step for stable objects when S is below one half. This is already known. And uh, uh, from these two facts, we can um, state an abstract result. Sorry. That tells us, okay, if you know abstract, because of course you, you assume it as an, you take it as an assumption, that the only stable set for the fractional perimeter are flat, then for the same S in the same dimension, the solution of the corresponding electron can are one dimensional. Okay. Uh, and this, okay, as I told you, combined our result with the improvement of flatness that was already available. Okay, it's very recent, but it was already available and it was proven by Di Piero Serra and Badinucci. So as a conceit, okay, of course, then now the question is, okay, this is very nice, is, but it's abstract. Do you have some specific case in which you deduce something new that you didn't know before? And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, so as a corollary of this general abstract result, Okay, we reprove, this was already known, but we did it with a different proof, uh, the case of S below one half and uh, dimension three for monotone solutions. This was uh, proven as I saw before by uh, Farin, uh, Di Piero Farina Valdinocci. But then the, the, the two new ones are this one. Uh, why? Because by the result with Cabre Joachim, we knew that stable cones in dimension three are flat when S is close to one half. So by this abstract result, we use that stable uh, solutions in dimension three are 1D when S is, is close to one half. And I remind you that in the classical setting, so for the Laplacian, stable solutions are not known to be one dimension in dimension three. Okay, so in this non-local setting, uh, we get something that it is not known in the, in the local one. And then as a consequence of the scheme that I give you before, since we have, we have uh, one dimensional symmetry for stable in R3, we can deduce one dimensional symmetry for monotone in one dimension more in R4. Okay. And this uh, again, both for of course in the same range. So for as um, close to one half. And here I recall, I, I already told you before, but I recall it here because of course it's very related the result by Alex Figali and Joaquin Serra that I told you before. So before I just gave you the statement for monotone because it was in the scheme that they gave you for monotone solution. But actually what they prove is that in the case of the half Laplacian, so when S is equal to one half, they are able to prove the Georgi for stable solutions in dimension three. And then as a consequence, you have it for monotone solution in dimension four. But the, the, first they prove this, okay, they prove this. So somehow you see that when S is equal to one half or a bit below one half, we have the Georgi for stable in dimension three. And it is something that is open when S is equal to one. Okay, and all these, all these uh, theory comes from, okay, not, not only from this, but it's very important. The point that is very important comes from the fact that we have these energy estimates that you don't have uh, in the classical set. So just to summarize, and then I close, a scheme of, uh, so here I consider the um, geometric problem. So for the, and I think that is interesting because, okay, let, let, let us see what, what, what I wrote. For the S perimeter, so, sorry, consider the geometric problem for stable objects. That is the, 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 the core of this talk, okay? For the S perimeter, you have perimeter estimate in any dimension. While for the perimeter, you have only uh, energy estimate in low dimension. On the other side, what about the classification of co stable cones? cones eh? For the classical perimeter for cones, you have it in any dimension up to the critical one to seven. While for this perimeter, you just have it in low dimension. <laughs> so somehow you have the, the problem in on one side is easier on the other side and, and vice versa, okay? So if you, if you could prove 
for example, look at this uh, column. Okay, if you could prove that um, uh, stable cones are flat in I don't know dimension four or in, in higher dimension, from the perimeter estimate you you could deduce classification for stable sets. Uh, okay, and on this side, if you could prove that you had energy uh, perimeter estimates in higher dimension. From the fact that you have the classification for cones, you could deduce the classification. So somehow you have the the problem are okay, interchange, and on the okay a similar scheme for the for the Allen can here in the Allen can actually the difference is not uh, really local non local, but we have seen that a critical uh, exponent is s equal to one half because when s is larger or equal than one half, the gamma limit is already the classical perimeter. So somehow even if the equation is non local. What you expect is uh, when s is larger or equal than one half is the same that you expect when s is equal to one. So I think that the real difference here is uh, s below or above one half. So and again here is the same, right? So when s is below one half, you have energy estimates in any dimension. When when s is above one half, you just have it in low dimension. Okay, and here I just wrote the basically what I already told you about the one-dimensional symmetry. And here, uh, in both cases, uh, sorry, not in both cases, uh, here, um, uh, stable solution in dimension two, stable solutions are classified for any S. So the real problem comes in dimension three. In dimension three, by our result, stable solution are 1D when S is a bit below one half. And by the result of Alessio and Joachim, when S is equal to one half. But you are not able here to go to S larger than one half. So for example, the classical Laplacian S is equal to one. You don't know uh, anything, even in dimension three, for stable solution. Okay. And uh, again, this is related to the lack of energy estimates and uh, all the story that I told you before. Okay, so I think that uh, it's time to stop. So I thank you a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot for your talk. Are there questions, comments, remarks? Okay, so maybe I just one. So when you do the estimates of the perimeter, you say that you have a constant that depends yes, blows on. Up. Uh, yeah, but how it blows up? So if you scale with it's a, it's a, no no no. I mean it's not going. It uh, it's up. not that you just multiply by one minus seven and it goes well. No no no. It's a. Uh, it's really that it, so even yeah, if you yeah, take if you the right apply, uh, uh, scaling in front, one minus the one that I also Marcello show, yeah. it grows up. It I mean, you cannot pass case, the limit, yeah. otherwise, you would get the one for a classical no, yeah, no, object. No, no, I see, I see. So, uh, do you think that in view of this fact, maybe this constant can be? No, I think that is really it's the approach, sharp. the approach that, uh, yes, I think uh, that that technique that approach, you, you cannot, I, I, so I think that you cannot improve, so using the same technique. You cannot improve. We, we don't lose anything in the in the uh, in the constant. So I think with our technique, you cannot. You don't have hope to getting something that is stable when you pass to the limit, as that's supposed to. Yeah, okay. 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 Thanks okay. a lot. Uh, are there questions from uh, the Zoom audience? Anything? So let's okay, take another again. Okay, so we are ready to listen to the second speaker of this morning session, and this is Gian Paolo Leonardi from University of Trento, and I will talk about uh, some new results uh, on the prescribed mean curvature problem. Thanks a lot. Please. Thanks, Lucia. And so, before starting, uh, let me check if everything is working because I was. Oh yes, it works. So first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, so I'm going to, to talk about some uh, results. Some of, uh, of them are not so new. Actually, some of you have, have already seen them in uh, one of the last conferences I attended uh, uh, about two years ago uh, in Valencia. <laughs> so, so a part of the talk is about uh, a relatively not, not so new results about the prescribing curvature problem. And in, uh, in the second part, I will present some, uh, some new, uh, new results. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I will introduce the prescribing curvature equation. 
uh, recalling some minimal uh, uh, classical references and 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 notations uh, and so on. And then uh, in this uh, quest for uh, generalizing uh, the the problem in, in various direction, I will introduce some concepts. Uh, the concept of uh, weak normal traces and uh, pairing measures that will allow uh, me to say to explore some generalizations uh, of the problem and then uh, i will present uh, the uh, say the, the first generalization to uh, the so-called uh, weekly regular domain so i will uh, try to obtain some uh, classical result maybe in a not uh, not completely classical form in more general for more general domains or a class of quite a large class of domains and uh, finally in the second part i will uh, i will present uh, the prescribing curvature measure problem so the problem in which instead of say focusing on the domain on the you know, the weakening of uh, the, the properties of the domain we will uh, i will uh, focus more on the on the prescribing curvature function that will become a measure and we will see under some assumptions that it's possible to to address this problem in, in, in this more general setting too um, so uh, the prescribing curvature equation is one of the prototypes of uh, quasi linear elliptic pds uh, the fundamental one related to uh, minimal surfaces and you have uh, indeed uh, the minimal surface equation when h is zero uh, in the in the setting of uh, uh, graphical solutions, so uh, uh, functions uh, whose graph uh, satisfy this property that uh, this uh, left hand side represent so uh, the, the 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 in curvature that is uh, the sum of the principal curvature of the graph assuming uh, sufficient regularity of the function u, and uh, so you want to uh, find the a graph with a, a given uh, mean curvature that is prescribed by a function that, uh, for simplicity, I will consider as a function of the point x in the domain and not on u, as it is also done in, in for instance, in capillarity theory. And, and indeed, capillarity is also uh, uh, a, a topic where this kind of equation uh, arises. Um, and Typically, you have uh, some fluid in a container, and uh, the fluid uh, will uh, have uh, will uh, the, the shape of the of the of the interface between the fluid and, and liquid will will uh, will uh, try to minimize some energy, and in doing that, uh, uh, you will end up with uh, uh, a PD of this type with possibly some. Uh, boundary conditions like, uh, for instance, Neumann conditions or Dirichlet condition in some specific uh, situations. Uh, this is also an occasion to introduce some notation. So uh, you will, I, will, I will sometimes denote as TU, this renormalized gradient whose divergence is the prescribed function H. And note that uh, TU, uh, so you, when you take this uh, renormalized gradient that you Restrict it, or you take the trace on the boundary of, of your domain, assuming sufficient regularity, and you take the scalar product with the uh, outer normal to, uh, to the boundary. Then what you get is the cosine of the so-called contact angle, and the contact angle typically arises in problems of capillarity and is related to the uh, tension coefficient between, so the interaction coefficient between liquid and walls and uh, and uh, liquid air uh, uh, interfaces. Okay, um, so very classical uh, problem. And here there is a, a, a very classical and very short list of uh, references. Um, uh, the, 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 the point of this uh, short list is uh, mostly to uh, let you focus on uh, the, the reference on which I, I am mostly focused. Is this uh, uh, famous paper by Enrico Giusti on Invenciones? And um, what is kind of curious uh, in, in the title of the of the of the paper on the equation of surface of, of prescribed mean curvature, existence and the uniqueness without boundary conditions. So this last uh, sentence uh, refers to a phenomenon that is a kind of critical case in the for for the equation. 
and which is not just a, a mathematical, uh, say, uh, limit case that, that is uh, of no interest. It is uh, indeed, on the contrary, uh, one of the crucial situations in capillarity, and precisely, uh, as I will see, uh, I will say later on, the case of capillarity for perfectly acting fluids in zero gravity condition. It's a kind of very important situation, limit situation for capillarity that you need to understand in order to understand easier cases of uh, the capillarity phenomenon. Okay, so um, uh, let's uh, start uh, um, looking at uh, um, necessary condition for existence, because uh, if you just prescribe your preferred uh, function h of x, it is possible, quite possible, that uh, your uh, PDE will have no solution on, on the domain. And, uh, and in order to get uh, some uh, necessary condition, what we can do is to just fix a, a smooth subdomain, A, and uh, integrate the equation on the subdomain. So by uh, divergence theorem, and by using the fact that the vector field T of U, the renormalized gradient, as a modulus strictly smaller than one, if uh, you have a, a solution, you assume you have a smooth solution on the domain, then you, you will end up with this condition. So the, uh, the modulus of, of the integral of the mean curvature on the subdomain must be less than the perimeter of the subdomain. The perimeter here, uh, since the subdomain is smooth, is just the Hn minus one out of measure of the topological boundary. Okay? But you can think, uh, of course, uh, to the, the Georgi perimeter. Uh, this is the necessary condition for existence of solution. And uh, let me also introduce a sort of critical situation, which is an extreme case in, a, in, a, in the necessary condition. So when, let's say, you, you take, you saturate the inequality by taking the whole domain, assuming that the domain has finite perimeter or maybe smooth. So if the, the, the inequality saturates exactly on the, on the whole domain, then you say that the mean curvature that you have prescribed is extra extremal for the domain. So you are in, in a sort of limit case. And on the contrary, when, uh, when uh, you have necessary condition, but uh, no validity of this extremality condition, then you say that you are non-extremal. And uh, actually what you can observe is that you can uh, produce a strict, uh, a, a, so a, a stronger version of the strict inequality by saying that there exists a, a, some constant L between zero and one, such that the integral here is uh, uh, strictly less than L times the perimeter of uh, the, the subdomain, okay? This is the non-extremal case. So as I was saying before, the, the extremal case here is uh, uh, very important because it is related to capillarity for perfectly wet in fluids. These are fluids which like very much to be attached to the boundary of the container so that the contact angle is zero, so cosine is one, okay? Uh, under zero gravity conditions. Uh, so let me present, uh, uh, let's say the classical result, the, the, the central result that you find, one of the uh, important results you find in, the, in this paper by Justin. Um, so let's assume omega is Lipschitz. Uh, and then uh, the necessary condition that uh, you have seen before is also sufficient uh, for existence of solutions. And uh, actually the existence can be proved in two different ways. In the non-extremal case, uh, when you have uh, say the condition with the L times the perimeter with L smaller than one, then you can see that you, you find solution by solving a, a variational problem of capillarity type, when you say prescribed in certain weak way uh, boundary condition of the Richle type and you minimize a certain energy, a certain capillarity energy. Uh, well, in the extremal case, uh, uh, there, there you have problems because typically you, ex you might expect solutions that are not even in BV. So the, 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 the area of the graph of the solution might be even infinite. But you can recover them uh, as sort of limits, suitable uh, limits in a certain sense of uh, variational solutions. So, and this indeed uses uh, the, the theory of so-called generalized solutions, which is, has been, was introduced by Mario Miranda. 
Okay, uh, but the external case has some further features that I am uh, I liked very much when I read the, the, the paper for the first time, and uh, indeed I wanted to understand the, those those extra features uh, of the external case. So um, when for uh, here now from Lipschitz you have to move to C two essentially. Uh, so in a win, when the domain is of class C2, then you have an equivalence of the various conditions. So the extreme, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, what did I do? Okay, so the extremality condition is equivalent to uh, three other properties, essential, essentially. So uniqueness up to vertical translation. So the, the solution without boundary conditions, without any boundary condition is essentially unique. So up to translation, a vertical translation, you have a, a very precise shape uh, uh, that is the unique one you can find as a solution of the problem. Uh, you have maximality. So the domain is maximal for existence. As soon as you try to extend, take a larger, slightly larger domain and any, any extension, any Lipschitz extension of the prescribed mean curvature, uh, uh, then you will find no solutions, no solution on the enlarged domain. And finally, you have the verticality condition. So the existence of a solution which becomes vertical near the boundary in the sense that uh, the, say the contact angle is uh, zero. Uh, the trace of U times the normal at the boundary is identically one or one say on most, on. Of, uh, of the boundary of Omega. So these conditions are equivalent. And this is a nice feature, nice sort of a rigidity feature of the external case. Uh, so the, the questions that uh, kind of motivated the, 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 the research, uh, research I, I did with some collaborators in, on, on this problem uh, are mainly, so the reasons are related to this question. So first, can we relax or, or maybe find a kind of wider and maybe sort of the most, uh, lar the largest class of uh, domains in terms of regularity of the boundary or for which this sort of result can be reproduced up to some extent. And second, is it possible to uh, uh, consider more general mean curvatures in particular measures? So here, uh, um, uh, the, the answers or partial ans answers to these uh, this questions. First, uh, uh, some, with some joint works with uh, Giorgio Saracco, we, we got this uh, extension to the so-called class of weekly regular domains I will introduce. And, um, and uh, yes, and uh, uh, second, the PMCM equation, the prescribed mean curvature me measure equation. This is an ongoing project with uh, Giovanni Cohn. And here, the, the point is to, try to understand which is the natural weak formulation of the problem in this uh, setting and uh, try to guarantee at least under some assumptions of the existence of solutions. Okay, so let me introduce weekly regular domains. What is a weekly regular domain? It's a bounded open set uh, with finite perimeter, but such that uh, the perimeter, its perimeter uh, coincides with the Hausdorff uh, H and minus one measure of the topological boundary. So uh, essentially the reduced boundary is almost everything. Uh, covers almost uh, all points in terms of the out of measure of the boundary. And uh, so it's a very mild assumption, but uh, it has some consequences. For instance, on the fact that you can approximate from the inside such a, a domain in both the volume and perimeter uh, by means of smooth uh, compact subdomains. So this is a, a, an important feature that, that uh, is uh, linked to this, uh, to this assumption. And uh, the, 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 the examples that you can find are quite irregular in the sense that maybe their boundary is not even locally a graph. Like in this uh, picture, you, here you have a sort of holes of various uh, kind that are accumulating towards uh, parts of the boundary. So there is a sort of porosity that uh, might increase in a certain controlled way when you when you go to the boundary. So you don't have a, uh, you don't have a, that even locally you can, you can represent this, uh, this as a, uh, an uh, epigraph of, a, of some 
regular function. Okay, and let me also say that uh, uh, object of, of this kind can also be found such that they satisfy some, some uh, uh, they are solutions of some problems. In particular, you can construct so-called minimal Chigar sets that are of this kind. And the minimal Chigar sets are uh, sets for which it, when you minimize the ratio perimeter over volume among the subsets of those sets, then they are the unique minimizers of this problem in, in, in themselves. So these are minimal Chigar sets. Why, why those sets are interesting? Because they are closely related to the extremality phenomenon in capillarity. In a sense, you might want to, to uh, consider domains of this kind, so minimal Chigar set for a, uh, an experiment, <laughs> some kind of exotic experiment in capillarity. But say, maybe more interesting for mathematicians than for, for other people. OK. Um, um, and now I want to introduce some other uh, concepts and notations for what uh, will come next. Uh, weak normal traces and the lambda pairings. So uh, before entering into those uh, concepts, I have to uh, recall a, a very uh, well-known decomposition of the gradient of a, uh, of a BV function. So the gradient can be decomposed into a absolutely continuous path with respect to Lebesgue a jump part and a counter part. And just for the sake of notation, uh, um, I will consider the jump part as uh, written in this way. So we have a, a, say an upper trace at the jump point, a lower trace and the jump point and the normal pointing toward the, the, the jump, the positive side of the, the jump times the uh, HN minus one measure restricted to the jump set. So this is the, the, the way of representing the jump part of the um, of the gradient of a BV function. And, uh, and now what I want to do is to define a so-called uh, lambda representative of a BV function. What is that? It is a function that is defined H and minus one almost everywhere in this way. So um, you fix your preferred Borel function lambda from omega to zero one. And then you define U lambda at X in this way. So if you are outside the, the singular set or say the jump set, essentially you take the uh, approximate limit which exists of the BV function and you define U lambda as a U tilde, the, the approximate limit. Or if you are on the jump set, you take the convex combination of the upper trace and the lower trace by means of lambda at X, okay? So this is a sort of a general uh, form of a, of a represent of, so it's a general class of representatives of, a, uh, of a BV functions. And, but maybe you could be more familiar with the, the so-called precise representative, which is just the one that you obtain by taking lambda equal to one half. It's called the, right, often you star and, and, and it's the precise representative, it's, it's a classical, object, uh, these U lambda are less classical. They have been introduced uh, uh, more recently, say about two, two years ago. Um, okay, and uh, so now I want to uh, um, arrive to a gauss green formula, which is a very, so quite new uh, gauss green formula considered uh, recently in connection with the notion of uh, lambda pairings and also of concept of weak normal trace of a certain kind of, of vector fields. So let's take a, a weakly regular domain omega, a BV function, which is also in L infinity and a vector field psi, which is a bounded vector field whose uh, distributional divergence is a finite measure. And, and, and so uh, let's fix also a Borel function lambda and consider the U lambda representative as before. So then you can prove I write it uh, in a very general form, in a weak form, but you should recognize it as the gauss green form made in a generalized way. Uh, so you have uh, U lambda integrated with respect to the divergence measure of the vector field plus the so-called lambda pairing measure uh, integrated on omega. And, and these are equal, so uh, 
are equal to the integral on the boundary of omega of the trace. This is the trace the, from the inside of the function u integrated with respect to the normal trace measure. So this is a quite abstract uh, way of writing the, the gauss green formula. And uh, the point is that I wanted to introduce what is a lambda pairing between a, a vector field belonging to the so divergence measure vector fields, this class of vector fields, and the gradient of a BV, BV function. So uh, in order to define this, uh, you, you have to just uh, also add the, the, the choice of the lambda uh, function, so the lambda representative. And uh, the lambda pairing is nothing but the divergence of u xi, which you can prove that is a, actually a measure under those assumptions, minus u lambda times the divergence of, of xi. Okay. Um, concerning the, uh, oops, sorry, what did I do? The right hand side, the normal trace measure, it's an, an important fact that you can represent the normal trace measure as an L infinity function. Uh, on the boundary, the so-called weak normal trace of the vector field at the boundary, times the uh, perimeter measure, okay? And this weak normal trace is uh, an object that uh, can, can be defined for these vector fields here, even though uh, you can consider vector fields that have no classical trace in any measure theoretic sense that you can imagine at the boundary. So really the intrinsic, uh, we could say variational object that you can consider is only this normal trace that is defined, well defined on the boundary. Okay, uh, so uh, the, 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 the formula that I showed you is a sort of a tip of an iceberg uh, of a process of a generalization, for so successive generalizations of the Gauss Green formula that start from uh, work of the Georgi, most of you know very well, very well and then Federer, Volper. And then with some uh, crucial work uh, and even some unpublished one by Ancelotti, who was uh, actually already discovered about 10 years uh, later by uh, various people, Chen and Fried, first of all, and then uh, other, other people in connection with applications to conservation laws, regular Lagrangian flows, uh, and uh, more recently with appli application to BV super solution of one Laplace's equations and, and so on. So the last, the, 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 that formula, is actually something that you can uh, derive from a re very recent work by Krasta, De Chico, and Malusa that were inspired somehow by previous work by Shevan and Schmidt. But it's really a tip of an iceberg. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me um, yes let me uh, present now the first uh, uh, part of the research we have done, and uh, so what we we could proof in, uh, in, in the setting of weakly regular uh, domains is that when you say you prescribe this, a, a good, a nice function H, a Lipschitz function on the domain, such that it satisfies the necessary condition, then you have exactly uh, just this result. So you can find the solution, which is a C2 regular inside omega. So you have internal regularity due to the regularity of the, of the function, okay? And in the extremal case, you have the equivalence as before with the uh, extremality, uniqueness, maximality, and verticality. But with the exception that verticality now has, must be, at least we have been able to express it only using the weak normal trace, which is good uh, some, in some sense, but uh, you would like to say more in general. And uh, what we could prove is that uh, uh, you can say more, at least in dimension two. In dimension two, you can prove that the, the, the trace of, uh, of the vector field TU exists in a classical sense almost everywhere and coincides with the outer norm, which is what you expect as a physical, say, vertical contact on the boundary. Okay? The full trace exists, but we have been able to prove this property only in the uh, two-dimensional case, which is the physical one, because when you study capillarity, you typically have cylinders with a two-dimensional cross-section. But in general dimensions, we, we have not been able to get uh, this extra property. And uh, very quickly, let me show you which is the point. So what we, we could prove in, for, for getting this, uh, uh, say, uh, this uh, classical trace uh, starting from a weak, a weak normal trace with a certain uh, property. 
so the point is that in two dimensions, we can prove a general fact concerning a divergence measure vector fields uh, in, in a weakly regular domain. So uh, if you know that this vector field has a, 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 a weak normal trace which saturates its possible uh, uh, modulus, so it, it coincides, uh, so it's, uh, sorry, uh, I should write a, a modulus here. So the modulus is uh, the norm, exactly the norm of the, uh, the vector field, the L infinity norm of the vector field. So they assume that you know that the weak normal trace is maximal in this sense uh, on the boundary. Then uh, you can prove that there exists the, uh, the trace as an approximate limit almost everywhere. And why this is so? Uh, because you, at some point, you, you have a certain argument by contradiction. Uh, you scale, you, uh, you blow up, and uh, you end up with a divergence-free vector field in, in the plane, uh, satisfying some properties. And uh, thanks to uh, just a convolution, by convolving this vector field with a mollifier, you end up with a smooth vector field that satisfies the properties that you see here. And so by, uh, we, had a, we, we, we proved that this uh, rigidity theorem saying that if such a vector field exists, it must be zero. So getting a contradiction with the non-triviality of the blow up vector field obtained uh, at the beginning. Uh, so the, the, this, uh, this theorem, so I don't want to say more much on that because the, the time is not too much, but uh, let's say that, um, Okay, you have a vector field uh, that is zero on a half plane and, uh, and has a certain property. So it, it has divergence zero on, in the whole plane. And it has a certain property relating the second component with uh, the modulus of the vector field. So the second component of the vector field is always larger up to a constant than the modulus squared of the vector field. So it can point upward, but uh, let's say with a, cont a quadratic control. Uh, and uh, so if you have such a vector field, then you prove that it must be necessarily uh, the, uh, the, the, the trivial vector field on R2. It's not a complicated proof, but uh, I, I, want to, I want to go a bit fast here. Um, so what we thought at the beginning, well, maybe this property, this rigidity for vector fields might be true in higher dimensions. And then after some time, uh, we found <laughs> counter examples in dimension four and higher with a certain uh, cylindrical symmetry. And we have not understood what can happen in dimension three. Uh, it's a kind of subtle problem. And uh, uh, for sure the, the strategy doesn't work anymore if uh, N is larger or equal than four. So one has to find some, some new idea, some different idea. And in dimension three, we don't know because uh, uh, we have proved that uh, cylindrical, uh, cylindrically symmetric counterexamples cannot be constructed. So if there is a counterexample, it's much more complicated. Okay, so that's it. Um, I think I have more or less uh, half an hour yet. Yes, more or less. More eh, what? If not 15. 20, 20 minutes? Ah, add up to four. Okay, 20 minutes, it's okay. Okay, so let me uh, say what I can <laughs> on the describing curvature measure problem. So what, we, uh, what I want to do now is to try to solve uh, this equation, the same equation, but with the measure at the, on the right-hand side. Um, and my goal, just to start, in, start, in, start to understand the, the basic of the problem is to uh, find an appropriate notion of weak solution and uh, see if uh, this solution uh, uh, gives me some reasonable necessary condition for existence like the one the ones that we have seen before uh, and then under maybe necessary condition slightly reinforced prove existence of weak solutions so, uh, the basic of, of the theory for this kind of equation and here, let me stress that uh, the difficulty of this equation is that, uh, so the, the left-hand side, uh, so the, the, 
let's say the elliptic part of the operator is degenerate at infinity, it, it is linear at infinity. So this is a major problem in existence, especially when you also couple this, this, this bad property, let's say, of the minimal surface operator with a, 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 a prescribed datum, which is a measure, which can be concentrated. That's the problem. Concentrated measure can, can pose some problems. So what what uh, what uh, what we do? But well, first of all, I, I just recall the notion. Uh, I should have done this before, but the notion of area of the graph of a function in BV, because the setting will be BV, and the solution I will find will be just in BV. I cannot have a regularity when a mu is general, okay, more than BV. So what is the area of the graph? Is something that you can define as a, in a similar way as the total variation. So it's the supremum of this expression. It's like, so if, uh, well, if you is, uh, if you were Sobolev, then here by integrating uh, uh, by parts, you would have essentially the L1 norm of the vector one, uh, if you want, minus gradient, okay? Which is exactly the area of the graph in the classical sense. So uh, uh, you can do this in uh, the BV setting. And what you get is essentially what you expect. So the perimeter, of the epigraph, which uh, when you evaluate the measure in uh, some uh, little omega, you get the perimeter of the epigraph of u in the cylinder omega times r. Okay, you have also comparison, uh, very easy to prove, uh, between uh, say the, the area uh, and uh, the total variation. And what uh, and the functional, the area function is convex and lower semi-continuous in L1 as the, 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 the total variation. Okay. Uh, what I want to do now is to try to characterize the vector field TU. So what uh, the, the one which in the classical case is gradu di, uh, divided uh, over a square root of one plus gradu square, okay? So here we have a BV function, so it's not clear what you should do. There are maybe different approaches, but the, 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 the good one is this one. So you characterize T, T of U by this fact. So Let's do a formal computation, pointwise. Let's say. So you take du times du. What you have is du squared uh, divided by the square root of blah blah blah. Then you sum and subtract one, and then you 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 split, and you have uh, you get a square root of one plus gradu square minus one over square root of one plus gradu square. And this last term can be written in this way. So u times du uh, equals the area, uh, sorry, the area density, if you want, minus uh, this uh, function here, which is a function between zero and one, square root of one minus modulus of tu squared, okay? Note that uh, in general, for a vector field with norm less than or equal to one, uh, you have always less than or equal here. So the equality case says that, uh, when you have exactly TU, you saturate the, the inequality, okay? So this should characterize TU, the, the good one. And so the idea that you might have is, okay, uh, here I have a, essentially TU times the U, so a uh, color product, characterized in terms of uh, things that can be also more generally considered as measure or density, measure densities. And so what I can, I can say, I can try to uh, say that, well, a uh, weak solution of the PMCM equation is uh, U, a function U such that there exists a vector field T with a norm less than or equal to one on omega with divergence equal to mu and such that T times DU equals this difference of measure. So of course, this is a, the measure you have seen before. This is a, measure in the sense that it is an L infinity function times the Lebesgue measure, okay? So this equality should be uh, understood in sense of measures. But the point is, what is this T times the U? So this is the crucial point because this has no sense in general. So this is the problem. It has no sense in particular when T is discontinuous, how can you define T times the U? There's no canonical, no, 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 no reasonable way to define so this is the point, this is the core of the problem in some sense. And so let me present the, so 
the, the good idea, which is to use the pairing. And since we don't know which, which is the right pairing, we, uh, we, uh, we state, uh, say, a uh, weaker, so a, a notion of weak solution, which maybe can be reinforced a little bit after. So we say, uh, I say that uh, U, in BB, is a weak solution of the PMCM equation if you can find the vector, measurable vector field T and the Borel function lambda between zero and one, such that you have uh, an infinity norm controlled by one, the divergence of T is mu, and the lambda pairing of T with DU is the right hand side that you want. So the point now is to, is to, is to see which lambda is uh, the good one. But uh, let's say this has a, got inspiration from a, a recent work of, of Sheven and Schmidt on BV super solution of one Laplace and minimal surface equation where they kind of selected a, a certain representative. And here uh, I, I will show you how to get uh, variational solutions uh, up to some uh, hypothesis on mu. And for a special so, uh, choice of lambda, which is somehow reminiscent of what uh, Shevin and Schmidt uh, did for, for their, for their uh, purpose, for a special choice of lambda. So let's see what, what you, we can do and we, for which kind of measures I, I, I'm now able to, to do the, the process. So I define mu admissible. If I can uh, decompose it as an absolutely continuous part, with respect to the back, I'm not, I don't care much about, of course, plus a, a concentrated part with a positive part on some gamma plus uh, and a negative part on some uh, gamma minus. So here, gamma plus and gamma minus are compact subsets of uh, omega uh, with the finite out of HN minus one measure, because uh, I, I didn't say that, but if mu has to be a divergence, so there is a, a classical fact that you know, that is that mu necessarily is absolutely continuous with respect to h n minus one. Okay, so you, you do this, and uh, I have to require for technical reasons that the two supports of the of the positive and the negative parts are disjoint. So there are some distance between them. There is a distance, and uh, and the densities h uh, gamma plus and gamma minus are in L infinity are bound. Gamma plus is positive, gamma minus is negative. And finally, an assumption on the, uh, uh, say, half uh, alpha regularity of the, of the uh, concentrated part or, or on the support, say, gamma plus and gamma minus. So I need that, uh, uh, say, HN minus one of gamma plus or of gamma minus in a ball uh, of radius R centered at the point of, uh, say, gamma plus or minus is less than or equal than some constant times rho uh, to the, power, the radius of the ball to the power n minus one for all points in the in, in gamma and for all radii smaller than some threshold radius. So why this assumption? Well, because with this assumption, I can guarantee that mu is in, in the dual of BV. And prove that mu at this point is a in, in duality with BV. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, yeah, quite technical, but I would say crucial, crucial assumption. And finally, uh, I say, uh, sorry, mimicking the definition that you have seen uh, before, I say that mu is non-extremal if there exists a constant between zero and one, uh, constant L, such that uh, modulus of mu of E is less than or equal than L times perimeter of E for every E, say, a compact subset of omega with Lipschitz or even just smooth boundary as, as before but with the mu instead of the integral of h with respect to the back. That's a non-extremality. And uh, okay, now let's uh, go to the weak uh, formulation. I fix uh, a ball that contains uh, omega. This is a, a, a it, it simplifies uh, many things. And I fix a function on say w1, one on b, which acts as a boundary condition on omega prescribed from the outside. And indeed, uh, you, you will see in which sense. It, it's in a sort of weak sense because I don't go into the problem of saying, uh, of checking whether uh, actually the trace of u will equal the trace of phi 
so uh, on on the boundary of omega so this is an, another story I, I won't discuss this but this is a weak way of prescribing a digitally type boundary datum and then i take mu admissible and non-external and uh, and i consider this variational problem so i I, uh, the infimum over a, a class of BV functions on the ball, which agreed uh, uh, with the, the prescribed function phi outside omega of J mu of u. This is uh, the area functional, say on the whole ball, plus the integral of a certain lambda representative of u with respect of, uh, of mu. And the, the lambda here is lambda sub mu because it depends on mu is exactly the characteristic function of the support of the negative part of the measure, the concentrated negative part of the measure, gamma minus. Why this choice? Because in this way, u lambda, uh, lambda mu will be equal to u plus on gamma minus and u minus on gamma plus. And in doing that, essentially, I have minimized this term with respect to the all possible lambda. So this, is, uh, this choice lambda mu is the optimal one to minimize this integral term, which is reasonable because you want something that you want to find solution. You, you hope that this is a lower semi-continuous function. So in order to do that, you choose the right representative here. So it comes from a minimization such. Okay. Um, now, okay. Uh, lower semi-continuity. Apparently, it should be easy because we have the area term, which is a lower semi-continuous problem. But then uh, you realize that uh, the integral term is not lower semi-continuous. That's the problem. And uh, it's a problem that, uh, that does not arise when uh, uh, the measure mu is absolutely continuous. Uh, it's a trivial thing that uh, you have continuity of the term or the integral term in that, in that case. But now you don't have lower semi-continuity. And the, and the fact is that uh, is maybe represented, well represented by this example, very uh, simple one dimensional example. You have a sequence of functions, uh, mu is a Dirac delta here. We have a sequence of function and in the limit, they say the lower, the, the value on the measure of these functions jumps up. So this, uh, this is a, a clearly in contrast with the lower semi-continuity. So it's a problem. But now you look at the situation. So why you have lost the lower semi-continuity here, somehow this is because you, have, you had a collapse of, uh, uh, of two sheets in the graph. And so you, have, you have, must have lost in the good, in the other sense, uh, a certain amount of area, of vertical area actually in the limit. So of, uh, and so you can hope that uh, this loss here in the semi, so this strict uh, lower semi continuity of the area could compensate the possible error in the lower semi continuity of the integral uh, of the integral term. And, uh, and this is indeed the, the, the idea. So, local failure of lower semi continuity of the, integral, of the integral term should be compensated by failure of continuity of the area term. This is the hope that the picture, the, the picture suggests. And uh, why you can hope that this is really true because you have the, the non-extremality condition. So basically what you have, uh, so the error you have here should be com compensated in a way that is, you can see in this easy example by, uh, by doing coarea here and uh, layer cake here. So you just look at the le level by level and then you see that there is this, this compensation using coarea and layer cake representation of the integral. Um, okay. So this is the idea. But the point is that when you try to say extend this idea, this one dimensional picture in the more general case, you, you find a number of difficulties. There, are, there is a number of difficulties uh, due to the localization of this uh, idea to so the, 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 this uh, computation of this compensation. It's, uh, there is a number of uh, problems. And so, um, so the proof of the lower semi-continuity, I, I, uh, works by contradiction. So you assume that you have a, a sequence converging to U in L1 and such that the, the, the functional on the sequence is strictly below the value of the functional on, on U uh, minus some positive rho fixed rho. So assume that up to say subsequences you can 
assume that. And uh, then you have to operate a, search, a certain kind of local comparison and uh, taking control of certain errors. And how to do that? Well, there are some, uh, a couple of tools that are very useful. And uh, a, at least one of them is also useful for, also for the study of pairings, of general pairings. It is the first one. The first result is this lambda approximation. It is nothing but a, a, a refined form of an Ancelotti Jacquinta approximation theorem. Uh, it's actually a refinement of what was already known for the precise representative. So uh, it, was, it was already known. You can uh, read the Ambrosio Fusco Pallara's book and uh, you find this property that uh, when you have uh, uh, a BV function and you prescribe a, a Borel function lambda, so when lambda is equal to one half, this was known essentially. So what you have that uh, you can find a sequence of uh, infinity function in BV such that the, these converge in L1 to U, the total variation con converge, also the area functional converge. Uh, and uh, finally, you have that uh, uh, pointwisely, the functions UH converge to the, the representative H n minus one almost everywhere. So the idea that you have uh, that you exploit here is the following. So assume that you have a pure jump and you convolve it. When you do the regularization, like in uh, say, Ancelotti Jacquinta strategy, uh, what, you, what you get is a, a convolution that passes through the midpoint. So the average of the, 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 the jumps, okay, the, the two, two traces. So that's why the, you converge almost everywhere to the precise representative. But now the idea is that you want to uh, perturb this uh, sequence, the Ancelotti Jacquinta sequence, let's say. And uh, first, you understand what, to, what you have to do in the pure jump uh, uh, case. So, I jump along a hyper, uh, hyper plane. You have to shift, you have to push, say, uh, in some direction, the profile. So, you have to apply deformation, local deformation, in order to, to reach. Uh, the, reach the, the good uh, value of the representative that you want. Okay, this is a, 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 an easy picture, one dimensional, uh, pure jump. You have to use a, a bit of machinery of the geometric measure theory, covering theorems, uh, losing Egorov uh, and so on, in order to get uh, the, the, this, this idea applied to the, to the problem to, to solve, to find this sequence. So this, but this is the, the idea, nothing more. And the, uh, the other uh, tool, the other tool is uh, what I call a, a one-sided local truncation estimate. So let me present this, uh, the, this estimate. Um, you take a threshold M, a positive threshold, take a, a, an open set with the Lipschitz boundary and such that the measure mu does not charges the boundary and assume that uh, mu is negative if restricted on U. So you, you say you have to operate locally on positive part, like a negative part. So let's take the negative part, for, for example, and then take a, a, a function in your class and define a truncation. And this is an upper truncation inside U. So you take the minimum between uh, the function and the, the threshold M inside U and uh, V hat equal to V outside, okay? You have this upper truncation when the measure is negative. Okay. Then you can estimate how much you, you gain in, uh, in, uh, in energy in terms of the starting energy. And you have the starting energy plus a term. Here, this is, can be uniformly bounded because it's the functional. You can say that it is uniformly bounded. Here you have the boundary datum. So this is fixed. And here you have a certain constant. This is the Poincare constant of the ball. And here something depending on L. And since L is less than one, this is finite, divided by M. So if M is large, then you have a uniformly small thing here, which is very important, plus an extra term, which is related to what is above M on the boundary of U, on the boundary of U. So why, why this works in this way? Because if you don't say, assume that instead of truncating above, under this assumption, you truncate below, 
Then there is an extra term here, which is bad. And that doesn't let you control the amount of energy that you add when you do this procedure. So the, 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 the side of the truncation depends on the sign of the measure where you are locally truncating. So for instance, if the measure was positive, you, you, only, you could only truncate from below and not from above. So this is, a, I, I don't know, I, it's the first time I, I see such a, but maybe there is some sort of similar situations in the literature, I, I don't know. Uh, and that's very important because, uh, okay, you can do this asymmetric statement, of course, from below instead of from above. And the point is that uh, you need to truncate, uh, at least I, I had to truncate because I, I, I don't want that uh, the, the sequence of DH become too large, a near smaller and smaller portion of say gamma minus. That's the problem. So because uh, this would could might happen if, uh, even if you have L1 convergence of the sequence, everything. But on gamma, you, you cannot control very well the behavior unless you truncate. And this is important because when you do quarry estimates, at some point you have to glue up your estimates. And if you don't control the error uh, in, a, in a uniform way, you cannot integrate over an infinite uh, half line, let's say. So you need to have a bound. So if you have a small error with a, with a, with a bound M, you have a control on the integrated error or among levels. So this is the, the point. Uh, okay, I have to basically conclude. There is a coercivity proof. This is not, not difficult at all. You only have to prove a, an estimate for which, uh, again, the lambda approximation theorem uh, uh, turns out to be very useful. And then you use coarea and uh, so uh, and layer cake. So this is again something that you have to look at uh, by uh, looking level by level, uh, but uh, together with the lambda approximation theorem. Well, as soon as you have this estimate, it is not difficult to prove that uh, just thanks to the fact that L is slightly smaller than one, you get some coerciveness uh, due to the fact that the, the zero extension of U outside omega. Uh, for, for this extension, you can bound the total variation by a constant that depends on one minus L and the, the energy, basically. Okay, so, so you get the compactness thanks to Poincare inequality. This is easy at the end, not very difficult. Okay, so uh, we, we found a solution. We have a solution. But now we want to prove that this solution uh, satisfies the weak formulation. So how do we do that? Uh, we use convex duality. And, uh, and to do that, it is, a, I would say, a, a, a bit technical at some points, but uh, quite standard, not, not very. If I have, uh, say, uh, two, three minutes, I, I present uh, this last part. And so I need to introduce some spaces. So uh, first, uh, I have some notation that you can find maybe in some book, maybe in Ekelante Mam, you, you can take a look and there will be many, many, notation, many notations uh, quite similar. Uh, so V is uh, just the BV space, BV of, of omega. And the, the funny thing is that here, uh, personally, I had to use for my first time, the strong BV topology, <laughs> which is the topology that you don't uh, use uh, quite often. Typically it's not good for, for, for uh, Variational problems, but, but now this is the good topology for say uh, variations for first variations, and in, in a sense, convex duality is a way to globalize uh, first variation uh, of, of your function. This is at least uh, how I have uh, understood the, the, the thing, uh, and you need the strong BV topology. It's very important. Uh, then I need to introduce also a subset of V. I call it V tilde. It's a set of functions uh, in V, BV functions, which agree uh, in trace sense with the, the minimizer on the boundary of omega, and such that their jump set is uh, contained in, in the jump set of the minimizer. So it's a class of competitors in some sense. And uh, uh, moreover, the normal at the jump set is the same as the normal of the minimizer. So, so the sign of the jump is the same. So all these competitors jumps in the same direction as the minimizer. They jump, okay? 
uh, and in particular, where? Well, of course, on the uh, jump set, but also on the support of the measure, the singular part of the measure. And uh, this makes the VT the closed, oops, sorry, a closed convex subset of V. Okay. Then we have uh, Y, it's uh, the space of uh, vector value random measures on omega, and do it with the total variation topology. And this total variation topology is important, and that's why I need to use here the strong VV topology. So that the say the gradient operator is continuous in V and Y. The gradient operator sends continuously EV functions to their gradients, their, their measure their gradients. Okay, and we have the dual of Y star, which thanks to the topologies that I have chosen, it can be in, seen as a subspace of L infinity. So these are Y star is a collection of L infinity vector fields with some properties, but let's say that this is enough. And then I define some functional. So the G of P is the corresponding area functional, but for vector value rather measures to define it in the same way. And then I define the corresponding say functional in this convex setting where the integral with respect to mu of the solution or of the competitor u appears. And, um, and here I need to use V tilde and put uh, this to plus infinity outside. Why? Because if I don't do this, if I just take this uh, functional, the integral part on the whole BV, then this functional is not convex. I, actually, it is concave. But when restricted, oops, sorry. When restricted to the tilde, the functional become essentially linear on the restriction. So it is convex globally with this definition. So there is this technical point. And after you have found the way of letting the machinery of convex duality work or start, then you get so that your primal problem has a dual problem and they both have solutions. So the first, you know that admits a solution but also the, the, the dual as a solution for uh, up, uh, so general uh, results in convex duality. And then you have uh, two optimalities identities that can be also rephrased in terms of uh, subdifferentials of the two functions f and g. And uh, if you write down these uh, optimality identities where you have, you see the, the Fanchel uh, trans, um, transform, uh, uh, F star, G star, okay. Uh, you, you can write down exactly what, what those uh, relations uh, mean and you obtain two systems. So the red one, the blue one. Uh, so you find the say a vector field, the optimal vector field for the dual problem has a new as a prescribed divergence. And, uh, oh, I should stop. Yes, sure. Very quickly, sorry, sorry. Uh, the time is, you are right, you are right, sorry. And uh, essentially, you are done because then you can uh, you observe that uh, by the red relation, you obtain that uh, the duality pairing is exactly the lambda mu pairing. There is ex the exact correspondence between duality and the lambda mu pairing that you have uh, considered. And then with some extra work, you end up uh, proving that uh, the, the vector field T, which is minus the solution of the dual problem, minus P star tilde, is the right one for which the, the remaining equation in the weak formulation is, uh, is satisfied. And so that's why uh, you, you find the solution, but with the precise lambda, which this lambda mu that I, uh, you have, uh, I have introduced. And that's more or less the end, some, uh, Hey, remarks and uh, ideas for, uh, for the next thing to do. Uh, but I have no time to, I stop here. So thank you for, the, for your patience. <laughs> thank you. Sorry for having pushed it too much. But uh, are there questions or comments? Ferrato? Maybe it was on a line of your answers, but this approach works for, you always spoke about uh, uh, curvature, uh, 
question, let's say, but uh, do you think it, it's more general than this? There is the first line uh, partially answer. Can, I, can, can, I you, would, can you use this approach? You are to... right. I think so. For more general function with the linear growth, uh, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, I mean, it's a bit uh, earlier to early to, to, to answer to your question, but I would say, I would say so. The techniques uh, seem, uh, seem quite, quite general. I mean, uh, you, as soon as you can do co-area and then there are other technicalities, but they are not really related, I would say, to the specific, uh, very specific properties of the, of, uh, the area functional or, or of the total variation functional. So I, I, I think it will be possible. Yes. Thanks. Divergence form of the equation, yes. So you should need something like divergence of something equal to mu. Yeah. Yes. Ah, so ah, divergence oh, yes. type operator. So actually, with the, the sole assumptions that I made on mu, uh, you can prove that uh, so if mu, since mu is in the, in the dual of BV, and, uh, and uh, since it satisfies the um, non-extremality condition. Uh, I don't know if you remember the, that one, uh, the non-extremality, it was, uh, let me go back, the non-extremality, there is a, okay, where, what, what, okay the non-extremality condition here. So when you have this, you can, there is an abstract result, it's due to Torres and, uh, and Pook. Uh, they prove that uh, immediately mu is a divergence of a vector field with the, uh, with, uh, norm less than L. So this is an abstract, but okay, it's a vector with the same divergence. It might have nothing to do with the, the vector field that you want to find, which is uh, related to you, to the solution of the problem. But yes, so mu is automatically, a, say, a, a divergence under these assumptions. Okay, so before starting with the seminar by Jean-François, uh, let me recall you that uh, today, just after this seminar, there is uh, the photo that is outside here. Okay, so um, welcome back to the morning session. And this next last talk of today is uh, by Jean-François Babajan, who will talk us about the special hyperbolicity for the system of perfect plasticity. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... And uh, okay, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this conference. So, although I regret of not having the possibility to be present. Um, uh, so I will speak about uh, a joint work with uh, Gilles Francfort, uh, which is actually the product of the first uh, lockdown, uh, of the first French lockdown. So actually, it was uh, helpful for us from this point of view. And uh, this is about uh, plasticity, about perfect plasticity. And I, uh, we think it is actually the beginning of a, of a quite a long time uh, project in which we try to, uh, to understand uh, uh, a special hyperbolic structure in the system of uh, perfect plasticity, which gives uh, new information on the solution to this type of problems that uh, variational models and calculus of, of variations was uh, un unable to, to produce up to now, to our knowledge at least. So, uh, okay, so I will speak about plasticity. So I know that many people don't know what is plasticity. So I will try to explain you in a few words what, what it is. And uh, to understand what it is, uh, I will really start from the, really from the very beginning by speaking about elasticity and by speaking even about one dimensional elasticity. So one dimensional elasticity, you can just imagine an elastic, which is one dimensional uh, medium. And, um, and so you take your elastic, you fix, you clamp it at some uh, extremity and on the other extremity, you stretch it. And what happens is that uh, when you uh, uh, unload your, your, your elastic, it precisely goes back to, uh, uh, to its original configuration. And this is elasticity. So mechanicians like to express um, uh, the behavior of materials by means of what is called a, a constitutive law. A constitutive law is a phenomenological relation uh, which relates the stress that I call sigma to uh, the strain, or here in the case of an elastic, it is just the stretching of the elastic, which I call epsilon, okay? 
And in linear elasticity, uh, sigma is a linear function of epsilon. So here, I just put a constant equals to one. Okay, sigma is equal to epsilon. So this is the easiest constitutive law that you can imagine. So I don't know if there are people familiar with mechanics in the audience. So there are several, I think. So I apologize because I put every mechanical constant to be equal to one. Of course, uh, there are dim dimensional issues. So a force cannot be equal to, uh, to, um, to a strain. Uh, so there should be constant in front, but I put every constant to be equal to one, okay? Just to simplify the exposition. Okay, so this is elasticity. Uh, so then uh, let me introduce perfect plasticity in the, still in this one dimensional context. So in perfect plasticity, there is an additional um, requirement that the forces, so they call sigma, are constrained to stay in, inside a fixed uh, set. So here I am uh, imposing that sigma must belong to the set minus one one. So it should not exceed the force plus one in tension and the force minus one in compression. Right. Um, okay, and then uh, so you do exactly the same. So you have your material, which is not an elastic anymore. Okay, uh, and you start stretching it. Okay, so when you stretch, as so you have first a linear response in forces. Okay, like that, exactly as in the case of elasticity, as long as uh, the the force reach reaches uh, the critical value, which is one. So. so uh, once, you, so uh, one, when you are below one, the response is purely elastic, as is here. But when uh, the response in forces with respect to your solicitation in strain reaches the critical value one, so the material will continue to deform, to stretch, but the force will be blocked, will be stopped. Okay, and it's, if at some point you decide to unload in order to go back to a stress-free configuration, you will unload according to this path. And when you go back to your stress-free configuration, you observe that uh, there remains uh, uh, a deformation, uh, a residual deformation, which is this value here, okay, this, uh, this length here, uh, which is called um, permanent uh, deformation or also plastic deformation, okay? So P is exactly this value here. Uh, and we call it, uh, so, and how do you compute P in general? You compute P by uh, removing to the total strain, epsilon, the force sigma. So epsilon, uh, so P is equal to epsilon minus sigma. Okay? So P is a new uh, variable. It is a new unknown uh, to the problem. Okay? And so in order to, to hope to be able to solve uh, a system of equations that uh, I will more precisely explain in a few, in a few minutes, you should uh, add equations. You should add an equation. And the equation in the context of plasticity is the so-called flow rule. So the flow rule is the following. So, the, so for the time being, I'm considering a time evolution problem. So the, the uh, row here uh, is uh, the row of time, but in a few minutes, I will forget about times. This is just to explain the model. So the flow rule is expressed in terms of the time derivative of the plastic uh, variable. Okay, so P dot. So, so as long as the stress doesn't reach the, the threshold one and minus one, so if sigma in absolute value is strictly less than one, there will be no evolution, no time evolution of the plastic variable. Okay, so if you start from a, a body which, uh, which has no uh, residual deformation, it will remain uh, elastic. So this is the so called elastic zone, but once you reach the threshold either in tension, when sigma is equal to one, or in compression, when sigma is equal to minus one, you will prescribe the sign, the sign, sorry, of the time derivative of p. So to understand this, um, let me uh, try to motivate why uh, this condition, from where this condition come from. So assume that at some point, at some time t, so you are here, okay? So, and at some time t, you want to compute the plastic strain at time t. So what you do, you do a, a virtual unloading to go back to a stress-free configuration. So this is p of t, okay? And if at some subsequent time, s, you want to do the same. So s is here, so sorry for the writing. 
you want to, uh, to find the, the, the plastic um, variable at time s. So uh, again, you do a virtual unloading and you get here. Okay. So when you are uh, reaching the, the value sigma equal equal to plus one, and when s is larger than t, p of s should be larger than p of t, which is expressed in the following way that when sigma is equal to plus one, uh, uh, p dot plus p dot must be positive, non negative. And by symmetry, so I'm not doing the, the argument, if you reach minus one, uh, p dot should mean non positive. Okay, so the flow rule doesn't give you, uh, in general, the, the, the precise value of p or p dot, it gives you just its orientation. Okay. So this was a one-dimensional picture. So I'm going now to, to complexify a little bit the, 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 the geometry by considering a two-dimensional model. So I'm not going further than two dimensions, two dimension, because uh, our result only holds for the time being in two dimensions. So, uh, and I will not only restrict to the dimension, but also to the kinematics, which, which is the one of so-called anti-plane deformation. So, I'm going to consider essentially a two-dimensional uh, body. Imagine a membrane, okay? And uh, so, the def so the displacement will be defined on this membrane that I call omega. And uh, it will be scalar value. So it returns the vertical the, the displacement of the membrane. So in continuum mechanics, in solid mechanics, there are essentially two unknowns, two kinematic unknowns, the displacement. So here, uh, so that I call u, which is defined in uh, omega with scalar valued, while in general it is defined in R3 into R3, okay? So here, this is a kinematic simplification. And the stress, which in general is a three by three symmetric matrix. So here, under my assumption of anti-plane deformation, it reduces just to um, a vector valued function, so a function sigma defined on omega with values into work. Okay, so these are my first two unknowns. And um, in continuum mechanics, you have an, equilibri an, equilibri an equilibrium uh, equation uh, when you neglect um, uh, inertia and when you have uh, and when there are no um, external forces. And this equilibrium equation here reads uh, in the following way: so the divergence of sigma uh, with respect to the special variable should be equal to zero. Okay, so this is always. Uh, Two, which is a consequence of Newton laws. Okay, so then, uh, of course, uh, with only this information, you are unable to find neither sigma nor u because u doesn't appear here. And now enters the constitutive law. So in linear elasticity, so, so the forces are modeled by sigma, okay? And the strain that I called epsilon before uh, are the variation, the special variation of displacement. So uh, this is the gradient of u. So in linear elasticity, sigma is a linear function of the gradient of u. So the simplest situation you can imagine is that sigma is equal to the gradient of u. And when you plug this information into the equilibrium equation, you get Poisson's equation. That, uh, Laplace of u is equal to zero. Okay, so this is a very naive way if you want to see elasticity. Okay, so now uh, in plasticity, uh, what happens? So you still have the the equilibrium equation, of course, because this is something which holds true uh, anyway. And you, you have your stress constraint. So here, I'm going to consider the, the most, the, the easiest um, situation you can imagine, that the stress sigma is constrained to stay into the fixed closed unit ball. So the modulus of sigma is uh, less than or equal to one, okay? So uh, exactly as in the one-dimensional case, because of this uh, stress constraint, you must uh, consider uh, uh, an additional variable, which is the plastic variable, which is p. So p now will be a vector value function, okay, as sigma. So maybe I could write it, I will write it later. And uh, the relation which before read as p is equal to epsilon minus sigma, now reads as an additive decomposition of the gradient of u. So the gradient of u is equal to sigma plus p, which is the analogous to, to this. So epsilon, if you want, is the gradient of sigma. Okay, so this is the additive decomposition. And now the flow rule. So what is the analogous to, this, uh, to these conditions? So this is almost the same. So 
as long as sigma doesn't reach uh, the, the boundary of the ball, so as long as it, as it stays inside the open ball, so the modulus of sigma is strictly smaller than one, there is no evolutions of the plastic variable, so p dot is equal to zero. But when you reach it, when you touch it, you touch the boundary, sorry, when the modulus of sigma is equal to one, you will just prescribe the, 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 the orientation of p dot. So p dot divided by its uh, modulus will be equal to sigma. So it will be oriented towards the normal to the ball. Okay. And so this is the flow rule. So this is the analogous to this, uh, to this equation. And uh, this can be written in a more concise way in the following way, that the scalar product between sigma and p dot is equal to the modulus of p dot. Okay. So this is an equivalent way, an equivalent form, formulation of the flow. Okay, so um, in what we are doing, uh, we are not really interested in time evolution because time evolution is not really an issue. So from now on, I will forget about uh, time dependence and I will forget about the time derivatives. And I'm going to consider um, uh, never, uh, uh, even simplified model, which is called Enkel plasticity. So this is actually exactly the same, except that there is no time dependence and you remove the time derivatives, okay? So this is a purely stationary model. Uh, and um, the problem consists in finding three unknowns. So the first one is uh, the, the displacement u, which is a scalar value function defined on the bounded uh, set of R2. The plastic deformation, which is a vector value function, and the stress, which is also a vector valued function. So what, what does this triple uh, satisfy? Uh, it satisfies this uh, system of uh, nonlinear partial differential equations. So the first one is the uh, additive decomposition that the gradient of u is equal to sigma plus p. So maybe I should, I can do that in order you to see um, the previous slides. So this is the additive decomposition. The, um, uh, the equilibri equilibrium equation that the divergence of sigma is equal to zero, um, which was written here. The stress constraint that the stress belongs to the closed unit ball. And here, the flow rule you see, I have just formally replaced uh, p dot by p. Okay, so p is a time independent function. So the scalar product between sigma and p should be equal to the modulus of p. That I maybe uh, will still. Uh, refer to the flow rule in the SQL, although it's not the flow because there is no time derivative. Okay, so this is a boundary value problem. Okay, so we should impose the boundary conditions as in boundary value problem. So here, for simplicity, I'm going to impose a Dirichlet clay boundary condition on the full boundary. So W is a prescribed function, a prescribed displacement on the boundary. So uh, this is just for simplicity. Actually, um, that could be important to be able to impose a mixed boundary condition. So what does it mean, mixed boundary condition? It means uh, Dirichlet condition on the portion of the boundary and Neumann on the portion on the complementary. So this is just this is just because in the subsequent slide I'm going to present you an example where I actually consider mixed boundary condition. So here I'm just imposing. Full Dirichlet just to simplify the expression. So this is our problem, our problem of empty plasticity, which is very well known from the works of Temam, uh, Suke in the eighties, end of seventies and beginning of the eighties. And the first question is: Is it possible to solve uh, to get existence of solution to this problem? And the answer is yes, because this system turns out to be the Euler-Lagrange equation of the variational principle which is uh, the following. So it consists in minimizing uh, the so-called elastic energy, one half of sigma squared, plus uh, plastic, uh, plastic dissipation energy, which is the L1 norm of P, among all triples, U sigma P, which satisfies the following. So the, the additive decomposition, so this, this is done, uh, this is imposed into the, the, the unknown fields and the boundary condition, okay? So formally, if you uh, look at this, uh, not even formally actually, if you look at this uh, variational problem, uh, you write the Euler-Lagrange equation, you exactly get these equations. Okay, 
So uh, then, well, good. So now, how do you solve this uh, variational principle? So uh, you solve it using, uh, as usual, the, the direct method. And so you take a minimizing sequence, you n sigma n p n, and then you try to find compactness uh, to uh, and uh, to prove that the limit in the topology converges to a minimizer. And uh, so here appear the, the pathologies of the problem. So, so the energy is made of two terms. So a first term, which is very good because it is an L2 norm. So the sigma n would be bounded in L2, but a term which is not good because it is an N1 norm. So the Pn would be just bounded in L1. So it will converge just to a measure P that I still denote by P. And this measure, uh, it's not only a measure on omega, it turned out to be a measure in omega bar because it can uh, charge the boundary. It will precisely charge the boundary where uh, the boundary value will fail to be satisfied. So this is a classical, uh, a classical uh, uh, phenomenon when you try to, to minimize a linear growth functional with a Dirichlet boundary condition. For instance, think of the total variation. So minimize the total variation with the Dirichlet boundary condition. Uh, so when you relax this problem, uh, so uh, you must consider uh, uh, measures, and this measure can charge the boundary precisely where uh, the boundary condition is not satisfied. Okay, and so this original problem has to be relaxed in the sense that it has to be uh, seted in a, a larger space. Uh, in the so-called energy space. And what is the energy, the natural energy space here? So for sigma, it's easy because uh, you have an L2 bound, so it is in L2. For P, uh, since a priori, you just converge to a measure in omega bar, so it is a measure in omega bar. And the additive decomposition, which should still hold, uh, tells you that the gradient of U uh, should be equal to the sum of sigma plus P, so the sum of an L2 function and a measure. So the gradient of U should be a measure, so U should be in DV. So this is uh, the energy space, okay? And, uh, and the boundary condition might be lost on the boundary, okay? Uh, the original boundary condition might be lost, and uh, P will precisely charge the point of the boundary where the, the boundary condition is not satisfied. So P is equal to W minus U, uh, times the uh, outward normals to omega, new omega. Okay, and in this relaxed formulation, we can solve the problem without any, any ambiguity. Uh, so we have existence of solutions, and it is also possible to write the first order minimality condition, uh, which are exactly uh, these equations. Okay, okay, you have to forget now about the boundary condition because it is now expressed by this formula. So you have to be careful about the meaning to give to this, uh, this uh, nonlinear relation because sigma is uh, a priori just uh, an L2 or, an, or even an L infinity function uh, and P is a measure. So how do you multiply a function in a measure? This is not uh, straightforward, but actually um, this can be done exactly as it was um, uh, shown in the previous talk, because sigma is not an L infinity function, it's an L infinity function with zero divergence. So in the previous talk, uh, we had a, a divergence, which is a measure, so it's, it, here it is much easier because it is zero. And there is a way uh, to, to, to well define in a distributional way the, the, the product of such a function with a P, which is a part of the gradient of a DT function, okay? Essentially by integration by parts, uh, terms, uh, all the terms will make sense. And uh, so it gives, so this can be defined as a, as a distribution, which is actually a measure. Okay, so this is just to say that there is a weak uh, sense that can be given to this, to this equation. Okay, so, so very well. So we have existence of solutions. We have also the equations. Uh, so now, uh, what about, uh, so, so, um, so we, I have highlighted the first um, difficulty uh, in this type of problem is the L1 uh, growth condition uh, on the functional with respect to P. 
So it gives uh, two pathologies. The first one is that it leads to, con to concentration. So P has no reason to be a function. It is a general measure, and it can be. And moreover, uh, this term, which is here, uh, is not a strictly convex. So uh, it might also uh, lead to a non-uniqueness of solutions, which is actually the case. Uh, so uh, so I, I would like to present you now an example, an explicit example, where these uh, pathologies uh, explicitly appear. So this is not just a matter of, uh, because we are not able to do uh, to prove things, so this can really happen. So the example that I would like to present you is the following. So my, my open set omega is this, um, this set, okay? So uh, x belongs to the, is in between zero and one, and y is between zero and the straight line of equation um, y is equal to two minus x. So this is my, my open set. Okay. And so I'm going to impose actually the mixed boundary condition on the boundary of the set. So, uh, so I'm going to oppose a directly boundary condition here and here. Okay. With w here equals to x over square root of two. And here w is equal to this constant, two square root of two. And on the vertical sides, I'm going to impose a Neumann boundary condition that sigma nu is equal to minus one over uh, square root of two. And here, sigma nu is equal to uh, plus one over square root of two. Okay, so this, these are the data of my problem. And uh, so uh, I pass the details, of course, so I will not do the, the computation, but it's possible to solve explicitly uh, this, uh, perfect, this NK plasticity problem. And we can show that the stress is homogeneous in the sense that it is given by a constant vector, which is one over square root of two times the vector one, one, so this is a vector. So it is a constant vector in, the, in omega, uh, which by the way, maybe I can write it, is as always modulus equal to one, okay? So you don't see the elastic part. So the modulus of sigma is never strictly less than one. And uh, so in particular, it is also unique. And moreover, the displacement can be also obtained explicitly. It is, so all solutions of this problem are given by such a function. So uh, it is, so u of x, y is x plus y plus a function z of x plus y divided by square root of two. And z is any non-decreasing function defined on zero two. Uh, because when x and y belongs to, to omega, uh, x plus y, thanks to this uh, relation, uh, belongs to the interval 0, 2. So it's natural that x plus that z is a function in, defined on 0, 2. So z is any non decreasing function uh, on 0, 2, which is identically 0 on the interval 0, 1, and with the value 2 in 2. Okay? But in between one and two, it can do whatever it wants as long as it is increased. In particular, uh, so the, the fact that there, there are many such functions, of course, tells you that you have an example of non-uniqueness of solutions, okay? Uh, an explicit example. And on the other hand, since it can be any increasing function, you can put in between one and two a smooth function. You can put a jump or uh, as many jump as you wish or you can even put a counter vitality function. So it tells you that you can actually get any type of singularity that the Buzy functions allows you. So this explicit example uh, shows that indeed there can be uh, many, many uh, solutions uh, and then can be solutions which are uh, singular. Uh, but there is an additional uh, thing that this example shows. This example shows you that Okay, of course, sigma is constant, so there is nothing to see about sigma, but u has a precise structure. It is a function which actually depends on the variable x plus y, okay, and it is constant with res uh, on each line of equation x plus y is equal to, uh, to a fixed constant. So on the picture, what is it? What does it mean? So all equation, uh, all um, lines of equation x plus y is equal to constant are lines like that, 
which are parallel to this one. Okay? And when you are in this gray zone here in this triangle, okay, all straight lines which pass through this gray zone must at some point intersect this Dirichlet boundary. Okay? But since the value of the displacement is prescribed on the Dirichlet boundary, and since u, uh, u is constant along all lines of equation x plus y is equal to constant, the Dirichlet boundary condition here will totally will entirely uh, define the, the displacement in this gray zone. So in this gray zone, there is no ambiguity about what is u. And it coincides. It, it, yes, it, um, it coincides with the, with the set where x plus y is, is between 0 and 1 and where z is equal to 0. So in this gray zone, u of x, y is totally explicit and it is given by this expression, x plus y divided by square root of. This is because this line cross the Dirichlet boundary and on the Dirichlet boundary, the displacement is prescribed. And also because the function u is constant along these lines. However, when you have still an, uh, a line of equation x plus y is equal to a constant, but in this uh, white zone, you see that this straight line will never meet the Dirichlet boundary, okay? Because uh, you are outside the Dirichlet boundary. And in this, gray, in this um, white zone, there is an ambiguity on how to define u. And this is the reason why you can put actually any, uh, any increasing function z uh, on, on this zone, okay? So this is what I try to, to explain here. So on uh, u, my omega minus u, so u is, is, um, is this, so, so u is a white zone, so omega minus u is a gray zone. So in omega minus u, the line uh, of equation x plus y is equal to a constant intersects the bottom Dirichlet boundary. And since u is constant along each of these lines and u is prescribed on the Dirichlet boundary, so u will be uh, uniquely defined in this zone. However, in the capital U, in this white zone, okay, uh, this white zone, uh, so all uh, lines uh, of equation x plus y is equal to a constant which passes through this zone will not intersect the Dirichlet boundary. And so the boundary condition will not allow to, um, to uh, univocally determine u in this zone. So actually, here there is, uh, so for those of you who know a little bit of, uh, of a basic hyperbolic equation, because there is nothing very uh, deep here, uh, what is hidden behind this behavior is uh, the fact that um, there are hyperbolic equations which are hidden uh, between, uh, in this system of uh, perfect plasticity. And this equation, this line of equation f plus y is equal to a constant, correspond to the characteristic line associated to the, to the hyperbolic equation. And as usual in hyperbolic equations, uh, your solution should behave very well along these characteristic lines. And here, the best that you can hope is that they are constant along the characteristic, the characteristic lines. So this is what, what happens. OK. Um, so, and this is this phenomenon that we wanted to, to study with uh, Gilles in a more uh, abstract way and in a more uh, systematic way. So let's go back to our general situation. So we have uh, u, e, p, u sigma p, which is a solution to our uh, inky plasticity problem. And what we know, so these are already known results, is that the stress sigma is always unique, okay? Uh, which means that when you give yourself two solutions, u1, p, p1, sigma1, and u2, p2, sigma2 associated to the same data, sigma1 is equal to sigma2. This is a consequence of the fact that the energy in sigma is quadratic. So in particular, strictly convex. And not only it is unique, it belongs to, you have an additional regularity, which, is, which goes back to uh, works by Ben Susan and Fraser, which tells you that the stress sigma is locally in uh, the Sobolev space H1, which is not uh, an easy uh, result to be. To. So this is what we know about the stress. 
Now, there is another quantity which is important in this problem. It is the so-called plastic multiplier. The plastic multiplier that I will sometimes call lambda, it is a, the variation measure of P. So it is a positive measure, a non-negative measure, which satisfies that P is equal to uh, lambda times sigma. Uh, so this is the consequence of the flow rule. So uh, formally, at least, you know that uh, that uh, sigma dot p is equal to mod p, okay? Uh, so this can be expressed in a distributional way if you want, but this equation tells you that uh, formally p should be, should be parallel to sigma, huh? and uh, the, the coefficient in front uh, of sigma should be exactly this measure uh, lambda. So by the way, this product is well defined, thanks to the H1 regularity of sigma, because um, since sigma is H1 in two dimension, its singular points are of out of dimension zero. And lambda, so it is a part of the gradient of a BV function. And in 2D, the gradient of a BV function doesn't see sets of dimensions quickly lower than one. So uh, in particular, it doesn't see the singular points of sigma. So this product is well defined. Okay, so this plastic multiplier, uh, so using the, 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 the additive decomposition, which is, I recall you, du is equal to sigma plus, uh, plus p, I can write that, um, so, so I identify sigma, which is a function to, to a measure absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. So I can write that du is equal to sigma times, Uh, so the Lebesgue measure, okay, plus uh, the modulus of uh, times lambda by this equation, okay? So this is what I wrote here. So I replace du by this expression. And since uh, the, the curl of a gradient is zero, so I get this equation, okay? And this equation is actually a continuity equation. So this is another type of, uh, of hyperbolic equation in the variable lambda plus L2, which can, I can call a mu if you want. So this is a continuity equation. And to this continuity equation, I can associate characteristic lines. And characteristic lines will be solutions of the following ODE, x dot is equal to sigma per, so uh, yes, of, of x of t. So here it's a continuity equation expressed in terms of the curl. So if you write it as a divergence, you get uh, sigma perf. So the vector field, if you want associated to this continuity equation is sigma perf. So this continuity equation makes perfectly sense, okay? Uh, because all this, uh, in the sense of distribution, because of all of these products are, are well-defined. However, uh, the, this, uh, this ODE is, it is less obvious to, 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 to give it a sense because we have, uh, okay, we, we have this additional requirement, this additional regularity on sigma, but in general, it is not enough uh, to, um, to, to allow us to, to solve this equation in whatever sense. So uh, the, 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 the easiest situation is a cauchy lipschitz theory, which requires sigma to be, or sigma perp to be Lipschitz, which is not our case. Otherwise, in the Sobolev, when you have a Sobolev vector field, there are more, um, Uh, uh, deeper uh, theories due to the Pernalions and uh, uh, its uh, improvements by Ambrosio, uh, which uh, allows uh, Sobolev vector fields. Unfortunately, in all these type of results, uh, we need a control of the so-called compressibility constant. So the compressibility constant is related to the divergence of the vector field. So the divergence of sigma per, which correspond to the curl of sigma. And uh, in our case, we actually have no inform. So the best would be to have an L infinity bound on this quantity. Actually, it can be relaxed into a, a bound on the positive or negative part, I never remember, of this quantity. But in any case, we have no information on this quantity. And this lack of, of information uh, Uh, is an obstacle to, to use their, uh, these theories. So we, are, we were stuck uh, at this point. Uh, how can we try to, to solve this ODE? 
So since we were stuck, we needed to do uh, assumptions. And here arrives uh, the, the main assumption that we, that we did in order to, to go forward and to say something about this hyperbolic structure. So formally, omega is subdivided into two regions. The, what I'm going to call elastic region that I call omega e, which is a set of points where sigma is strictly less than one, and the plastic region where the modulus of sigma is equal to one. These sets have, in general, no reasons to have topological structure, to be open, closed, or whatever. But formally, at least in the elastic region, the material behaves elastically. So formally, we should, you should solve the Poisson equation in the elastic region. Uh, and so new things will happen in the plastic region, so we see, which is what I wrote here as plasticity is, activate, is activated in omega p. So here comes uh, our main assumption. In order to, to go forward, we needed to assume that this plastic region has non-empty interior, right? So this is an assumption, which means that we don't know how, if it is always true, it might be wrong, but actually it was true in the previous example. And in the previous example, we, we even add that omega p was equal to omega because, uh, all the set, because sigma was constant with modulus equal to one. So we, we, so, so we work now under this, this hypothesis that omega p has non empty interior and we will actually work inside a convex open subset, small omega of omega p. And convexity would be very important. So you can all, as long as omega p has non empty interior, there will always exist a convex open subset. Take for instance a ball, but it can also be the largest convex open set contained in omega p. So now the advantage is that uh, to, to, to respect our study to small omega is that sigma has always modulus equal to one. Instead of having an inequality constraint less than or equal, I have an equality constraint with an equality. And the other equations are unchanged. So the divergence of sigma is equal to zero and this um, continuity equation. And, uh, and sigma, so one very important thing is that sigma is an H1 log function. And this is not an assumption because this is the result, uh, a result that can be proved. And uh, this type of equation for sigma are very well known in the community of micromagnetics. So usually in micromagnetics, people call sigma M, like magnetization, which is a unit vector field and divergence free. And there is a huge literature on this type of problem, especially in dimension two, um, based on so-called entropy method and kinetic formulation. And uh, the main references that was useful for us was a work by De Simone Cohn Muller and Otto and Javan Otto Pertam, where it is shown that any solution of this equation uh, have strong rigidity properties. So they are locally Lipschitz outside a locally finite uh, set of points where the, the solution behave like, behaves like the, a vortex. So what is a vortex? A vortex is something like x perp divided by mod x. Okay, but here we use our additional assumption that we know that we have solution in H1 or in H1 log. And in, so this is an easy computation to do that such a function doesn't belong to H1 or log if you want in 2D. So uh, our regularity uh, property um, allows us to, to get rid of these singularity points and this is the immediate application of the result of this, uh, these authors that sigma, our sigma, under this assumption, is locally Lipschitz. So at this stage, we are very happy because we are back to a locally Lipschitz vector field. And now, if we go back to this um, to this ODE, uh, so we are we are in a standard Cauchy Lipschitz framework. We can solve uniquely this uh, this ODE in short time, and um, actually. If you start from, an, in, from a, an initial data, which is small x, we can even solve it explicitly. So x of t will be x plus t sigma per of x. Okay, so this, these are very well-known results, so which are not due to us at all. 
uh, so thanks to this assumption, we could uh, solve this ODD in a very simple way because solutions are actually um, uh, uh, straight lines. Okay. So these solutions uh, are the characteristic line associated to the not only to the continuity equation, but also to this to this hyperbolic equation to, the, to this hyperbolic system. So I call this characteristic line. So the characteristic line passing passing through the point x. So x plus r sigma prop of x, I call it Lx. And uh, an immediate consequence of the, of the, of the entropy uh, method and kinetic formulation is that sigma is constant along all characteristic lines. So it is Lipschitz, locally Lipschitz, and constant along all characteristic lines, which is very good. So for instance, in the example we, that I presented you before, we had actually a much better uh, Behavior because sigma was constant everywhere. But in particular, one, part, uh, one uh, interesting point is that since sigma is locally Lipschitz and sigma is constant along characteristic lines, two characteristic lines are not allowed to cross inside omega. Okay. Otherwise, uh, you, you will get uh, two different values at a different point at the same point, which which is not possible because sigma is in particular continuous. So if two characteristic line cross, it can be only on the boundary or outside of it. So for the displacement, uh, so nothing was known for the displacement and this is our first contribution. We proved that uh, in a similar, uh, so a similar um, uh, behavior that the displacement is also constant along uh, H1 almost every uh, characteristic line, so which is more precisely expressed in this uh, in this theorem. And the, actually, the, the formal idea of the proof is very simple, and this is what I'm trying to explain you here. Um, so, uh, so the line LX is uh, if you take a point in the line LX, it can always be written like that: x plus s sigma prop of x. Okay, and s is a variable along the line. So you want to prove that this function is constant along the line. So you derive with respect to S. So formally, if you apply the chain rule, you get the gradient of U at this point times scalar product with sigma perp of X, okay? But then you have to recall from the, the previous result that sigma is constant along the characteristic. So I can replace the value of sigma at X by the value of sigma the point x plus s sigma perp of x, because these two points belong to the same characteristic, Lx. But now, next, because of the flow rule, we know that du, which is equal to sigma plus p, can be written in that way. So in particular, du is parallel to sigma. So it is in particular orthogonal to sigma perp. So this scalar product must be zero, okay? So this is, of course, formal because in order to write this, you, you, you need to have some kind of chain rule formula in UD like that, which to my knowledge is not uh, always true. So we really needed to use the structure of our problem. And the idea is, is, uh, is the following to make this, uh, this argument rigorous. So LX is a family of lines, okay, which doesn't intersect each other inside omega which varies in a, some continuous way with respect to x. And the idea is to construct a bilip sheet change, change of variables that I call psi, which maps this family of lines into a parallel family of lines. Okay. So next, you, you look at u in this new uh, variable. So you look at u uh, composition with phi minus one. And so, Using uh, the structure of our problem, so such a, this kind of argument together with slicing properties of the functions, you can you, you can show we show in a similar way that u is independent of the longitudinal variables, which is the variable along the the, the the parallel lines. Then you go back by the inverse change of variable to the original configuration, and it shows that locally u is constant uh, along the line. And then you need to glue the various species by the kind of covering argument to get the global constancy of it. Okay. So uh, this is uh, 
quickly uh, how goes this proof. And, um, and uh, so it gives us exactly what we expected, actually, the constancy of U along this characteristic. Um, so I am a little bit lost about time. So uh, at what, uh, how much time do, do I have? Uh, Five minutes. How, how many? Up to five. Up to five. Okay, so I am very, very late. Okay, so, okay, so I said essentially nothing. So, uh, so the next step, uh, so I will try to go fast, is to understand the, the geometric structure of the plastic zone. So, as I said before, so you have characteristic lines, and this characteristic line can only cross either on the boundary of small omega or outside omega. Okay, uh, they cannot cross inside omega because if they cross inside omega, you will get possibly two different values at a single point, which is in contradiction with the continuity, unless sigma is constant everywhere. So the first case to consider is when two characteristic lines cross on the boundary. So we are precisely in this situation. So when two characteristic lines, so Lx and Ly, Ly crosses at a point on the boundary, we can show that all characteristic lines which come from a, a point in between these two, uh, so in this gray zone, will necessarily pass through the same point. Okay, this is a simple geometric argument. And in particular, it tells you that uh, in such a zone that we call fans, boundary fans, uh, the, the, you can essentially solve the system in, in uh, polar coordinates with origin given by this point. And if you solve the system in, in a polar coordinate, you get almost explicit uh, expression. So sigma will be a, a vortex centered at the point Z bar, okay, with a, um, uh, with a, uh, an orientation alpha, which is either minus one or one, and U, is a, a monotone function of the angle. So this is a, a complicated way to say that, uh, uh, to express the angle. Uh, so, so if you take a point in that set, you, you can just uh, parameterize it by its distance to the bar and the angle like that. So this is exactly for polar coordinates. And one particular, um, uh, one very interesting feature of this, um, of this geometry is that in these zones, uh, so if you assume that um, this part, so you essentially have a slice of pizza if you want, if on this part is this, uh, this um, green part uh, is contained in the boundary of omega, you can prove that on this part, there will be no jump of displacement, so that u will be exactly equal to w on this, uh, on this zone, so that the Dirichlet boundary condition will hold, so there will be no discontinuity jump. And since the displacement must be constant along the characteristic lines, so you will uh, univocally determine your displacement in all these zones, because the dis since the, dis the displacement doesn't jump on the boundary, u is equal to w on the on this zone. So u is known on this zone. And since u is constant along each of these lines, you will know u everywhere in this zone. So it gives us a partial uniqueness result uh, in boundary fans. Okay. Provided, of course, this zone, this, uh, this part of the boundary is contained in the boundary of capital omega, okay. which is uh, the initial set. So I'm going quickly. Uh, so then uh, what happens? Oh, so, so, you, so you have fans and you call, sorry, uh, I am uh, confusing. So you have contably many fans that I call F index bar Z bar. And you take their union, it gives you a set that I call F like that. Okay, so in all of these sets, you can essentially uh, find, uh, recover your, your displacement as long as the boundary of the fan uh, touches the boundary of omega. So the next question is what happens in, in the boundary of the fan? So this set, I call it C, okay, the boundary of the fan. 
So this, this set has a very special structure, and this is actually our main result, so, uh, which is uh, expressed with words here, but that I will uh, maybe present you uh, with a picture. So uh, you take this set, capital C, okay, and you take C, a connected component. Connected component. Of C. So uh, we first prove that all connected components are convex. This is a this is a first step. They are convex, and they are we are in one of these two situations. In there on the left side, here, this set C is um, uh, in between two characteristic lines. So here you have two characteristic lines. Okay, and uh, so by convexity. Uh, the complementary of the boundary is made of the intersection of C with the boundary of, of omega, okay? And one important thing is that all characteristic lines which pass through a point X in that zone will uh, traverse all this, uh, these, two, these, two, uh, these two sets. So I mean, all characteristic lines inside C will pass through uh, both sides, okay? And the other situation is uh, the one on the right. The one on the right is where when C is delimited by only one uh, characteristic line. So for instance, here on the right. So on the left, you have no characteristic line, but it, there is some kind of bar barrier delimited by what we call um, characteristic, characteristic boundary. So DC of C, which are the point of the boundary, which are not traversed by characteristic lines. And on the complementary of, uh, of uh, this characteristic boundary, so this is essentially, formally, this is the boundary. This is where the sigma is, um, is normal to the, to the boundary. And on the complementary of this set, all uh, characteristic lines which come from the interior of C will traverse both sides in the complementary of the characteristic, uh, of the characteristic boundary. So this is formally uh, more, more formally expressed in this uh, in this uh, in this theorem. And uh, another consequence of uh, the constancy of u along the characteristic lines is that uh, so u is constant along characteristic lines. So uh, in particular, if um, for instance this zone here is contained in the boundary of the omega. Then you still have the Dirichlet boundary condition, which is satisfied in the usual way in that set. And since U is, is constant along the characteristic lines, you will, um, uh, so the information of the boundary will go into the interior of C and you will recover the, the value of U in a unique way in the, in the interior of C. Okay. So this tells also. This tells us also something, um, something, uh, something interesting is that in general, it is not possible that both sides, so this gray side and this uh, red side of the boundary, both belong to the boundary of omega. Because if you take, for instance, a boundary value function W, which is for instance, zero here and one here, and in between, you take a C infinity transition between this. You get a contradiction because the function wants, wants to be equal to zero and it wants to be equal to one at the same time, whereas it is constant. So it's not possible. So one of these two, uh, two parts of the boundary um, uh, cannot be contained in the boundary of the moment. Okay. So uh, I think I'm done with time. Uh, so, um, so this is what I wanted to express here in this theorem. So, uh, the constancy along the characteristic zones. So there remain a lot of open questions. Uh, of course, getting rid of the assumption that the interior of the plastic zone is empty, uh, and also uh, the generalization to vectorial models of perfect plasticity. So in two D. In two-dimensional two, in two -dimensional vector case, there is a similar, uh, um, it seems that there is a similar hyperbolic structure. 
uh, that uh, we tried to understand some time ago with um, Benoit Merle and Flavia Nayolano, but uh, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't succeed yet. Uh, but even in the three-dimensional case, there are uh, other type of uh, special hyperbolic, hyperbolic structure that, uh, that can be found, that can be used to, to prove similar results in the same space. Okay, so I stop here. I hope I'm not too late, and I thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so thanks a lot, Jean-François. Uh, maybe this time for one short question. Short question. Okay, so if this, uh, I don't know from home. I, I don't hear you very well, actually. Oh, no. uh, sorry. I have, okay, Miguel has a question. Please, Miguel. Uh, maybe it's not a very interesting question, but uh, so it's related to the beginning of your talk. So that in general, you don't have the um, directly boundary condition which is attained. Yes. You have criteria which depends, for instance, on the geometry of omega. To yes. Ensures that uh, it is attained because I know in the BV case there are some of these kind of results. So your question is: uh, so in general, the boundary condition is not uh, satisfied. Um, uh, but actually, so, the, so in the result I presented you, so I didn't have time, it was too long. Actually, we can prove, so we can prove uh, that, for instance, in the case of a boundary fan, here, the boundary condition is always satisfied, okay? And in the complementary of the fan, so here and here, also the boundary condition are always satisfied. So the only pathological points are these characteristic boundary points. This is something we prove. Okay. But you don't know a priori if I give you omega, you cannot tell me if it's going to be attained or not. In general, no. In general, no. But uh, what, we, so what we prove strongly rests on our assumption. Okay. Uh, without this assumption, uh, I would not swear it is still true. Okay. Because uh, in the, for instance, the prescribed mean curvature problem, I think there are results saying that if uh, the big set omega has a uh, large enough curvature, then uh, the boundary condition is attained or stuff like that. But yes. Nothing like that here. Uh, well, here, I, I, I don't know. Uh, we, we didn't uh, study this type of conditions. Oh, but you. maybe maybe there is a similar statement. Uh, it's possible. I don't know. OK, so is there any further question? Okay, so if this is not the case, let's thank uh, Jean-François again and all the speaker of the morning session. Mm -hmm. Welcome everybody Welcome. to this afternoon session. And the first speaker is Marco Cicalese from Technical University of Munich. He will talk about key value transition in mathematical materials. Um, oh, okay. So thank you very much for the for the presentation and thanks a lot uh, guys for the for the invitation is a is a pleasure to be here back after uh, actually many years in this uh, research center and um, so it's my pleasure to to speak about uh, um, kind of an ongoing uh, uh, research project together with uh, uh, some uh, friends so Francesco Sombrino is now in in Naples Gianluca Orlando is in the Polytechnical University of Bari and my uh, PhD student Marvin Foster, who in uh, in six months will be looking for a job. So if if everybody has suggestions, and um, uh, okay, so this is about chirality transition in magnetic materials. So the plan of the talk is the following. So I will start with uh, um, a very simple one-dimensional model to explain to you, I mean, what is chirality. Then I will go to two-dimensional, but for a reduced model, and then I will go to the two-dimensional still in for kind of a so-called complete model. And so you will see these three parts. Uh, so hopefully the, the first and the second will be due on time. And then for the third, uh, Giovanni will be uh, here uh, pushing me to, to finish. <laughs> okay, now let's go. Um, okay, what is the idea? The idea is that we have a chain of molecules and these molecules, they have magnetic moments, okay? And um, so um, uh, the chain, uh, as a, is, is distributed on a, on a lattice with lattice spacing lambda n, and at the end of the day, the lambda n will go to zero. 
Okay, the, uh, there is an, uh, uh, for, for every point in lambda n, let's say uh, um, uh, for each of these points, to each of these points, I associate uh, uh, an S1 uh, vector. And this S1 vector is telling me what is the magnetic moment of the particle, which is sitting at, uh, 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 at this point. Okay, then I have a, this is the called spin field. Then I have a, a positive parameter that will play a role in a, in a second. And the interaction energy that you see here um, has two terms. So um, these two terms, they, uh, one is, uh, is characterized by this negative sign. So alpha is a positive constant. And the other one uh, is characterized by this positive sign. So the constant is normalized to one. What is the energy doing? So forget for a second about the lambda n, which is just a scaling, but you take the spin in position i and take the scalar product with the spin in position i plus one. So two neighboring spin are interacting via scalar product, okay? Uh, and here, two interacting spins at distance two, they are still interacting with their scalar product. So the point is that the nearest neighboring spins are interacting with the minus sign and the second neighboring spins are interacting with the plus sign. What happens, uh, it is this, the simpler, if you want, uh, simplest model where you can have this so-called phenomenon of frustration. What is frustration? It means that nearest neighbor, if you want to minimize this energy, which is at the end of the day, what we want to do, um, they want to be somehow aligned so that you maximize the, the scalar product, you take the minus sign and you, the energy is happy. And they, instead, the, the second neighbors, they want to be uh, antipodal. And then because of that, of course, uh, uh, you start uh, uh, from one vector, you make happy the, the, the next one. And in order to make happy the next one to the one in the middle, the, the first one is unhappy because it has an antipodal, not an antipodal vector in that position. So this phenomenon here is at the basis of what is called um, um, chirality magnetic uh, uh, system. And I will explain to you where chirality uh, appears in a set. So for the moment, we have frustrated moment model means not all the interaction can be minimized at the same time, okay, locally. Okay, so this interaction parameter alpha, which was in front of the nearest neighboring uh, points, uh, of course, I mean, it, it gives you the, the, the strength of nearest neighbor interaction. So how much you pay when uh, you favor alignment, okay? And it will be a crucial uh, parameter. So if alpha is strong enough, so bigger than a certain threshold that you can compute, four in this case, for this choice of parameters, the ground states of the system, you minimize the energy by taking all the points, I mean, all the vectors aligned. And of course, I mean, the system has a global uh, invariance under rotation, so you're taking any alignment uh, uh, in S1. So this one is somehow is the, 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 the direction of this, uh, or this alignment that you have chosen, you can take any on S1, okay? Uh, but uh, the energy, the way I've chosen here, if, you, if we come back, uh, essentially, this lambda n here is what? So lambda n is the lattice spacing. Uh, how many times particles do I have uh, in an interval of size one? I have actually one over the lattice spacing parameters. When I multiply by lambda n, this means that you have the energy per unit particle. So that the energy stays bounded if you wanted to look at the energy per unit particle. Okay. So now if you give me two uh, um, aligned states, one is the blue one on the left, and the other is the, the red one on the right, what happens is that at uh, essentially negligible cost, you can uh, slowly rotate from uh, one vector in S1 to the other vector in S1 on a some mesoscopic scale and you don't pay anything in energy. This is telling us that there is no phase uh, separation. So what you do usually like that, you try to understand whether or not this can be done at every mesoscopic scale. And then you, if you find a mesoscopic scale where this cannot be done, then you compute the energy for such a transition and you renormalize the energy in order to see the energy of order one, okay? And something like that happens. Uh, there is a, per, uh, but there is a, a specific range of parameters, uh, alpha in this case between zero and four, where you can compute the ground states of the of the of the energy. And now the uh, what happens is that in order to make uh, uh, the nearest and the second neighbors uh, happy, you need to find a kind of a specific angles between nearest neighbors. And this angle is a uh, arc cos of alpha over four. And of course, since you have these uh, these scalar products, you are invariant whether you change the angle. And uh, so you can take the plus sign or the minus sign here, and this uh, angle, uh, uh, the energy does not see the difference, okay? But you describe the, 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 the ground state in this, in this way. So you fix, let's say a plus here, uh, alpha is your fixed parameter, and phi is the angle between two adjacent uh, spins, okay? And then you can see here, I mean, uh, um, now this is uh, our lattice points are here, 
uh, these uh, circles here are our S1 on, that you can imagine they are kind of orthogonal to this uh, chain, chain. And then on this S1, our vector is rotating. And it's rotating with a constant vector uh, between adjacent spins, which means if you imagine that the x-axis is the time, it's rotating with the constant uh, angular velocity, OK? And but then uh, uh, you can choose somehow the, 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 the rotation to be uh, counterclockwise or clockwise, and nothing changes. So. The, the system has also these, uh, uh, these so-called, I mean, uh, degeneracy, uh, which is usually called chirality, okay? So uh, what do you want to do now? You want to find a necessary energy in order to change the chirality when the number of particle uh, increases, and you want to scale this energy in a sense to make it of order one, okay? So you want to, to have a picture which says, okay, on the left of my chain, I am like that, on the right, I'm like that, and in the, middle, in the middle, you're doing something kind of interpolating at an optimal cost in energy. Uh, you will see in a second that this is a problem we know very, very well. But just uh, we are looking for the right variables in order to, to, to describe this problem, okay? <clears throat> in particular, I mean, the, the range of parameter, which is uh, very well known in physics literature, is uh, a so-called... Um, paramagnetic elemagnetic transition uh, uh, point, which is a special value of alpha. And its value of alpha is uh, essentially you are close to four. Four was the value where you had all the spin aligned. But now you are a little bit on the left of four, where you want to add helices, and, uh, but you're converging to four. So this is a special point in the phase diagram of these uh, this materials where something special happens. And uh, so now let's pick up the... Okay, the analysis can be done for every value of alpha. So now, but I'm, I'm focusing on this one in particular, okay? So now let's pick up this alpha that now depends on N because uh, I mean, this uh, kind of deficit, uh, the, 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 if you want the, the, the velocity at which I'm converging to four and defined as delta N, um, delta N is going to zero. I take this alpha N and put it here. Here was the alpha parameter. So I've written again the same energy as before. This time for this choice of parameters, of course, I mean, the optimal angle is arc cos of one minus delta n, okay? Uh, which, uh, which is essentially the square root of two delta n. Okay, so it means that what, what we expect, what is that we are about to be ferromagnetic. So it means aligned. So it means that the optimal angle is very small, okay? And now, uh, now you look at the energy and you say, okay, delta n is going to zero. I know what is the, uh, the limit energy when delta n goes to zero, they, all of them, they want to be aligned. So how much energy do I pay? I pay minus four from here. These are all happy, so they pay one. And I play a plus one from here. They are all happy, I, play, I, I pay plus one. So minus four plus one, I pay three, okay? And if, I, if you perform the, the gamma limit, let's say, as n goes to infinity, and you choose as your variable, this uh, spin field, the spin field is bounded in, in, uh, uh, in L infinity by one. So you do weekly star in L infinity, you take the gamma limit, and what you get is something trivial. You get minus three, okay? So the interval where you're doing that, is just of length one. Good. So this is telling you nothing about the, the magnetization, in particular, nothing about the chirality. Moreover, you're losing the, of course, because of weak convergence, you're losing also the constraint. So this is, of course, not a good description. Mm, but actually, this is not uh, using anything of what we have said about the chirality. So we need to, to change the variable, okay? So in order to change the variable, what I'm doing here now is uh, I, I will look at a correct order parameter in order to describe this phenomenon. And I try to be uh, somehow, only use a little bit of heuristic, okay, to do that. Uh, and, uh, okay, heuristic argument is this one. So you, you remember that your uh, uh, magnetization is equal to one, okay, the length is equal to one. Okay, so what do you wanna do? You know, what is the ground states? These ground states, they, they are these uh, almost aligned states, okay? And what I do now, uh, I know that the, if you want, if you describe the limit only looking at these, uh, uh, minimal energy, you would have a very poor description. So I look at the energy uh, about the ground states. Okay, so what I, what I do, I, sorry, what I do, I, I take the energy and I remove the minimum of the energy. What you would do always for, a, for an expansion. Okay, if you do like that, this is a very nice structure. I mean, you see, I mean, first of all, you see immediately, of course, that this is a bigger or equal than zero. So if you want to minimize locally, you do it in a, in a second, you do it uh, term by term. And that actually you can do that. Now to understand exactly what is here inside, 
let me approximate uh, something which is, I mean, we, will never work really in, in a proof, but uh, let me do that. Let me imagine that these, uh, uh, this one is the approximation of the second derivative of u, okay? And then let me take the Riemann sums and, and, and change them into an integral, okay? So if I do that, what happens is that the energy minus its minimum can be written in this form here. So let's have a look. Okay, so everything is scaling homogeneously. So second derivative square lambda to the four, uh, zero order, oh, what is there? Um, okay, and delta to the zero. Zero order delta to the, to the square, uh, first order, so zero and second, lambda to the square and delta to the one. So everything is homogeneous. So if you rescale, you get the same. So now what you can do. So uh, here, assume for a second that I can integrate by pass without having any boundary condition, uh, boundary term. So this means that what I see here is uh, zero order term, second order term, I get first order term with a square and a minus sign. Okay, so then now I, I read it again second derivative square term of order zero minus first derivative square. Okay, now this is a, a very nasty integral you know, in a sense. If you look at it like that, because for, if you forget for a second what's, uh, that these uh, terms might be actually small, you, you need also, <laughs> so you need to understand how small is one with respect to the other in a sense. But you have a, a negative term in, in front of the first derivative. And remember what we wanna do. We want to somehow take some kind of uh, phase separation. And phase separation for us in calculus separation means that you are controlling some kind of variation. If the variation is related to this uh, chirality and the chirality is the, the velocity, the velocity is, uh, is, uh, is essentially uh, in the U prime that you, you have, you're, you're in trouble, okay? Because here, I mean, uh, in order to prove coherence of this one, I mean, if you have this minus sign, you, you, know, you need to pay attention. And you need to pay attention because of course there is a competition between kind of an interpolation constant between order zero and order two and the constant that you have in front of order one. So indeed, uh, this is a, I mean, if you imagine that all these parameters here are of order one, and here only you put some C as a constant, there is an optimal constant. Actually, it's not, it's not known exactly the optimal constant, but there is a, uh, an optimal uh, kind of, uh, uh, no, not optimal, there is an estimate on this optimal constant. And if, you are, uh, if the constant in front of the first term, uh, the first derivative is small enough, and then uh, you can prove that you are essentially uh, your uh, first derivative uh, uh, would be uh, bounded in BD. Okay. So, but now we are forgetting, in a sense, the fact that the U is of length one. Let's think about that. U is of length one. So, if U is of length one, imagine that we can describe everything in terms of the angular variable. And then, uh, when you do like that, uh, you remember that uh, you imagine that uh, that U is a uh, you write in complex variable as e to the i omega. So the, 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 the first derivative square is omega square. But when you take the second derivative, because you're changing the matrix, of course, you get uh, a plus here. So an omega to the four plus an omega prime to the second. So you see, I mean, in a, in a certain sense, when you change variables, you are correcting the bad sign over, the, over here. So if you describe everything in terms of the angles, what happens is that this functional here, you get, uh, it turns out to be a function of this type here. So, uh, okay, this is, an, this is, a, this is a kind of, uh, of natural in a sense, but it's a specific of the fact that you are controlling in a certain sense, uh, uh, really the, the, the curvature of the manifold where your, uh, your, uh, your uh, functions are, uh, are bounded to live on. So I can use uh, the first derivative square. I mean, I can use the first derivative. I, I, I call it, we, we said this is the, 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 the angular velocity, right? I mean, and actually I use exactly the angular velocity. So omega is the, the derivative of the angle between adjacent, adjacent spins. And, uh, uh, and I just make this change of variable here. And what I get is that the function can be written in terms of this omega variable. Okay, now it looks much better because of the fact that uh, if you look at the scaling here, this is promising. And indeed uh, there is an optimal scaling which is the following. So you write all your energy in terms of what it is called this chirality variable. What is this is omega is the angular velocity. But you remember the angular velocity essentially um, was very, very, very slow because we were about to be constant. This ferromagnetic uh, alignment was just all the vectors constant, so the velocity is zero. But actually, they were not exactly constant. We were moving at a velocity which was uh, square root of two delta n. So let's make it a border one. And when we make it over the one, we can see that actually all the energy uh, 
it, it scales, in, can be made of order one if we scale everything according to lambda n delta n to the three over two. So it, uh, what does it mean? It means that the coefficient that you have in front of this quadratic term is exactly one over the coefficients that you have in front of what we can call now a double well potential. So here I have gradient of chi square and then double well with wells in plus and minus uh, one and minus one of chi to the square. And these two coefficients here, they are one the inverse of the other. So it's a modic amortola function. Okay, nothing special. Well, it's a modic amortola function at a scale, and this scale is lambda n over square root of two delta. So let me, you can, do the, uh, you can do the analysis also if this scale is not going to zero. Let's, uh, the interesting uh, uh, appears when this uh, lambda n over square root of two delta n is going to zero. Let's take that. And then uh, what happens? This functional, of course, is uh, converging to constant times uh, the characteristic, uh, well, the, the, sorry, the, the number of, uh, of uh, uh, jumps of the, this chirality. So let's have a look at what is uh, actually happening. As we said, chirality minus one means that you are rotating, let's say, counterclockwise. Chirality plus one, you're rotating clockwise. And in the middle, somehow your chirality is going from minus one to one, meaning that, uh, that you're, you're kind of, at other one, you're kind of slowing down and coming back. But this is typically what happens when you have the telephone cord, the old one that we, not all of us remember, <laughs> but we remember. <laughs> And, uh, and it was the, the usual problem that, I mean, uh, when you kind of stretch too much, uh, the, it, it creates what is called a perversion. But essentially, uh, it, it has an elical structure, but at a certain point, I mean, uh, uh, you, if you make incompatible boundary condition, what happens is that actually there is a, a jump and then it starts uh, uh, wiggling the other way around. I mean, uh, uh, curling the other way around. Okay. okay, and then, I mean, uh, why we were interested to this problem is because, I mean, we, we read a paper of this physicist, uh, that were claiming there was no, no such a transition. And instead, I mean, we, we came up with this little example that actually, this is a modica mortola function. And, that, uh, and then after all, we, we, we discovered that this transition, they exist. I mean, they are observed quite, uh, uh, I mean, this has been first observed in 2006. This is the first real space observation of this kind of transition for magnetic materials, specifically for these silicates here. So uh, people really looked at the, the, at, the, at the microscope and saw that if you are 40K, so I mean, if there is a little bit of kinetic uh, or temperature, you don't see anything. This is an homogeneous state. But if you decrease the temperature here, you see these bands, okay? And what is these bands? I mean, uh, dark and uh, light bands, they are essentially the change in the chirality. So chirality plus and minus, okay? Now you see a lot of them and uh, and okay, but the point is that this picture is 2D with some features, and uh, you want to understand whether you can uh, repeat your, uh, your problem in two dimensions. Okay, so, okay, so first problem, uh, 2D lattice, uh, which is a square lattice, distance between uh, points in the lattice, lambda n, as before, special kind of interaction. And now I will focus a little bit on that. And then at the end, I will tell you that you can do better than this. Okay, but to understand, special kind of interaction means horizontal or vertical interaction with nearest and second neighbors. So when you look at this, it means that if I take this point, I mean, uh, uh, so it's neighboring, uh, first neighbors are the red and it's, uh, let me call now, I mean, actually I call next to next to next neighbors. <laughs> so these are the nearest neighbors. Then the, you should have next to nearest neighbor in the next to nearest neighbor in the diagonal, and then you should have next to next to next neighbors in the in the horizontal and vertical direction. Okay, according to the length, the distance from this uh, black point. So, but now the energy that I'm taking takes into account only uh, these uh, for for the for the black point here takes into account only these uh, these points that you see. So, if you look at this uh, at this at this one. And you don't think about that uh, too much, as I did when I, when I gave this problem to a bachelor student. <laughs> and uh, I thought, okay, so it was very good. So I thought, okay, so at least you do the limb inf using slicing. And then uh, let's see what happens with the limb soup. And the guy that uh, now is uh, so Marvin Foster and uh, became my PhD student after his observation, he came and said, <laughs> and said you're wrong. <laughs> And uh, no, in the sense that, uh, I mean, uh, the point is that this variable, horizontal and vertical, they are not decoupled, of course. Why? 
Because what is horizontal and vertical now, I'll explain you in a second. So imagine that you want to repeat the analysis that you have done. What do you do? OK, so let's assume that you want, I mean, the energy is exactly the same as before. You have this minus uh, uh, alpha n coefficient. This coefficient is still going to the, this uh, ferromagnetic elimagnetic transition point, meaning that the, angle, the optimal angles are very small and small of order square root of delta n, let's say. And uh, we use this parameter here. And then, uh, so it's exactly the same energy. You see, I mean, now here the scale is, is lambda n to the square just because we are in 2D, nothing special. Okay, now assuming that you want to, to describe this system, what would you do? I mean, you imagine that uh, at each point, uh, somehow you describe what happens in the horizontal direction and in the vertical direction. So you will have, you will have two um, angular velocities, the angular velocity that you see on the horizontal lines and the angular velocity in the vertical lines. And you try to work with that and see what happens. Okay, so let's try. Okay, so, I mean, you try to repeat the same and you now start looking at these uh, incredible interesting pictures. <laughs> And uh, what you can see actually, what is happening here? I mean, you see, I mean, these are pictures in 2D where uh, um, these are the ground states of the system. Let's try to, to look at these ground states. So remember that our uh, kind of chiralities, uh, chiralities that we were looking, they were essentially bounded to be either kind of rotating with velocity one uh, or with velocity minus one. Now, essentially you have a vector which has component one, one or one minus one and so on, four possibilities. Meaning that this vector is what? It's telling you something about how you rotate in the horizontal and in the vertical direction. So now, for instance, if I take this one, it is currently one, one, meaning that if I look at all the horizontal uh, lines, then it means that I'm rotating with constant velocity, let's say equal to one uh, in counterclockwise way. And if I go from bottom to top, I'm doing the same. So one, one, and then you have these four possibilities. So these are the ground states of the system, okay. Okay, up to now, I mean, you say, okay, it's a little bit more complicated. Let's see, maybe, maybe the analysis is exactly the same. And so uh, the heuristic argument. Now, the heuristic argument, we have uh, just uh, uh, the horizontal velocity and the vertical velocity. So you reproduce the, what we did uh, before. And now, I mean, we can uh, kind of jump directly to this uh, uh, functional here. Uh, you, you define this karatis by scaling these uh, velocities as we did. And what you see here is the following. So you see, derivative uh, in the horizontal direction of the chirality horizontal square. And then uh, the fact that the horizontal chirality can be, can take only the, the values, I mean, as a double well potential in plus or minus one, and the same for the vertical chirality, but this time with the vertical derivative. Well, because of course, I mean, the, the interaction, so the control that you have is only on the vertical part. Uh, and that's what happens. But, uh, but you see, I mean, this one is not a modica mortola function. It's not a modica mortola function, of course, because you are missing the, the control on the on the whole gradient, okay? So in particular, I mean, uh, if you look at, at first glance, you try to understand what happens if you have a, a sequence of these vector calorities which are bounded. And what you see is that, okay, I can bound each of these terms. So for sure I have so the Kn are L1 compact to uh, a certain uh, vector K, K, they call KH, KB, and then the sections of this one are BB functions. Okay, so the horizontal one, is a BV function for almost, every, I mean, let's say for every uh, Y in the horizontal direction. And, uh, and conversely, I mean, you have that the vertical one is a BV function for almost every X in the vertical direction. Okay. And then, uh, and then you think, okay, but come on. I mean, uh, so I should be able to improve this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this bound. What is the reason why I cannot, uh, uh, can I prove that actually I'm BV? So, uh, uh, and actually you can do, and this was Marvin's observation, but he, he came back and he said, okay, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there is something with the compactness that I don't understand. And, uh, but actually, I mean, it's made of, of the fact that, uh, so imagine, so you have, take a, a, just a square, uh, a cell of the lattice, and you have small angles. Remember, they are small angles on the point of the cell. And, in, and then you look uh, at the chirality. So let's say the rotation in horizontal in the vertical direction, and then you close the loop. Of course, they are, they, they are uh, related. And they are related because uh, essentially they are a gradient. I mean, they are a discrete version of a gradient so that you can look at what happens at the horizontal chirality in the vertical direction. Uh, I mean, the gradient in the vertical direction and the vertical chirality gradient in the horizontal direction. And, uh, I mean, because of uh, uh, in the continuous variables, you, you are saying that essentially the, the curve has to be zero. Okay, of course. So then what do you do? 
you say, okay, then this suggests to consider the angle phi such that the, the gradient of phi is exactly the chirality. Let's do that. And what you end up with is, uh, is that the compactness condition that we had translates into this fact. So it translates in the fact that you have a gradient, which is in L1 on the wealth, plus the fact that uh, the second derivatives in X and Y direction, they are bounded measures, uh, bounded random measures. That's what we had uh, in the BB compactness on almost every line. And now the question is, uh, uh, is that enough in order to, to get some BB regularity? And uh, if you forget about the fact that you are on these four wells, of course it's not. It's not because this is the uh, Ornstein non inequality, which is telling you that uh, in L1, there is no way to control the mixed derivative in terms of the, of the uh, pure derivatives. Okay? But actually, uh, what about if we consider the constraint? Actually, I mean, it's still open. I mean, this kind of problem, uh, I don't know about that, whether you can, uh, if you have this constraint, whether really you can uh, get out of this, uh, of this uh, no inequality, this I don't know. But of course, you can prove that you are BB for the, for the following reason, because you can use the, uh, the energy bound again. So now do you do that? Well, I write again the energy in terms now of the phi variable, so the angle, and what I get, is that if now we have a control on the energy of the chirality, this implies, you can see here, an L2 control on the Laplacian of pi n. Okay, so I can use elliptic regularity, elliptic estimates, and I get a full control on the Hessian, of course, locally. And now, uh, so it means that essentially what I control is uh, now a modicum ortola functional, at least locally, because I, I can control the, Lapla I mean, the, the, the gradient of chi n squared and then I control what uh, exactly these, uh, these two, uh, the potential made out of this, the sum of these two potentials, which is essentially as, a, as a zero sets, I mean, exactly our, uh, our four possible choices. Okay, so now I know that I have L1 compactness of Cayenne in BB lock. Okay, but then now remember that actually I have only four possibilities, so nothing bad can happen uh, up to, uh, to the boundary. So essentially I control it everything in BB. So, and actually this is the point. I mean, the gamma, domain of the gamma limit are all the chiralities, which are BV valued in these four wells. And uh, so they are vectors. That's why they are uh, essentially, they are car-free uh, car uh, variables. And then of course, you know that when you have a car-free variable, of course, this induces uh, a, a rigidity on the possible jumps. So that you want essentially that, uh, that the jump is all, always in the direction of the norm. Okay, so the only possible jumps that you can have are this one here. Okay, and then uh, this means that if you look at the profile, a microscopic level, the profile should be something like that. So, I mean, here you are uh, kind of rotating in, uh, for a certain choice of, uh, of the vector chi, you are rotating for another choice of vector chi, and the transition happens along this, uh, this line. Okay, this is just a picture, but then this is true. So, the magnetic materials. They are really, I mean, this is true in the sense that I, I cannot give you exactly the angle here, but it is true that when they form domains, so I mean, if you look at a typical state with finite energy in the sense that we have seen, what happens is that in, in, in controlled experiments, what happens is that there is a, a kind of, uh, well, there is a, a minimal angle that you form when you are helical in one direction and helical in another direction, in the sense that we have said. So you see that this one can be, actually they can be also computed. And now, of course, I mean, which is this angle? Which are the rigidity? Well, this depends on the lattice structure. If I change the lattice structure, I change, of course, also this condition, okay? Um, okay, so now question, how complicated can be the, the jump set? I mean, so there is an interesting question here because I mean, if you, if you take gradients that are constrained to two wells, then we know that they need to be laminates. Um, and so this is the Ball and James result uh, 87. But if you take gradients constrained to three wells, then you can say that they have polyhedral structure with finitely many segments. This is a nice result by Moser. And the gradient constrained to four wells, they are more complicated. So for instance, I mean, you can have accumulations like here. So actually, I mean, uh, the, the optimal, I mean, the, the, the regularity of the jump set, I mean, uh, it's not clear. It's an interesting, I think, uh, uh, question. What is the theorem that we can prove? 
So the theorem we proved with Gianluca Orlandi, uh, Orlando and Marvin Forster uh, is the following. So with respect to L1 convergence, I mean, let's say that chi, uh, let me write down the, the gamma convergence only when the function is finite. I mean, you can prove actually that, uh, that in an anisotropic way, you can measure exactly the, the jump between two domains uh, that are essentially uh, um, related to two uh, chiralities, which are BV uh, and take one of the four possibilities we have seen. And the jump that you pay, essentially, you can see this jump is very simple because uh, the energy of the jump is very simple because this energy of the jump, you can do it in uh, using slicing, okay? So indeed, the limit, you can do it by slicing. It's true. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's enough to look at what happens on the slices, but the lean soup is much more, more delicate. And it uses, uh, I'm sorry, and it uses, uh, uh, for those of you who know about, uh, about the Aviles Giga functional, so they use the construction by optimizing uh, the, the kind of convolution by Polyakovsky and, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, a discretization result for the Modica Mortola functional done by Andrea Brides and Aaron Ip. Okay, they, they combine these two things. And actually, I mean, this gamelin soup is kind of more delicate than what we were thinking because we were imagining that one could have done the, the, the gamelin soup using some density result. And indeed, it's, uh, you can do an explicit construction of, of the recovery sequence uh, when you have function with polyhedral jump. This is very simple. Well, very simple. It's technical, but it's the usual thing that you would do. But uh, the, this problem is open. So uh, you give me a, a BV carefully uh, vector field with values in these four wells. And then what I want to find is a, is a sequence of uh, BV functions still inside this uh, Z. For which I, I can tell you that uh, they are car free, the jump is polyhedral, and the, the perimeter is converging to the perimeter. So this seems a little bit very, very much in the direction of contracting so the density of polyhedral currents, but it's not because of the constraint. And if you try to mimic a little bit the, the, the proof of the density result, it doesn't work exactly because of this. Okay, so that's why we had to do uh, the Polyakovsky argument. Okay, so the last part of the of the talk is the complete model that we just finished. So now the complete model is the following. So for the complete model, same as before, but now the, you have also these blue points here, okay? And now these blue points, they are uh, uh, still, uh, they, are, uh, they have a positive sign, so they are anti paramagnetic Okay, this is the, the model. The model is called J1, J2, and J3. And uh, people from statistical mechanics, they, they think that, well, they use these models as good enough in order to reproduce most of the magnetic properties of materials uh, when you think that these magnetic properties do not depend on long range interactions. So that should be captured by uh, local interactions. Because otherwise, of course, as you can know from micromagnetics, something completely different happens. But this is very interesting, as you will see in a second, because something very close to micromagnetics actually happens for, for this functional here. And it's the following. So take also this beta n, so activate this beta n. And now this beta n, uh, so this is a phase diagram that has been kind of reproduced by physicists uh, in the, at the end of the 70s uh, for a bunch of silicates. Uh, what we have uh, seen so far was the case where beta was zero, uh, our alpha was going to zero, uh, sorry, to four, meaning that we were passing from this uh, kind of helical structure to these uh, uh, ferromagnetic structures. Now, if you look at the, if you activate the beta, now uh, what happens is that uh, the, Elimagnetic ferromagnetic transition is uh, this line here. Okay. So now what happens is the following is that uh, actually everything that happens on this line can be obtained in an energetic point of view from an energetic point of view by essentially convex combination of what happens at this point and at this point. Okay. So now I show you what happens at this point. The rest you imagine that it's exactly by convex combination, a little bit of, uh, of uh, details. But uh, the important feature is now. Here, I mean, so I take uh, the alpha n and the beta n such that they are converging at uh, this point coming from inside of this region. Okay, good. So these are the points. And now these are the ground states. You can classify the ground states. What are the ground states? So now let's have a look. So the horizontal and the vertical velocities, they are no more constant. So, and they are no more the same. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 
Okay, so the slope of this line. Um, okay, so I should tell you what happens. No, no, I mean, I, I should tell you what happens uh, uh, at this, uh, to this case here. I mean, you can have an idea what happens when beta is large enough. Uh, for instance, in this case, I mean, beta large enough, it means that you want to be um, antipodal at second neighbors. I mean, these, uh, sorry. Uh, oops. In this and this direction. And now, I mean, this one is forcing you to have uh, a non-trivial velocity also in mixed directions. I mean, if you look at from the point of view of the function, you have an additional control of the mixed derivatives that should be, in a sense, minimized. They enter into the into into play in a way that uh, uh, when you when you go up to this threshold, uh, the ground states they become essentially uh, essentially of this type. So now it's a little bit uh, not. So, for instance, when you if you want when when alpha is very very small. Alpha small means that uh, essentially you, you're not constructing uh, any ferromagnetic result. And beta is up, uh, is above uh, zero. What happens is that indeed you are oscillating the most. Now the thing is quite continuous. So if you move with alpha, what happens is that you start activating uh, possible rotations. And then when alpha is big enough, I mean, sorry, enough, when alpha is big enough, this rotation, I mean, they, they need to be, for beta large enough, they need to be very, very fast. Then you decrease beta and then it to be deactivated at all. So it's ferromagnetic again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So this is eight. So now everything, oh, everything is explicit. Everything is explicit. I mean, the, the, the computation of the ground states. Uh, okay, so. Is, uh, is not difficult. Okay, but now, uh, so what happens is that the may, maybe the, the main feature that happens here is the fact that now in horizontal and vertical direction, the velocity, they do not need to be the same, okay? So for instance, I mean, let's have a look at this picture here. The chi is this vector here, meaning it's the vector one zero, meaning that, I mean, in the horizontal direction, you are rotating with velocity one, in the vertical direction, you're not rotating at all. So in a sense, this time Kai is telling you which is the direction where you're rotating most, in a sense, it's pointing in that direction. And the fact is that, I mean, these ground states now, they, they are telling you that only with this three interaction, essentially you have another invariance, which is much stronger. You, you passed from having four points to S1. And why S1 is interesting is because S1 essentially is the correct uh, uh, invariance that you should have in micromagnetics. And that's, it also explains why they are using the G1, G2, G3 models. Okay, let's try to do it energetically. So now, uh, beta n equal to two, and you do the heuristic exactly as before, okay? And, uh, and then uh, we, we repeat everything. What happens? It happens that here, you have the kind of modica mortal type function, but here you have the divergence of chi squared, and then you have the, this S1 potential, okay, that you are penalizing. Good, and then you, 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 as before, you know that essentially you are, con you are car free. So you imagine that your chi is a gradient. And then what happens is that here you have epsilon Laplacian square plus a uh, potential uh, of the gradient in S1. Okay, zeros of the, the potential are in S1 quadratic. Um, this is not the Aviles giga, but it's very close to the Aviles giga. And actually the difference between the, this, this functional here and the Aviles giga is in the elliptic estimates that we, we did already. So now, if you look at this uh, functional here, this is a functional which involves the gradient of phi and uh, penalizes the gradient of phi by not having length one by a second order derivative, okay? This is the Aviles giga function. Actually, this is a discretization, if you want, of the Aviles giga function if I don't use the heuristic. So you can imagine that in a certain sense, our system behaves like a kind of discretization of Aviles giga function. And Aviles giga function, I mean, is very, very well known. I think the Benoit will, will speak more in that direction, so I'm not telling much. But let me only tell you that there is a gap in difficulty between looking at Modica Morton and the Aviles Giga. As exactly as uh, there is a gap in, uh, in difficulty between looking at, uh, at the Aviles Giga functional and the same functional where the gradient phi is not a gradient. So you have a variable that you know it's ginsburg Landau function. So the Aviles Giga function, just to, to, to tell you, I mean, the, the problem of the gamma convergence of Aviles Giga is still open. 
Um, and then there, there is a, a lot of interesting things that are also coming out uh, nowadays, and in particular, the connection with the, of the Aviles Giga functional. I mean, connection, I mean, the Aviles Giga functional was uh, kind of, uh, if you want, uh, uh, introduced. Uh, in, I mean, in particular, if you want, uh, first by Joy Ortiz, then uh, Jean and Cohn, and then Aviles Giga as a, a possibility of selecting the special solution of the iconal equation. I mean, if you want, when epsilon is going to zero, you want a gradient of phi, which is almost very, very, very one. And among all the possible solutions, this one, you're penalizing those that, that are coming from this uh, uh, energy to be bounded. Usually you complete this one by saying you are in an open set, you have some kind of uh, boundary condition, like you're controlling the normal derivative of, uh, of phi. And then you try to understand whether or not you're really doing that, whether you're, uh, you're really selecting one solution. And in particular, whether this solution is the solution that you would get maybe by viscosity. And this is actually uh, something about that is, is actually known. So lately, Elio Marconi proved actually that if you are in the ball, uh, then this is true. And it's the first uh, uh, result uh, in this direction. Um, but in general, what do you know about compactness and, uh, and the limit of the Avilas Giga? Uh, well, you know that, uh, well, maybe I should tell you the negative part of the story. Well, what you don't know uh, about the Avilas Giga is how to really do the gamma in soup in the, what it's called the conjecture as the domain of the gamma of the Avilas Giga. What you can do is that if you assume from the very beginning that the gradient is a BV vector field, then uh, the Lely second essentially proved how you can uh, do the, the, the gamma convergence result. Okay, so what happens in our case? In our case, the theorem is the following. So you can do the gamma convergence with respect to L1 lock. Uh, and now I'm assuming for, for a moment, the chi is a BV vector field, um, car free. So I'm, I'm putting myself in the, in the simple condition. I'm not giving you anything more on the continuum of giga. And I try to convince you that like that is already difficult. So, uh, and for the, uh, in this case, what I'm proving essentially is that the gamma limit as the, the the lambda n parameter goes to zero is exactly this one, which is the one that you get from the Villas Giga. So you get one sixth the integral over the jump set of this function uh, chi of the, 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 the distance between the traces to the cube. Okay, so compactness and gamma limit are delicate and they use entropy middles, exactly as it is for the usual gamma uh, Villas Giga. And, uh, but now, they, they do not work exactly as in the Gavilas Giga. And I, I, tell, I, I tell you in, in one second why. And for the Lim Soup, we are, uh, we are not able to do that in the full range that we had. We, had, we need an additional non-trivial condition. And then in that case, we can combine, again, modification, uh, optimization modification by Polyakovsky, as I told you in the other, in the other case, and the discretization of the Giga function that this time we had to do by hands. And uh, by the way, if you take the Avilas Giga function and just discretize, uh, you don't need this condition to prove actually that you converge exactly to the limit of the Avilas Giga in the continuum. So it means that our problem has other difficulties. Okay, what are the difficulties? So the true functional here is of this type here. I mean, now, okay, I did all the heuristic, but the true functional actually is something different. So you see, do you have a, a, a gradient term squared and then you have the, the potential. But you see, I mean, the, this, this operator here depends on the lattice. So it depends on the small scale. And also the, 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 the wells here, they depend on the small scale. And this is a, a, a source of many difficulties in particular. So the, the differential operator is nonlinear. And in particular, this is, the di you can write it as a, a divergence, kind of discrete divergence of a nonlinear perturbation of the identity. So you have, you have a kind of a so internal source of nonlinearities that you need to cope uh, with. And the, in particular, if you look at the wells of your potential, they are not S1, they are converging to S1 with a specific velocity, which is also I mean, a source of errors and essentially is kind of uh, giving us this problem. Uh, and then most important, I mean, uh, we have a nonlinear car-free condition. <laughs> So in the sense that the divergence of a certain nonlinear function of chi is not zero, but is converging to zero. So it means that all the entropy middles, they need to be done along sequences. So in a sense, we, we need to extend all the compactness and the, the Liminf uh, 
kind uh, of technique for the Abilis Giga along sequences of, uh, of, uh, of uh, fields with a kind of small divergence with a specific rate in the, in the, in the, in the vanishing of the divergence. Okay, um, maybe something here, I can tell you more for those uh, that uh, I know uh, work with in the Gitzbull Landau. I mean, one of the points that I said at the very beginning is the fact that you can recognize that this, uh, this sky variable is actually a gradient. I mean, this, uh, from the point of view of, of, of our discrete functional, this is not true at all. Because I mean, you control the energy globally, you don't control the energy locally, which means that you can create vortices locally. The point is that uh, somehow, with, in particular with this uh, condition here, you can prove that the amount of, uh, of cells where something bad happens, in particular that, uh, that you are creating vortices, at the end, you can, uh, they are negligible in terms of the energy they can concentrate on. So this is an additional difficulty. In a sense, I mean, the discrete uh, is adding this uh, point-wise non-local control on what can happen, what can badly happen on, on singular cell. That by the way, since the problem is uh, kind of as a certain non-locality because of the fact that, I mean, uh, neighboring points are seeing each other always. I mean, uh, then it means that you, you need kind of a very uh, cumbersome estimate in order to really uh, rule out that, uh, that this concentration phenomenon appears. Okay, and I think that I, I stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, other questions? Okay, other questions from the people online? Ah, sorry. Okay. The problem is that the domain of the gamma limit is bigger than this PV, mm -hmm. but maybe for minimizers, you expect that the minimizers yeah. are in PV. Yes. I think that uh, in particular, this is uh, the hope that maybe also in this discrete setting, it might be even easier to, to prove that. But we are not, uh, not yet there, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's possible. Uh, Okay, questions here in the room? Seems not. Questions from people online? I can't check. Okay, I do have. Ah, please. So, can you go back? Oh. So, the. Uh -huh. Which is not exactly the usual. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, the usual potential. In a sense, it depends on the point. Depends on, on the point uh, and depends on the on the function. What is the zero set of this? Okay, it's uh, something which is, is still a closed curve. You can uh, you can characterize that is still a closed one. It's not S one. Is uh, as the topology of the ball. And uh, uh, you can see that uniformly with respect to the point, it can change. But uniformly with respect to the point, you can put a ball inside and a ball outside uh, in a certain sense. But is it flat somehow? Like more like a polyhedra? Yeah, yes, yes. That changed something. Yes, it in is. a real estate problem, I think. And that's what the question I wanted to ask. Whether the fact that it's not exactly round makes things better or worse. Ah, I have absolutely no idea, but. I vaguely remember that somehow flat part makes the problem slightly different. Uh, I should ask the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I think definitely you should ask some, uh, somebody else. But, uh, but yes, I can tell you that it, it, it has, it's more flat than, than the ball, this for sure. Yeah. But I'm not okay. sure whether this flat part it comes from the fact that essentially there is some lattice structure that is making that a little bit. Uh, Does that help? Or? I mean, <laughs> well. Difficult to say. I mean, it is a source of other difficulties if you try to mimic what has been done in the continuum. Whether you can really play with that to come up with some other uh, uh, nice uh, entropies. So, I mean, we need to, you know, I mean, uh, so we need to, to use the, the, the work by Camillo and Otto and Felix Otto. And uh, somehow our uh, Liminf uh, is kind of uh, you. You, you take the total variation of the supremum in sense of measures of the energy, the entropy productions as in, uh, in, in Otto de Lens. 
Now, these, uh, these entropies, they, they need to be tailored uh, because in a certain sense, I mean, uh, because of the fact that, uh, so you do not have that on smooth maps, uh, they are immediately zero if the divergence is zero. So they are not really some kind of uh, uh, null Lagrangians. They are null Lagrangians only when the parameter goes to zero. But this is the main difficulty if I, in a nutshell. So whether this is uh, helping or not, I, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, if you, let's see. Uh, so, I mean, in particular, one maybe we should take uh, already the continuum problem and try to understand whether we uh, can, can come up with some other idea in the choice of the, of the entropies when you have some flat path or, I don't know. For the moment, I have not tell you. Okay. So, sorry. For... Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, and then let's thank you again. Uh, then now we move to the next speaker. This should be an online talk. So then, uh, I would say with uh, no further ado, let's go to the next uh, to the next talk. So the speaker is Yekaterina uh, Mukhaeva from uh, the University of Helsinki, if I'm not wrong. And she will talk about uh, the sharp isocapacitor iso inequality in, in the case of uh, P capacity. So please. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for the invitation. Unfortunately, I can't be in Pisa because I'm in Leveco in another conference right now. Um, so, um, let me tell you a bit uh, what I'm going to talk about. So I'll first tell you what is the capacitor inequality and uh, what uh, we want to prove. Then I'll tell you a bit about the history and uh, the strategy of the proof. And then we'll go a bit uh, more in detail to the proof. Uh, so like maybe probably many of you know like the selection principle. So we start with the uh, Pugleda computation and uh, then we turn to this, uh, uh, like we consider that the smaller symmetry and uh, we do some pre-boundary regularity, we use pre-boundary regularity and we get the result for a bounded set and then uh, we reduce to the bounded set. Um, so we start with the definition of the capacity. Um, and uh, it's, uh, this is infimum of uh, gradient u to the power p um, for the functions that are one on uh, our set omega. And uh, p for me will be between one and n. Um, if uh, p is n, you can define it uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, I think like the results I have should be true for that case too, but uh, I didn't do the computation. Uh, and uh, then the synthesis, uh, we know that uh, it's achieved uh, by unique function, the omega that satisfies uh, this equation. So the P Laplacian of uh, U omega is zero uh, outside uh, of our set omega. Then uh, on the boundary, U is one. And uh, uh, also the C omega goes to zero at infinity. So, then we can get uh, that uh, if we fix the volume, then uh, the capacity, the peak capacity is minimized uh, by the ball. Uh, let's, uh, like I'm sure many of you know this, but let's just look at the proof. Um, so um, you do Schwarz neutralization uh, for the capacity potential and you get a regular symmetric function, uh, which is actually measurable. Uh, with the original function. And then uh, when you use the uh, polar figure principle, you get very easily that the capacity of the ball is uh, uh, no more this uh, the gradient of the new function to the power p, uh, which is smaller by the inequality than the uh, gradient uh, of uh, the original function to the power p, which is the capacity of omega. And uh, you see from here also that the inequality is rigid, uh, that uh, 
equality is attained only when uh, you your set is a ball centered somewhere, uh, which leads you to this kind of question. So let, let us fix uh, now uh, the volume of the set omega. And uh, what you could ask is, uh, okay, if you consider the difference of the capacity capacity of the set omega and the p-capacity of uh, the ball, um, is it, uh, can we say uh, that it's bounded from zero somehow because uh, we know this qualitatively, but uh, can we find some quantitative kind of inequality, say that uh, it's uh, bigger than like, some function of distance? And I will also tell you what is the distance for me. Um, but this question seems reasonable, right? And uh, then uh, we also want uh, this uh, function omega, we want it to be sharp. So we want uh, to have a sequence omega epsilon such that uh, the peak capacity of omega epsilon uh, converges to the peak capacity of uh, the ball. And the difference of uh, peak capacities of omega epsilon and uh, the ball v1, it, it uh, decays like, like this, uh, like uh, omega of distance. And uh, yeah, so maybe a bit of history. Of course, it's not all the works uh, done in, in this like for stability, but um, probably the first one uh, was uh, in the 20s by Bonasan uh, for the perimeter, because for the perimeter, you also have uh, that uh, the ball minimizes uh, the perimeter if we fix the volume. So you can ask the same question. and. Uh, so the first quantitative uh, inequality was done for convex sets uh, in R2. Um, and uh, then it's kind of like a modification of uh, the proof that you have for the parametric inequality. Um, then uh, for this uh, capacity, uh, and the capacity inequality, uh, the first result is uh, due to Hall, Heyman, and Weizmann in 91. And uh, they dealt uh, with planar sets and also with convex sets uh, in RN. Um, and uh, like the way they do it uh, is um, like centralization approach. So when you look at this proof uh, here, the, you know, when you use the always your principle, it's based on uh, as a parametric inequality. Uh, but uh, if you use a quantitative isoparametric inequality, then you can plug it in there and uh, get something. Um, unfortunately, that is not uh, sharp. Okay, then for isoparametric inequality, the sharp result was uh, given by Fusco, and Patel in 2008. And that was also synthesization techniques, but uh, much more involved. Uh, you, you can just uh, look at the proof and uh, modify it in one place and get something. Um, and then uh, the what's very important for us uh, now is this uh, work of Chicales and Leonardi in 2012, where they also prove the quantitative as a parametric inequality, uh, and they prove the sharp inequality, but they use a different approach, this uh, selection principle, um, which uh, proves very useful for, for this uh, kind of uh, uh, like as a capacitor inequality and uh, the sort. And um, yes, uh, also for the paper that, uh, that we'll use is this one by Fusco, Maggio, and Patel in 2009, where they prove consistent fabric run, trigger, and there's a capacitor inequality. But it's again uh, not sharp, but uh, we will need it for our results. Um, and uh, then uh, this one by Fusco and Zeng in 2016, uh, where they proved the quantity of uh, P Faber Kran inequality, the sharp version. And uh, the Faber Kran inequality is very similar to uh, like as a capacitor inequality. If you look at the equation you get, it's uh, um, the computations uh, that look very much alike, and uh, the like function is very much alike. Um, so as I said, that like one approach you can do is the synthesization, 
Like uh, then there is also this mass transportation approach, uh, which uh, like I'm not going to talk about today. And uh, then there are the second variation techniques that is used uh, by Chikales and Leonardi, and that also we are going to be using today. Mm. So let me now uh, explain uh, what is uh, like the main result. I'm guessing first uh, we have this distance there in the question we ask. Um, and uh, the somehow the right distance uh, is the Frankel asymmetry. Um, it just tells you um, how far you are from the ball in L1 norm, let's say. So you look at all the balls centered uh, at every point uh, in Rn, and uh, you look at the symmetric difference uh, with that ball. And, uh, you minimize it and you get your symmetry. And uh, then the result uh, by Fusco, Maggio, and Patelli in 2009 tells you that uh, the peak capacity of, like if you look at the difference of peak capacity of omega and peak capacity of uh, D1, if the volume of omega is D1, the volume of D1, then uh, you're bounded uh, by, by this. Uh, so you have uh, your Frankel asymmetry to the power of 2 plus T. Um, and it's already very good, but it's not uh, sharp. And uh, what you expect uh, to be here is two. And uh, I'll explain like in a moment uh, why you expect uh, two there. So that's what we want to prove. Um, so first, uh, like in a paper with uh, Guido de Filippis and Michele Marini in 2019, we prove that uh, for just the classical two capacity, we prove that the difference uh, is bounded by um, asymmetry to the power of two. And uh, then uh, the paper of last year, I prove that uh, also the peak capacity it holds. And uh, if you test uh, on uh, ellipsoids uh, converging to the ball, uh, for ellipsoids, you can just uh, write uh, less the, the, cap the capacity uh, and uh, you can write what is the asymmetry and you just from direct computations uh, you see that uh, the inequalities uh, become equalities. Uh, and I also wanted to remark that uh, actually this year Cinzia, um, Nibene uh, and Rossini uh, they got the similar result for quantitative uh, as a capacity and quality for fractional capacity. But uh, that one, uh, you know, it's very non local and uh, it's a completely different story from peak capacity. And that result is not sharp and uh, it's not clear yet uh, how to get the sharp result. Um, so let me pass to the strategy of the proof. So as I said already, we're going to be using selection principle, Machicales and Leonardi. And uh, uh, so it goes as follows. First, uh, like you argue by contradiction. So you get yourself a sequence uh, omega h, such that the difference of the capacity of omega h and the capacity of uh, the sub d1 is uh, smaller um, than any constant. If you fix a constant first, uh, smaller than that constant. Uh, and uh, by the distance squared. So it should be asymmetry here. Um, and at the same time, uh, this uh, sequence, it converges uh, like uh, to B1. And uh, here, when you, like at the beginning, you just know that it converges uh, to B1 in some like very weak topology, because you know that the capacities converge and uh, then you get that uh, it converges uh, in L1. You can easily get to L infinity, but uh, like that's it. And uh, then what you want uh, is you want to improve the convergence. And uh, to do that, uh, you need to perturb the sequence a bit. Um, and it turns out uh, that if you consider um, like a minimizer of a certain functional, then you'll get a new sequence, which is uh, also contradicting, and at uh, the same time, it converges in a strong way uh, to the ball B1. And uh, 
then because of that, uh, uh, you know, that it converges to be one strongly, uh, that means that it's, uh, the boundary is flat. Um, and uh, when you know flatness on the boundary, then you can use the results as a type of uh, Carlton Caffarelli. Um, of course, here for P, uh, for P Laplacian. And uh, then you get uh, that your sequence is very smooth. And uh, so it only remains uh, to prove your inequality for smooth set, uh, what is called the Pugledis computation. And the idea is that uh, you write a sort of Taylor expansion and uh, you bound the remainder and you do spectral analysis at the bulb. And uh, then you got your result uh, for smooth set near the bulb. Okay. Um, so like uh, a bit more mm, precisely what you do, like how, how do you improve the conversion in, in general, not only for the capacitor. So you want uh, mm, you want your sequence to be minimizers of uh, some good functional, because if they're minimizers, you can hope that uh, they're regular, you know, more regular than just any um, sequence of that. So what you do is uh, you minimize the peak capacity among the sets uh, that are the same distance uh, away from the ball. Like in our case, it's uh, Frank elasimetry uh, should be the same. And uh, then if you consider this omega H tilde, uh, you raise a simple chain of inequalities. So the difference of the p capacitors is of course smaller than difference of the capacity of the original set and, uh, and B1 because uh, you minimize the p capacity and uh, you know, of the original omega H is a competitor here in this minimizing problem. And uh, then for this, uh, you know that uh, it, uh, it contradicts the uh, inequality. And so you get uh, that uh, your new sequence also contradicts the inequality. Of course, like it's not so easy because uh, if you write it just like that, um, this uh, minimizing problem, it's not regular enough. So like you can't uh, uh, get the result from it. So you need to perturb a bit. So it's, uh, uh, you'll see later what you need to do. But the idea is this, that you really need to consider sets which are more or less the same distance away from the wall uh, and minimize the peak capacity. Mm. And then uh, for the computation of the ball, um, you, first of all, what does it mean that uh, the set is close to the ball? Well, uh, we will consider this nearest spherical sets. And uh, so this nearest spherical sets of class uh, C2 theta, uh, parameterized by phi, they are the sets uh, whose boundary is, uh, hmm, parameterized or uh, D1 uh, like this. So the boundary can be written as uh, one plus uh, phi uh, of X and X. And uh, you, you see the picture, so it's, uh, it's a set like this. And uh, once you have a set like this, what you want to write down is, uh, you want to write that the peak capacity of your set omega is the peak capacity of the ball B1, then like some first order term that uh, will vanish because the ball minimizes uh, the peak capacity. And uh, then you have a second uh, order term and the remainder. So for second order term, you want to compute this, uh, the second derivative so that uh, you can uh, perform spectral analysis. And uh, for the remainder, you want to bound it somehow. And uh, I didn't write here what are the norms. Because actually there will be different norms uh, um, here, and you'll see which which ones uh, are working. Okay, so now we pass uh, to like, a more detailed proof. So we have the nearest spherical sets, and uh, what we want to prove for them is the following theorem. So we get the uh, um, this 
six is uh, delta, some small number. And uh, we say that uh, if our set uh, is nearly spherical of a class C to theta and it's parameterized uh, by a function whose C to theta um, norm is uh, very small, so less than this delta. Uh, and uh, also it's uh, very center is at zero. We need that because uh, uh, the capacity translation invariant. Mm. Then we have the, the difference of uh, the capacities of uh, omega and b1. Uh, the difference is uh, at least the constant uh, multiplied by the h uh, one half uh, norm of i squared. Uh, so, and uh, the equality we get uh, is this: so the p capacity. Like it's that Taylor expansion from the previous slide, uh, but uh, with norms now. So here you have like H one half norm, uh, and uh, here for this uh, remainder term, you uh, have that uh, if uh, you need the C to theta norm uh, of phi to be small, and then the remainder term is very small. That's why we ask uh, here this. So. Uh, how to like so? Okay, we want to write it down, and we want it to be a Taylor extension. So we need to understand how to differentiate, uh, right? So a quick uh, remark on shape derivatives. So what we do, we have our nearest spherical set, and uh, we want uh, to have a family of sets uh, that uh, such that we go from the ball B one uh, to our set omega. Uh, for that, uh, we get this vector field uh, X, and uh, we take uh, it so that uh, its flow uh, is such that uh, on the boundary, like uh, for the at the beginning, uh, it's uh, just our ball we want, and uh, then uh, at time one, uh, we have our set omega. And uh, this uh, like uh, this uh, flow, um, okay, it's uh, identical to the beginning, but also it stays uh, C to theta close. And uh, you, for this, you can write uh, explicitly actually what this uh, vector field is, because the way you can um, get this family, you can just uh, uh, take. Uh, like a normal vector field. So you can just uh, take your ball and then uh, start pushing it normally to your set because uh, our set is parameterized uh, on the ball in a good way. So then when you get the flow, you just define your family as uh, like phi t uh, of uh, B1. And uh, then what you do is you just differentiate in T. Uh, the p capacity of omega t, and uh, okay, it's like well established theory, and uh, always very well you can differentiate, uh, um, and uh, also like you can differentiate the capacitor potential uh, when it's elliptic. Uh, but uh, the problem for us uh, is that um, the equation you get for p capacity, like for p capacitor potential, is degenerate, so you need to change a bit. Mm. Your functional so that you can differentiate. So uh, for that, we follow a paper of uh, Puskan Zeng for the Fabricron, and uh, we define this new capacity. So this uh, capacity is uh, kappa, is uh, we minimize like nearly the same functional, but we add this uh, kappa squared here. And, uh, so we have kappa squared plus uh, gradient squared as the row p divided by two. And we need to um, take away uh, this kappa to the power p so that just it's not uh, infinity or infinite um, because uh, we're in unbounded, uh, the support of u is unbounded. Um, okay, so now with this, you can see that. Uh, um, the equation you get uh, is um, elliptic. 
because indeed, if you just write the Euler Lagrange equation, uh, it's uh, you get this divergence, and here you have this uh, couple squares. Um, so uh, if kappa is bigger than zero, then everything is elliptic, and then you can take all the derivatives. Uh, of course, then you need to show that uh, when you send kappa to zero, everything converges how, how it should. But um, that's uh, what you do. So now uh, for nearest spherical sets, what we do, we define uh, this function, this uh, new perturbed capacity, the capacity of omega t. You compute the first two derivatives and see. Mm. And then you show that uh, C kappa converges to C0 in, uh, in C2. And uh, um, then you write Taylor expansion for C kappa at zero. Uh, and you send kappa to zero. And what you get is that the p capacity of your set omega is bounded by the p capacity of B1 plus this uh, second order term. And uh, also you have uh, this thing, uh, the remainder, which uh, you bound, uh, as I said, uh, like this. And the only thing uh, left is then that you show that uh, the, this uh, second order term is um, indeed um, negative and bounded by some constant of phi uh, with the h one half norm of phi squared. And uh, yeah, just so you see that uh, the spectral analysis is uh, like pretty clear, is uh, I write this formula for the second derivative uh, of the capacity. So you have these terms and uh, like, okay, the equations are a bit ugly, but if you write uh, everything in terms of um, spherical harmonics, then uh, you reduce to just computing uh, something very simple. Like you need to solve uh, a quadratic equation. That's it. Do you see that? Uh, um, like you see that there's a spectral gap. And uh, so you get this inequality, the last inequality on the slide. Okay, so that's it uh, for nearly spherical sets. And uh, now how do we get, to, uh, how do we reduce the nearest spherical sets? Mm. So first of all, we'll need uh, uh, for our distance instead of uh, Frankel asymmetry, we uh, need a slightly different asymmetry. And uh, we need it because um, if you write uh, um, the minimizing problem for the Frankel asymmetry, and uh, then you write down the Erlagrange equation, you'll see that the uh, sets that are minimizing uh, that functional, they can't be regular enough. So, so make them regular, we need a slightly regularized asymmetry. And uh, we define it as follows. Uh, so we, we take the ball centered and the very center of omega, and then the symmetric difference of omega and the set, uh, we integrate uh, this quantity. Um, and you can uh, easily verify that uh, this new asymmetry is uh, stronger. Uh, the new old symmetry. Mm. So the one also that uh, it's uh, uh, continuous uh, with respect to L1 conversion. And uh, also you can see that for nearly spherical sets, uh, this uh, uh, the square norm of H1 half, H1 half square norm of phi is stronger than uh, I've seen it actually just L2 norm uh, on the boundary of uh, phi squared is already stronger than this new asymmetry of. Mm. Which means uh, that uh, for uh, near spherical sets, uh, we proved already everything, what we want. And so now this is, uh, this is the theorem we want to prove. Um, we want to prove that uh, if we have um, Mm, sets uh, the small asymmetry. So we, we show there exists uh, this epsilon zero 
uh, small enough so that if your symmetry is smaller, then uh, you have the inequality that you want. And uh, then we'll reduce to this. Okay, so how do you prove uh, this theorem? Um, so here comes the selection principle. So we argue by contradiction, as I said, and uh, we get a sequence uh, omega j tilde, um, all in some uh, ball dr for now. Um, and uh, this sequence uh, is uh, such that the difference uh, of uh, p capacities is uh, smaller uh, than uh, the symmetry uh, epsilon j, which goes to zero. And the selection principle tells you that uh, mm, for this contradicting sequence, uh, we can get an, another one that perturbs the uh, uh, sequence uh, uj, such that uh, it uh, converges uh, to the ball in a very strong sense. So like in, uh, for every k, uh, the um, boundary of uh, uj converges to boundary of the one in ck. Um, and uh, it's uh, still contradictory. So in the uh, uh, limb soup uh, of the difference of the capacities uh, divided by the asymmetry is very small. Um, and uh, well, also like some technical things is that we need that the pericenter is in the origin and the volume is uh, the one. Mm -hmm. So how do we prove this? selection principle. So what we do is uh, we define this uh, uj as uh, minimizers of um, this new functional. So we take the p capacity of omega. Uh, then this is um, like we don't want to deal uh, with uh, the, the fact that uh, we want the volume to be the volume of uh, the one. So instead, we add uh, this uh, a function of the volume, which uh, penalizes the volume, so makes uh, omega to be very close in volume to the, that uh, volume of that B1. And uh, then we add uh, this term. So that is what means uh, that the asymmetry of our new set will be very, very close uh, to the symmetry of uh, the original set. Because uh, I remind you that this uh, epsilon j is this uh, new asymmetry that we defined. So now, if uh, you define the sets like that, um, uh, then you, you know that uh, they're flat. Because as I said, they converge uh, in a big way to the ball B1 because their asymmetries uh, converge to zero. And uh, because they're flat, uh, you can uh, use the regularity theorem uh, of uh, Daniel and Petrosen um, for this like, one phase uh, free boundary problem uh, with the Phil Laplacian. And then you get uh, the, the sets. Uh, very, very uh, smooth. Um, so um, just to remind you how this works, it's, uh, you take the capacity potential and uh, you actually can't use directly the uh, results of the Niel and Petrosen because we have slightly different functional. So you first uh, need to show that the um, capacity potential is Lipschitz. You do it first showing that it's fairly continuous and you show that it's Lipschitz. And uh, also non-degenerate, uh, meaning that uh, one minus uh, uh, you know, capacity potential is uh, bounded um, from below and by the distance to the set. And, uh, this uh, gives us the density estimates uh, for the boundary, and also uh, we have uh, this equation as a P Laplacian of uh, this capacity potential is um, this function. So, some uh, uh, Borel uh, bounded function Q on uh, the reduced boundary of omega j. 
and uh, after that uh, you can use uh, already the improvement of flatness uh, by Daniel and Peterson and uh, you get that uh, omega j is very regular as I said like it will be ck uh, for every k we actually don't need that we only need the c2 theta but uh, that's how it is um, so yes and uh, that that gives you the theorem uh, here. So you get that uh, the difference of the capacities is bounded from below uh, for sets uh, that are in a big box uh, dr and that have a small asymmetry. And now we need to reduce to that case. Um, and to reduce to that case, uh, like uh, what you want to do is uh, Mm, you want uh, your mm, you want to bound your set with some big wall and say that uh, the p capacity doesn't change that much actually. Um, and uh, indeed, it turns out to be true. So you define the deficit as uh, for the set omega as the difference of p capacities of the set and uh, the ball. And uh, what you can show is. Uh, that uh, for uh, there exists uh, some uh, diameter uh, such that uh, if your set uh, is uh, has a small deficit smaller than some delta then you can find a new set omega tilde such that uh, its diameter is uh, uh, small so no more than this d then like the volume stays uh, the same uh, the deficit uh, it can get bigger, but it, it can get too much bigger. So you have the control of the, on the deficit. It uh, changes no more than by constant, and uh, the asymmetry. Okay, like you can't get that uh, it uh, uh, becomes uh, bigger, but you can say that uh, it's not much smaller. So if you uh, have the asymmetry. Uh, um, a, then uh, you can change more than uh, by the deficit. Uh, and um, yeah, unfortunately for this, uh, um, like, okay, this you can get uh, pretty easily just uh, bounding the, the the capacity of the, the set, uh, which is just cut by the big wall. So yeah, this omega tilde is just cut by the big wall. Uh, um, but uh, to reduce to the case of sets with small asymmetry, we need to use uh, the, uh, sorry? Sorry, sorry. Stavo guardando la, la prossima cosa che ho fatto. Proviamo pubblicità idee o proviamo pubblicità tecnici sui social. OK. Is, is that okay, everything? It was, no, there was a problem and uh, the person was not talking to you, so. Ah, okay. No, because that's, I, I can't hear actually what so, you're talking about. Go on. Yes, yeah, so uh, now to, uh, yeah, to reduce to the case of such a small asymmetry, we need to use uh, some uh, inequality and uh, even the qualitative inequality, the capacity inequality would suffice, but we couldn't prove it, unfortunately. So we use uh, this non sharp result by uh, uh, Fusco, Maggio, and Patelli. Um, and uh, yes, that's, uh, that's why we need it here. So if we want to show that the deficit uh, um, is. Uh, What we do if uh, we have so the deficit is uh, big, then uh, since asymmetry, the signs are all wrong side. Uh, the asymmetry is always uh, no more than two. Uh, and uh, so you can write that the deficit is uh, at least uh, four multiplied by this delta zero divided by four. Uh, and uh, four is bigger than a symmetry squared. Uh, so you get 
the, the deficit is big. So, um, uh, bigger than uh, the symmetry squared. So, the only case you need to deal with is a case of a small deficit. And uh, so, if you have small deficit, you can take uh, omega tilde from the lemma. And then, if we have any kind of uh, qualitative uh, result uh, for uh, for p capacity, then if you choose delta zero small enough, uh, then we can ensure that also the asymmetry uh, is uh, small. And uh, then you get that the deficit uh, is uh, bounded uh, by the asymmetry squared uh, of this omega tilde. Um, and uh, now, from the lemma, we know that uh, the asymmetry... Excuse me. Um, yes? Just wait a second, because we have a technical problem here in the room. Uh, can you... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we do have... Uh, we can't see your slides any longer. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't Maybe know, it's I... not your fault. I just... Because, I don't know, I for me, it's still like I'm still on Zoom, and I still... Okay. Uh, now we... That. Sorry, sorry. So now it works. Okay, so... Can you simply start from a few seconds back? Okay, so yes, what I was saying is uh, that I want to explain why we need to use uh, the result of food command and Sartese is that uh, uh, to reduce, uh, we need to reduce to the case of both uh, small asymmetry and uh, like small deficit. And uh, small deficit is not a problem because uh, we know that the uh, asymmetry is bounded uh, from above by two. Uh, or if you just consider any ball and uh, you get that the asymmetry is uh, uh, no more than two. Um, so if the deficit is big, then it's uh, bigger than some constant uh, multiplied by asymmetry squared. Um, so you can assume that the deficit is small, but uh, we also need uh, the fact that uh, the asymmetry is small too. And uh, um, for that, uh, we need some qualitative results saying that if the deficit goes to zero, then the asymmetry also goes to zero. And uh, so we're using for that uh, the result of Fuss, Comanche, and Spatelli, and uh, we get that um, and the asymmetry of the set is uh, small enough. And uh, yes, yeah, then if we take uh, the set omega tilde from the lemma, I guess that the like asymmetry for omega tilde is small, and uh, the deficit of omega tilde is uh, uh, bounded by uh, uh, the the new uh, asymmetry by the uh, by our theorem we proved already, and that one is bounded uh, by the frank asymmetry squared, and uh, then since we know that uh, like we can control the deficit and the asymmetry of uh, original set uh, yeah, of this, um, by this uh, deficit and asymmetry of this new set on the Gatilda, then we get uh, our theorem uh, also for the original set, which could be unbounded. So, and this concludes uh, the proof uh, for uh, like any set in our end. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you. And uh, I can ask questions now. Okay. I, I'm sorry for the interruptions, but um, so let's go to the questions. Are there questions? So it's just a curiosity. Um, um, do you think it is possible to get some information on the asymptotic uh, optimal constant, even in yeah. relation to? Uh, uh, so for, for smaller symmetries, or in other words, you take a, uh, the deficit uh, divided by your uh, asymmetry, the preferred asymmetry, maybe a, a suitable one, a suitable choice, the asymmetry squared, and then you take the info of the Liminf uh, among sequences that converge to the ball, but the, which are not the ball. So, uh, is there any chance to get uh, some uh, info on, on that asymptotic constant? Thanks. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, definitely not with this kind of uh, approach. 
Probably for the plane, yes, probably you can do something. I didn't think about that. But uh, yeah, it would be very interesting to get that concept. Okay, other, other questions? You're in the room or online? Okay, I do have a question actually. So, if I understand correctly, your modified asymmetry looks more like an L2 norm squared in the sense that if your function, if your set is um, described by the graph of a function phi, it looks pretty much like the L2 norm of phi square. Yes. Is it correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, no. So then, because it's squared, it controls the L1 norm to the power two, but it's in some sense better. But now the question is, why the two norm and not something maybe depending on dimension? So why did you decide to, to use the two norm in the modified? Uh, and I guess like partly because of the the ball that what you get the two norm uh, but also it was partly historical it was just used i think by uh uh like and taylor and wang for something else they use this norm yeah but for for the ball it makes sense i think because like the, the right one for there is this uh, the two norm of uh, the phi by which you parameterize right I, I don't think there is a, a reason after that, like for you could use something uh, different. So uh, just a curiosity, in dimension two, in the plane, um, what is the, the kind of asymmetry you can bound? Something like outdoor distance or Yeah, I think so. But uh, the dimension two has been done pretty long ago. So. Right. But yes. then, in some sense, it would make sense that you have something um, asymmetry and p depends on the dimension and happens to be infinity when you are in dimension. Yes, one. yes. Yeah. So, are there other questions? So, if not, let's thank the speaker again. So welcome everybody to the last talk of this afternoon. Speaker is Benoit Merlet from the University of Lille and he will talk about the unoriented Aviles Giga functional for pattern formation. Okay, so thank you very much for, for the organizers for this night, uh, nice conference. There were two or three talks which, which were very good. Um, so <laughs> this is uh, about a joint work with uh, Michael Goldman, Marc Pegon, and Sylvia Serfati. And okay, so the outline is the uh, following. I, I will uh, introduce uh, the Aviles Viga functional uh, as a model for pattern formation in a very specific uh, situations. And then uh, I will uh, recall some uh, old results for, uh, about the Aviles Viga functional. And then I will explain why it's not satisfying. So at least for some physicists. So we, we, we move to another model, which is a modification of the avilev Zika functional. And then I will show, try to show what is really different with this new model. It's a very small modification. We get very small, uh, very different behavior. And what I'm calling, uh, telling about uh, what, what I want to say by behavior is the behavior as the small parameter goes to zero. So there is a small parameter in the village Giga functional. And then I'm interested at what happens when this, this goes to zero. So the context of, so we, it's a, a models for a 2D stripes pattern. So the, the literature about uh, um, pattern form formation is a very large and so, Pattern formations uh, 
So these questions appear in physics for like things like the Rayleigh Banner convection rules or instabilities, for in, in uh, mechanics and also for uh, in, uh, for the solidifications of crystals, and also in biology or in morphogenesis or code patterns like in zebras and like this. Okay, so we have this uh, old reference, but which uh, is quite complete. But here we are interested in a very specific thing. So these models, in this book, you have models, these are models, evolution models. So there is a time. And um, some models, they, they create, uh, uh, they have a chaotic behavior. So here we are not only interesting in uh, not non-chaotic behavior. So we are not only interesting in 2D and 2D stripe patterns. So model for two three 2D stripes patterns. And the evolution model is variational. So we have a Lyapunov functional and also so the energy decrease. We have an energy. So, so this is a particular case. So the, but the rule theory is more rich. So what is a stripe uh, pattern? It's something like this, okay? So here is black, white, black, white, but it could be uh, something uh, more, uh, more regular. So we want to represent a function f from a 2D domain in R, and this function tends to oscillate rapidly in one direction and uh, with a, a, an approximate per period eta it's assumed to be small with respect to the size of the model. So here it's a F is one or zero, okay? An example. So we assume that eta is small and uh, we just want a model to describe the slowly varying change in the directions of the, of the stripes. So the, globally you see stripes, but the, the orientation of the stripes is changing. The domain. So, so the, the series, and it's uh, not our series, it's uh, in our physics uh, books. Uh, it's a phase theory. So we are given a, a, a periodic profile. So one periodic profile, P, and we are looking for F of this form. F of X is P, so the profile is given, and a function of theta of X divided by eta, so T Theta is a phase. So all the information now is in theta. And so the constraint F is almost periodic with period one in one direction. This, this reads gradient of theta is almost, the norm of gradient of theta is almost equal to one. I do this, I compute, this is okay. I obtain something which is periodic with period eta because uh, I divided by eta. So uh, I don't really like gradient of eta, so I will write u is equal to gradient of eta. And so equivalently, I will say that, so I mean uh, simply connected domain, so it's a gradient, so it's equivalent to say that this curl vanishes. So the curl, the uh, u, we are in 2D, so the curl is a scalar. And so my constraints are, the curl of u is zero and u is almost of norm one, almost on S1. Okay, so here is a vector field u associated with the preceding pattern. Okay, you see so the, the vector field is orthogonal to the stripe. Okay, and so uh, what, are, what is the model, the variational model which is associated with this? This is a, a uh, model called, oh, sorry, uh, uh, cross newell model, regularized cross newell model. So, and uh, we have this, so we have this penal penalization. So we have seen this uh, several times uh, here. So penalization of the norm of gradient of theta, which we want it to be close to one. So we have, uh, okay. And uh, so the choice is the Laplacian of theta to penalize the Laplacian of theta with a small parameter here. So it's a, we want it not to be not too uh, irregular. So there is a, a 
yield control of uh, the variation of theta. So this is why it's called regularized. Okay, and uh, uh, he showed this this, uh, this model already. Okay, and he said that it was the same that the than the Avilash Giga function. And okay, it's true because the integral of Laplace of theta squared, I integrate by part twice and I obtain that this is the, the Asian squared plus some boundary terms. And here I am only interested in uh, interior uh, questions, so I don't care about boundary, boundaries. So for me, it's uh, like this. And when I, I replace the Laplace by the Asian and I write U is the gradient of theta, then this functional is just the Avila Giga function. So, so the Avila Giga functional is, uh, is, uh, is uh, so the important thing is that it, apply, it applies to vectors which are curl free. So there is a constraint and there is an epsilon here and a one over epsilon here. So it should be a two, not a four, sorry. And uh, okay, so the epsilon here, this means that it's not, like the, um, the Gins Bolondo equation, Gins Bolondo uh, uh, energy. Uh, here, the cost of a vortex is, tends to be zero. So the cost of a vortex without the epsilon is in logarithm of epsilon, absolute value, but I multiply by epsilon, so in the limit it's zero. So here, this, this will not detect vorticizes. This will detect line discontinuities in the limit of silent goes to zero. Okay. So there is a huge literature about the village giga functional. So uh, so first, uh, so I, I, I didn't say, but it was, uh, okay. So there are three papers of village and giga about this. One is very quite old and then, there, is a, there has been a renewal of interest because uh, uh, the, such models appear also in mod, micromagnetics models. Formerly it was a, a mechanic model. And uh, then in the uh, years uh, 200 and 1999, so there has been a, a huge interest on, on, this, uh, on this functional. So first we have a compactness results, which is that if uh, you have a sequence of, uh, of uh, configurations with uniformly bonded energies as epsilon goes to zero, then up to extraction, you, you converge in L1 to something. So you converge in L1 means that the limit uh, takes values in S1. So, so you, you have, uh, you have strong convergence. So there are two independent papers, one by Ambroso Delelis and Mantegazza and the other by De Simone, Cohn, Muller and Otto. Uh, so then uh, Jabin, Otto, and Pertam, they, they, they were interested in the limit where, where the energy goes to zero. So zero energy limits. So they are called zero states. And this, in this case, so uh, back, uh, when, when uh, at the limit, you, you obtain that you have a one over its angle. So at the limit, U is of norm one, and you, have st you, you keep this. It's still a, a, a curl free. And uh, okay, and uh, the energy concentrates on lines, but we, I will tell this after. after. But when, when, uh, when the energy goes to zero, the, the, the structure of the limit is, uh, is very nice. You have vorticizes with uh, X of mod X or minus X divided by uh, norm of X. Translates of this. And you have a locally finite number of vorticizes like this. And outside of these vorticizes, uh, the, the solution is Lipschitz continuous. Lipschitz continuous and also, uh, so it's curl free and with norm one. So uh, it's a constant along lines aligned with the vector field. So it's a very simple structure. So now the structure of limits of sequence uh, with finite energy has been partially described. So I cite the first paper about this, but then there have been uh, even recent papers by, uh, by uh, uh, Ennio Marconi. So, but the, the, the structure of, uh, of this object, limit configuration is not completely known. And I will explain 
later why it's complicated, reason why it's complicated. So, but if we are restricted in BV, because this is larger than BV. If we restrict to BV, then the, the gamma, gamma limit is known and uh, we have a lower bound of, in this paper, but uh, they use the gene cone entropy, the previous work by gene and cone. And uh, uh, the upper bound is, uh, has been given in two independent papers by uh, Polyakovsky and Conti and Delelli. Okay, so what is this gamma limit? So when U is BV, it's this one. So Vitalese gave it also. So uh, I integrate on the jump set of U, so the limit is BV. So I have a jump step, the, 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 the cube of the jump. Okay. And also it's uh, okay. I need U to be of norm one almost everywhere and a uh, curl free. So we have this. So I am outside the jump set, it's curl free. So and we have this theorem. So in B, for BV, the, 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 we have the gamma convergence for the strong L1 topology, which is the topology of the compactness side. So, so a remark, so let's, uh, let's give a name of this. Uh, so the function which has a finite gamma limit, for which the gamma limit is finite, so function, okay. What is this set? So I know that it's uh, the function of text values in S1 and R, R curve three. So this is a compactness result, in fact. Okay, but it's strictly included in this. And I know that it contains the BV function, which are curve three in text value in S1. But this is strict also. And why is this strict? Because there is a cube there. I, I, I only con con control the cube and uh, I do not control the jump. Not have control of the jump. So there is no hope to have a control of the BV. So, and so this set uh, is not, uh, so the difficulty is to find, to show that this is a good, uh, good gamma limit in the whole set where for the gamma limit, gamma limit is finished. Okay, but it's complicated and I don't want to go in this talk, I keep it simple here. Uh, I do more, more simple things, in fact. So as epsilon goes to zero, we have u epsilon goes to u. So this is a, I dream, this is what is expected. So the limit is like this, and we have a, in omega, we have a picture like this. So I have a vector field, which is of norm one and curl free, and I have jump set. And on the jump set, I have curl free jump. That is that u minus and u plus, the project on the tangent to the, to the jump set, the projection to the tangent of the jump set is the same. Okay, this is, this is why I call a curl free jump. Okay, so now I look, I want to explain why uh, the cost of a line singularity. So here is a line singularity with a stripes also, so corresponding stripes. And okay, so how do I, I go from this to this? What is the cost? So here it's a, the, the, the limit epsilon is equal to zero, but if epsilon is positive, then I, I need to, to put some transition between this. Because I'm, I'm looking for something which is in H1, which goes from this to this. So, so the, the, the good answer is 1D transition, so pure 1D transition. So, so I, I look at the cost of 1D transition. So sorry, I was uh, lazy and this is, I wrote it by hand. So we have this infimum problem. So uh, in the limit, x1 goes to plus and minus, plus infinity or minus infinity. I have this limit. So I, I make a jump between a, a, an angle uh, phi infinity, minus phi infinity and plus phi infinity, but it's along x1 along the, the first, first direction. So here I have this angle. At the end, I have this angle. So this is a curl free jump because here is a, the, the tangent and the projection of the tangent is, is the same. So since my, I'm looking for a 
vector field which is uh, only depends on x1 saying that they are curve free it means that uh, u2 is constant the second uh, so here you see that uh, the height of the vector is the same almost the same it's the same so it's only it depends on so only u1 is varying and so when i minimize the energy per unit length so the average guy energy per unit length it's just a modica mortola problem so it's you can solve it exactly and you obtain that the cost is this one so this is an explicit computation and uh, you have an arc tangent hyperbolic of x1 divided by epsilon for uh, for uh, the optimal uh, so maybe there is a constant that i've forgotten but okay the important thing is we have arc tangent arc tangent hyperbolic which is thing say that it goes very fast to, to u minus and u plus uh, at uh, at uh, and it's divided by epsilon so when epsilon goes to zero it's really concentrates on a, on the line on the jump line so uh, this is for line so for vertices so i just wanted to show uh, the stripes associated to a vertex so it's called so in the the community is not called a vortex it's called a target okay so it's a target pat pattern so you you can represent it by uh, this or minus the same vector field of course it gives the same pattern here okay and this the, the cost of this is zero okay, this costs zero energy because of the epsilon the vortex the cost of a vortex is zero Okay, now why I'm not very satisfied by this, or not me, but the physicists, they are not very satisfied because what is observed, you can observe things like this. Okay, and okay, here I have a singularity, I have another one there, and they do not cost nothing. And in the middle, if I forget about this, uh, this uh, the left and right region, in the middle, I see something which is per per perfectly smooth. Okay, so I cannot see any singularity. Okay, so these are called U turns. So I show you a U turn. So here is U turn with a okay. You have a U turn. So here it's a the vector field. Here you can take a x divided by norm of x, and here you can okay. So I try to 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 build a vector field associated with this configuration. And I obtain this, so it's uh, obvious I can do this. But by doing this, I'm creating a line because it's a U turn. I only made one half of the turn. So here, the vectors are opposite. So it's okay, it's curl free. The Avilash Giga limit is uh, has finite energy. But if I look at the, this, uh, I should have zero energy there because my profile. Is, uh, is this, uh, this is in a situation where the periodic profile at the beginning is, uh, let's say, even. I cannot say if uh, I'm going uh, from the left to the right or from the right to the left. So I have one zero, one zero, one zero, or zero one is the same. So uh, the idea is to 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 take to have a model which uh, says that no, this vector and this vector are the same. This is the same thing. So we move to directors. So we make the identification u is the same as minus u. Okay, so this is a usual thing in the theory of liquid crystals, and you have this. But here there is something which is different because so this has been suggested by this uh, this uh, this guy. Sorry, it's important to say this. Is, uh, so there are several papers by Ercolani and Venkataramani. And maybe one other who, who suggests to, to 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 model it by directors, but there is one difficulty which is not present in other uh, such models that we have these constraints to be curl free, and we have to say what is what is a curl free field of di directors. Okay, so here I present the unorientable Avila-Giga functional. So I. I, I want to talk about curl free, present curl free uh, directors. So, to, to, to define directors, I will use uh, vectors in R2 and take the, the tensor product. 
So it's a way to to represent. But in in a way, in my in my mind, it's always uh, I just identify u and minus u, and uh, okay, v is a identification. So I always use uh, the vector, the letter v for tensors and u for vectors. But okay. Uh, so and I define the, the admissible set as a function v. So this is my plane. So this is homeomorphic to a plane. So it's called p. Uh, so I, I have functions. I consider function v in H one from my domain into p, which are curl bar free. Curl bar curl bar free. So what is curl bar? So I have to, to say, and it's quite complicated. So I want this to be to say that this vector u is, is curl free. Okay, this is what, what I want to say. So, so there is several ways to do it. One is natural. So uh, I decompose curl bar as, as four terms that I decompose is uh, two terms in R2. So this term is in R2, this one is in R2. So the first one is defined like this. So this is the matrix. So V is a matrix, the tensor. So it's a matrix. And uh, okay, I, I just use uh, this formula. So this matrix multiplied by this. And then I rotate it, rotate everything by pi divided by four. And I take the same formula to, to obtain curl two. And then what I obtain I, when uh, V is a, is a tensor product of uh, U and with U and uh, for U H1. So I assume that U is H1. When here I write this, V is, uh, is of this form, but I don't say that U is H1. You may, may have jumps. Of course, this is why I do this. I want to, 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 to authorize jumps of U, but not on V. But when U has no jump, then the curl, curl the first part of the curl of V is this co coefficient multiplied by the curl of U multiplied by the vector U. And the other part is the same thing with a different coefficient. So this is why, so U, I think U, it will be uh, something of norm one. You think, so it's okay, it's not, uh, it's not degenerate here, but this coefficient may, may vanish. And so this one, if V is not zero, this coefficient and this coefficient, they never vanish together. So this is why I need all these vectors, but there is too much information. Okay, curl should be a scalar, but uh, I have this problem of uh, some direction where, I, where, where, where we have degeneracy. So I take uh, four, four, four scalars and okay, it's, it's cover every case. So I just say that this is this vanishes and this gives me a model and then I define the new Avila Giga functional applied to V and see E epsilon of V. So I have, this is the same formula because gradient of V square divided by V plus one minus norm of V squared. So here there is a trick because the norm of V, V is a tensor, so I think about it as a, so this is the operator norm as a V acting from L2 of R2 to L2 to R2. So from the Euclidean space to, to the Euclidean space. So that the norm of U tensor U is just the square norm of, of U. Okay, so this is U squared. Okay, and this is what also I, I need to divide by norm of V. Okay, you have a question? Yes, yes, yes. So I just, okay, I've been lazy. I don't want to, but okay. So I, I choose good norms so that uh, we, we have the, the good, uh, so we have this property with the good norms. We have this property, the energy of uh, U tensor U is exactly the village giga energy of U. Or if U is H1, okay. And, uh, but of, of course, I have to, to specify which norm I use. But basically, for the tensor, I use the operator norm in L2. As a, a V acts, 
from the Euclidean space is an operator from the Euclidean space into the Euclidean space. And I use okay. Yes. Uh, you're, uh, yes. No, it, no, I was just asking because you start from a normal new, which is perfectly Euclidean. I mean, it's algebraic squares and so on. Yeah. And that one looks very. But the, these are wrong one matrices. Um, they are almost wrong ones. So this, this is just okay. the square norm. Okay. okay, so it's not. Uh, uh, usually, I think you, you take the max for a symmetric matrix. You you need to take the maximum of the of the. Of the but here, I have zero. I have one eigenvalue which is zero. So it's. Uh, Okay, anyway, we have this, and uh, U does not appear anymore. Okay, so I, I have a complete model which, uh, which uh, directors. Okay, how much time do I have? Twenty minutes. Okay. So. Uh, now I wanted to try to guess what is the limit energy when epsilon goes to zero. And also I, I guess a line energy as before. Associated with the jump of V through the line discontinuities of V. So I define RP1 is uh, just uh, tensor products of uh, elements of S1. So it, it's just S1, another way of, it's S1, but in the plane P. And uh, okay, and uh, the, the, I consider things which are, so I say it's, it's a more easy to consider only SBV mappings, which takes value in RP1. And I assume that they are, um, so the, the A should not be there. No, the A, the A should not, ah. No, I assume that they are curve free. Or on, but only the absolutely continuous part is curve free. And for the, the jump part, uh, I, uh, I just write explicitly what is, say, what is it to be curve free. So I write V plus, one, plus, plus minus uh, the trace of V on the, the jump set of V. I write them as tensors, and but I, I have two choices. Either it's plus or minus u. I can change it. So here I have a choice to say that it's curl free or not. So, so I, I have to choose between plus and minus. So, but if one of them is zero, it's okay. It's a curl free job. Okay, so. Next, I define the, the jumps, the, the line energy as before with the same formula. And uh, okay, the plus one is the same. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, I choose the, the jump to be curl free here. So it's well defined. And this is something I can reach by building explicitly uh, 1D transitions. I can do this building build 1D transition. So I have. Um, uh, let's say I have a upper bond. So this is an upper bond for the, 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 the correct limit. Okay, so let's give you an example. So why do I uh, just give up the, to, to try to write V as U tensor U? I don't care, maybe, maybe it's minus U tensor minus U. I, I don't care. This is because here I have a field of directors, which is curl free, you see here. Are the... And I, I, if I want to build a, a, a lifting of this, then I try, okay, in this region, I put this vector, so, so I, I have this one, then, and I it turns out I have to, to make some spiral. And, and I have a lot of jumps. And when uh, I narrow the gap between the two pin points here, here 
to the to uh, the vertices there is a vertical gap when when i uh, I, I narrow this vertical gap then I, I have more and more jumps more and more spirals so i have no control of the, the size of the jumps of, of a lifting so this is why we give up the idea of having a lifting we just uh, cannot control anything so we just say okay v this is why i describe sorry no. oh, oh. why i'll describe this locally just i can pick one of them but i, I only define uh lifting on the jump set on, on the traces So we have a nice results, which uh, uh, first, uh, so which parallel parallels the results uh, in the usual case. Uh, we have a compactness result, which says that if the inner, we have a sequence of uh, configuration with uniformly bonded energies, then up to extraction, it converges to someone to something which is uh, in L1, and the limit, of course, takes values in R P1 because it's a strong convergence in anyone. So we have this nice compactness result. Uh, in SBV, uh, so I, I can define, re relax, the relaxation of the line energy. So the infimum of the lim limaf of the energy of uh, VK for VK tending to V. So this is the relaxation of the line energy I. And in fact, we can we, we know that for V in SBV, this is the same as the gamma, gamma limit of E epsilon. So, so why do I say that? Because now I will forget about this and I will just study this, this, this one, the, the line energy, because it's more simple to, for the picture. And we have a nice uh, uh, theorem also for the structure of zero states. So this is what is expected. So if V is the limit of some of a sequence with energy going to zero, then there is a locally finite set S such that V is locally deep sheets outside of S, far from S. And uh, if I take a ball centered at the point of S and a ball which does not contain any other point of the singular set, so there is only one point singular point at the center of the ball then either v is a u star tensor u star center at x zero so u star is this function it's just x divided by num of x so i have this so it's this is a target here or we have uh, the other situation is that there is a psi such that on the in, for x such that x minus x zero dot size is non-negative then this is the target v is the target and on the other side v is Lipschitz continuous so this is a u-turn okay so uh, this is a Lipschitz configuration so we have i have directors which are and they are constant along a line so it has characteristic lines in fact i have vorticizes we well, forget and uh I have U-turn configuration. So psi is like this. So on this side, I have a target, alpha target, and here I have Lipschitz configuration. So, uh, and the proof of these results are very different from the proof in the orientable on the classical case, because the method used in the classical case simply does not work. So we have to come up with very uh, different proof, which works also. So they provide new proofs for in the classical case. But this is not what I want to talk about. I want to, 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 to talk about what is the cost of a jump. So I want to guess what is uh, the, the, the correct uh, gamma limit. So I want to do the, the, what, what is the cost between uh, uh, a vec, um, a, a, of a jump between minus phi and phi through uh, some direction. So I take, so I note E phi, denote E phi, this is this vector, cos phi sin is phi, 
So, and by symmetry, I only consider phi between zero and phi over two. I took a period L and I define A1 phi. So this is the set of functions in, two, in RP1, which are curl free. Uh, the, the absolute continuous part of the curl is curl is vanishes. And I have this condition of curl free condition on the jump set. Okay. And okay, the, the, the condition is about the domain, so it's, it's defined on R2, but it's L periodic in X1. So in fact, I am only interested on stripes with, with, uh, with L. And uh, when I send X2 to plus infinity or minus infinity, I obtain this vector E phi tensor E phi or E minus phi tensor E minus phi. Have this jump. And the limit is in, uh, let's, let's say, uh, L1 lock. Okay, and interesting of the minimal value of the line energy restricted to a stripe of a width L, so of, to a period, and divided by the length of the stripe. And this will not depend on L by uh, scaling invariance. So this is. So I take the infimum. So this will be the cost, the real cost of a jump between e this uh, vector, the uh, e minus phi and e phi. Okay, maybe I have a picture. Okay, so yeah. So here I start from minus phi, I end with plus phi, and I'm, I'm periodic in x1. Yeah. I have limits and in infinity. I'm looking for configurations going from there to there. Uh, with and uh, I want to 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 find which one has a the, the minimal line cost. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. So here I have a first upper bound. I take one deep transition from the village giga setting, and I obtain this. Okay, the, the cube of the jump divided by six. And okay, in terms of phi, this is this quantity. This is a cube. Okay, so this is a, an upper bound. But it's not very good because if you think I phi going to pi over two, so when phi goes to pi over two, this is going, becomes vertical. And if it's equal to vertical, it's vertical, I have vertical vector, and here I have vertical vector. But from, from the point of view of the tensor product, it's the same. So the energy is zero there. So you see that uh, it's quite bad. It's good for phi small, but for phi close to pi over two, it's uh, really bad. It's certainly a bad, uh, bad, 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 bad uh, bond. So to get lower bond, so this was an, an upper bond. To get lower bond, we use calibrations. So I define a curl free jump. And we have a and define calibration. This is a mapping from RP1 to R2, which is curl free when when phi of V is, is the divergence of phi of V is curl free whenever V is smooth and curl free. So it doesn't see uh, so where, whenever in the region where there is no jump, it's okay. The divergence of phi of v is not zero. But when there are jumps, the divergence of phi of v is just c, this. So this is uh, the chain rule. The di divergence of uh, between this vector, uh, the, at a jump between these vectors and this vector. And I want this to be smaller than the energy. The, the energy density. Because when I have this for every calibration, so a map like this, uh, I have, and every jump, I have C of phi is, is bonded from below by the jump of phi between the limit vectors dot E2. The E2 is the direction of the jump. Okay? I have a proof. Yeah. The six. 
Yeah, no, no, it's uh, from the beginning. What you compute explicitly is a 1D transition. It's uh, you solve the Modinka Mortola problem and you have the six from the beginning. Uh, okay, so the proof is okay. Uh, so the left, uh, uh, the right hand side of the previous, I multiply it by L, and it turns out that it's just the integral on the boundary of the, the limit of R to 10 to n plus infinity of the integral of the boundary of this term of phi of V dot n, dh1. N is uh, normal to the boundary, exterior normal. And this is just uh, okay because. Uh, so the left and right boundaries they cancel out by uh, by periodicity. So I have only the up terms and the bottom term. Yeah. Direction at e two. So e two n is e two at the top and minus e two at the bottom. So I have a minus. Term. Okay. And so this is an integral of phi dot n. So I, I write it as a divergence. The integral of divergence is a domain, but the divergence vanishes. But on the jump set, so I only have uh, this integral on the jump set. Jump set in the entire, so it's a GV. So I, I forgot, but it's GV intersected with the uh, with the strike. Periodic. And but I, by assumption, this is smaller than this. And so, and this is uh, is exactly equal to to the, to the energy. So I have uh, an inequality, a lower bound. So this gives me a lower bound for every configuration. But now if I want to have exactly equality, so I say I have found the best possible configuration, then I need to have equality of these quantities everywhere. Okay. And this is difficult. So I don't give you the, the calibration because it's complicated, and, uh, but we have a formula, cross calibration, which uh, we try something and we have we have a, 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 a formula, but I will show you what is the calibration. So, so this is phi divided by P here. Is the jump. And this is, uh, so we have a lower bond. So this is the preceding lower bond, which is like this. And this is my bad upper bond that I gave you, which is given by uh, the jump the cube divided by six. Okay, but up to the angle phi, divided by six, they are the same. So here the 1D transition is the best possible. But after that, I don't know. So we try something else. So the physicists, uh, they propose things like this. They are called zippers. So this is, so I sh only show the upper half. So this is symmetric. You have U plus and then you have U minus and you, you build you will vorticizes. You have pieces of vorticizes like this. So here, you don't do not have jump through this line. And these vorticizes here it interacts with constant constant region or the region where it's constant. And then, and here the dashed line there is no jump because uh, these vectors are opposite. So from the point of view of tensor products, it's the same vector. So no cost. And so we have two pieces, of course. So the period here is two minus one, two, one. We have a parabolic part and an hyperbolic part. And at the limit, it converge. So you choose. So you choose the position of this point, and you 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 you, you obtain different angles. And when you do this, we have a you have a better you have a for large angles you have a better uh, cost compute the cost and you obtain things like this. So for small angles is not, 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 not good, but for large angles, you obtain something which at least goes to zero for large, for, for angles pi over two. Okay, but it's not satisfying because there is a large gap between the lower bond and the upper bond. So I will show you a modification of the zippers, which are only for large angles. So cosine of, cos, cosine of phi, phi is, lo, is smaller than this quantity, okay? And this is the same as the preceding, but in this region, so in the red triangle, uh, we removed all the, 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 the jumps with angles larger than pi over six. 
So here, only angles smaller jumps with angles smaller than pi over six appear. And this one, we know they are, they are the best. So, so here we have a region where it's constant. So here, before we, before the, for the zipper, there was, there was a, um, a vortex here. But we replaced it by piecewise constant two times. So there is a cost of a jump here. But here, the jump here is better now because the jump between this and this, the alpha angle is pi over six also. And now we have several pieces. So we have straight segments, we have a parabolic region, and we have still the hyperbolic regions. Okay, I skip for, for smaller angles, we have another construction. The same is the same, but okay. Oops. And when we gather everything together, this is what we obtain. So this is the lower bond in black, and the, the upper bonds we obtain are like this. So they are very close and this is not very satisfying. The, shows the difference. So this is the difference between the upper bond and the lower bond. So a maximum is 5% difference. So it's not so bad. And so we want to know whether it's a, they are, we can, we can match. So can I, now can I find a better lower bond, a better calibration to show that my, zi, my modified zippers are optimal? Okay, and the answer is yes, for the, the limit angle, where there is no parabolic part. So I, I go to straight line for hyperbolic part and no parabolic part for the limit angle. Yes, there is a, 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 a calibration we can compute explicitly and, it, and it's okay. And for the other angles, it's not I did not find the calibration, but we prove that there is no calibration. Uh, we, we, you have necessary conditions to, to find calibration. So you, you have, if there is a calibration, this is this function up to constant. And then you, you check and it does not satisfy all the inequalities. So there is no, so this does not mean that, that zippers are not the best. Okay, this means that we cannot prove it by calibration. Okay, and uh, so, but if I change, so if I change a cost function, so, if the, the cost between u minus and u plus is, is given by sine of phi minus pi cos of cos phi. So it's, it's, it's like for small angles, it's like phi of q, the same, uh, same uh, behavior. Then uh, the modified zippers are optimal. Okay. For this, this, uh, this cost, but it's not, the, it's not the initial cost, but okay. Uh, I mean, how much time do I have? I have finished. Okay. I, I, I will go fast. I want to say things because there are surprising things. Because I only consider, I only consider jump free, uh, curl free jumps. But now I have this construction where u minus at the bottom. So I have a horizontal director. And here are a vertical director, and I can build a, a construction between them. So here I, I have vorticizes, and uh, so I have these artificial uh, jumps here, which does not cost anything. And we have you have these constructions with uh, with uh, which only contains uh, jumps. Uh, of uh, angles smaller than pi divided by six. So here is pi divided by six, pi divided by six, pi over six, and here it's smaller and smaller and smaller with straight lines. And this gives me a transition between uh, vertical and horizontal, which is not curl free. Okay, not expected. This is really different from the initial uh, problem. And this one, we have a calibration and this one is optimal. Okay, can I do anything? Can I go, do any, can I go from any direction to any direction through any direction? Yes, in fact. So what, what do I do? So I want to go from this vector, this direction to this direction, so from this direction to this direction. So what, what do I do? Uh, 
I have two ways. So I can move to this vector to this vector through something like this. So I need this to project to have the same projection on the line. But if I move, you replace u minus by minus u minus, then I can go from this to this with an orthogonal direction. And by combining to these two orthogonal direction, of course, I can make stairs like this, so to so, and get any direction that I want. Okay, and by doing this, so I will, I have a lot of construction. So what do I do? I replace my function, uh, and I take a function V, I BV, I approximate it piecewise on a hexagonal grid by function with values in RP1. So uh, maybe I lose uh, something in the, the mass of the gradient, but it's okay. It's uh, controlled, so it's a parametric inequality. And then I have all these uh, transitions. So I look at all these transitions. So this is so this is uh, three uh, hexagons, okay? And I have three values of v eta here. And I want to join them, so I, I, I create the good stairs here. And then the last step is to replace these stairs by small uh, zippers. So on each segment here, I replace by a, at a smaller scale, even smaller scale by a sequence of zippers. I need to localize. In fact, Zippers are, are not compact. So there's a, we have a public branches which goes at infinity, but you can replace by something which is uh, close and compact. So, and doing this, we have this theorem. We say that the energy is bonded of any function in BV is bonded. And so the curl free condition has completely disappeared. And so we have a conjecture that uh, the the correct limit, uh, gamma limit, at least for BV, is a function, is integral on the jump set of a function of the jump. So, uh, sorry, no, there is no cube there, sorry. Uh, this is an error. Plus, I have to take a, into account the, the a curl part with a absolute continuous part of the curl and a con contour part of the curl, which counts also with a constant lambda and lambda should be the limit of uh, the cost of a small jump, the derivative of cost of a jump. Okay, so I have finished. I have finished. So, so, sorry, thank you. So, but this is very surprising to have. So this is was not pre predicted by uh, the, the physicists that we completely lose. And this creates uh, um, an energy of, uh, of the curl and it is uh, an energy of disclination. Mechanics. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, there is time perhaps for a quick question. More than a question, I'm sorry. More than a question is just a quick experimental remark for once. I think I remember that if you go back to your triple junction sort of thing. It's actually very similar to what some experimentalists think to have found in some thin film of smectics, because basically the, you know, the mathematics behind is quite the same. And actually also this idea that you should, I mean, it all makes a lot of sense. This idea that you should come somehow build up a lot of um, disclinations and, 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 and made, I mean, it's, it's really wonderful. And, Yes. Well, so okay. you, you said you were able to, to, to prove that your uh, triple junction thing where you had on the bottom something like that. Yeah. And on top something like that. Yeah. That's a minimizer, right? Yes, because we have a calibration for this. Excellent. So, okay, but uh, calibration ah. are very difficult to compute. So sometimes you have one and uh, okay, it works. Mm, sure, but, but, really but that particular one, I think it might have a physical interest out of these drives. Um, yes, th this one is- This uh, particular okay. one or something similar to that. I think it might be, oh, well, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, it's oh, a very oh, nice you have, thought. You have, you have pictures like this in micromagnetism. And also have, smectics. Yes, uh, so in micromagnetism, you have this, um, 
Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember. So Samsung. Uh, sorry, but we you have some two uh, D structures which looks like like this, but of course they are different. I think Constantina. Well, do so since. I mean, there's any relation because there's some sort of periodicity in this picture. Can you say anything about the periodicity? No, no, ah. you, you, okay. If you, if you want to say something about the periodicity in micromagnetism, this, this, this has been done. Well, okay, not uh, exactly, but uh, the right scale and things, things by Otto, I think, and others. But you have to put back the epsilon. You put back the epsilon, and this, this epsilon will repel. So, the, these lines will repel each other and it will give you a scale. So they want to be very close because you want to the, the, the boundary conditions to be satisfied. So if you put a boundary condition there, then the, 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 the periodicity will, will tend to be very, very, very small. But if you put back the epsilon, then it want to, they want to be far apart to realize their transition separately. And so you, you have a balance between these two phenomena. Thank you very much. But here we didn't, uh, we are, it's far too difficult for the moment. For us. Okay, so if there are no other questions, let's close. Let's thank the speaker again.